Preface of His Masterpiece This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli Preface his masterpiece, which in the original French bears the title of L'Oeuvre, is a strikingly accurate story of artistic life in Paris during the latter years of the Second Empire. Amusing at times, extremely pathetic and even painful at others, it not only contributes a necessary element to the rougon Marquart series of novels, a series illustrative of all phases of life in France within certain dates, but it also represents a particular period of Monsieur Zola's own career and work. Some years, indeed, before the latter had made himself known at all widely as a novelist, he had acquired among Parisian painters and sculptors considerable notoriety as a revolutionary art critic, a fervent champion of that open-air school which came into being during the Second Empire, and which found its first real master in Edouard Manet, whose then derided works are regarded in these later days as masterpieces. Manet died before his genius was fully recognized. Still, he lived long enough to reap some measure of recognition, and to see his influence triumph in more than one respect among his brother artists. Indeed, few, if any, painters left a stronger mark on the art of the second half of the nineteenth century than he did, even though the school, which he suggested rather than established, lapsed largely into mere impressionism, a term, by the way, which he himself coined already in 1858, for it is an error to attribute it, as is often done, to his friend and junior, Claude Monet. It was at the time of the Salon of 1866 that M. Zola, who criticized that exhibition in the Avenement newspaper, footnote, some of the articles will be found in the volume of his miscellaneous writings entitled Mien. End of footnote. First came to the front as an art critic, slashing out to right and left with all the vigor of a born combatant, and championing Monsieur Manet, whom he did not as yet know personally, with a fervor born of the strongest convictions. He had come to the conclusion that the derided painter was being treated with injustice and that opinion sufficed to throw him into the fray, even as, in more recent years, the belief that Captain Dreyfus was innocent impelled him in like manner to plead that unfortunate officer's cause. When M. Zola first championed Manet and his disciples, he was only twenty-six years old, yet he did not hesitate to pit himself against men who were regarded as the most eminent painters and critics of France, and although, even as in the Dreyfus case, the only immediate result of his campaign was to bring him hatred and contumely, time, which always has its revenges, has long since shown how right he was in forecasting the ultimate victory of Manet and his principal methods. In those days, M. Zola's most intimate friend, a companion of his boyhood and youth, was Paul Cézanne, a painter who developed talent as an impressionist, and the lives of Cézanne and Manet, as well as that of a certain rather dissolute engraver, who sat for the latter's famous picture, Les Bons Bocs, suggested to M. Zola the novel which he has called L'Oeuvre. Claude Lantier, the chief character in the book, is, of course, neither Cézanne nor Manet, but from the careers of those two painters, M. Zola has borrowed many little touches and incidents. Footnote. So far as Manet is concerned, the curious reader may consult M. Antonin Proust's interesting Souvenirs, published in the Revue Blanche early in 1897. End of footnote. The poverty which falls to Claude's lot is taken from the life of Cézanne, for Manet, the only son of a judge, was almost wealthy. Moreover, Manet married very happily, and in no wise led the pitiful existence which in the novel is ascribed to Claude Lantier and his helpmate Christine. The original of the latter was a poor woman, 
who for many years shared the life of the engraver to whom I have alluded. And in that connection, it is well to mention that what may be called the Benecourt episode of the novel is virtually photographed from life. Whilst, however, Claude Lanier, the hero of L'Oeuvre, is unlike Manet in so many respects, there is a close analogy between the artistic theories and practices of the real painter and the imaginary one. Several of Claude's pictures are Manet's, slightly modified. For instance, the former's painting, In the Open Air, is almost a replica of the latter's Déjeuner sur l'herbe, A Lunch on the Grass, shown at the Salon of the Rejected in 1863. Again, many of the sayings put into Claude's mouth in the novel are really sayings of Manet's, and Claude's fate at the end of the book is virtually that of a moody young fellow who long assisted Manet in his studio, preparing his palette, cleaning his brushes, and so forth. This lad, whom Manet painted in L'Enfant aux Cerises, The Boy with the Cherries, had artistic aspirations of his own, and, being unable to justify them, ended by hanging himself. I had just a slight acquaintance with Manet, whose studio I first visited early in my youth, and though the exigencies of life led me long ago to cast aside all artistic ambition of my own, I have been for more than thirty years on friendly terms with the members of the French art world. Thus it would be comparatively easy for me to identify a large number of the characters and the incidents figuring in his masterpiece but I doubt if such identification would have any particular interest for English readers. I will just mention that Mahoudeau, the sculptor, is in a measure Solari, another friend of M. Zola's boyhood and youth, that Fagerolle, in his main features, is Gervex, and that Bongrand is a commingling of Courbet, Cabanel, and Gustave Flaubert. For instance, his so-called village wedding is suggested by Coubert's funeral at Ornan. His friendship for Claude is Cabanel's friendship for Manet, whilst some of his mannerisms, such as his dislike for the praise accorded to certain of his works, are simply those of Flaubert, who, like Balzac in the case of Eugénie Grandet, almost invariably lost his temper if one ventured to extol Madame Bovary in his presence. Courbet, by the way, so far as disposition goes, crops up again in M. Zola's pages in the person of Jean Bouvard, a sculptor who artistically is a presentment of Clesinger. I now come to a personage of a very different character, Pierre Sandoz, clerk, journalist, and novelist. And Sandoz, it may be frankly admitted, is simply M. Zola himself. Personal appearance, life, habits, opinions, all are those of the novelist at a certain period of his career. And for this reason, no doubt, many readers of his masterpiece will find Sandoz the most interesting personage in the book. It is needless, I think, to enter into particulars on the subject. The reader may take it from me that everything attributed in the following pages to Pierre Sandoz was done, experienced, felt or said by Emile Zola. In this respect, then, his masterpiece is virtually Monsieur Zola's David Copperfield, the book into which he has put most of his real life. I may also mention, perhaps, that the long walks on the quays of Paris, which in the narrative are attributed to Claude Lantier, are really Monsieur Zola's walks. For in his youth, when he vainly sought employment after failing in his examinations, he was wont, at times of great discouragement, to roam the Paris quays, studying their busy life and their picturesque vistas, whenever he was not poring over the second-hand books set out for sale upon their parapets. From a purely literary standpoint, the pictures of the quays and the Seine, to be found in L'Oeuvre, are perhaps the best bits of the book, though it is all of interest, because it is essentially a livre vécu, a work really lived by its author. And if in the majority of its characters, those readers possessing some real knowledge of French art life find one man's qualities blended with another's defects, the appearance of a third, and the habits of a fourth, 
the whole none the less makes a picture of great fidelity to life and truth this is the parisian art world as it really was with nothing improbable or overstrained in the narrative save its very first chapter in which romanticism is certainly allowed full play it is quite possible that some readers may not judge claude lantier the hero very favourably he is like the dog in the fable who forsakes the substance for the shadow but it should be borne in mind that he is only in part responsible for his actions for the fatal germ of insanity has been transmitted to him from his great-grandmother he is indeed the son of gervaise the heroine of la zamoire the dram shop by her lover lantier and gervaise it may be remembered was the daughter of antoine macquart of the fortune of the rougons and dr pascal the latter being the illegitimate son of adelaide fouque from whom sprang the insanity of the rougon macquarts at the same time whatever view may be taken of claude's artistic theories whatever interest his ultimate fate may inspire it cannot be denied that his opinions on painting are very ably expressed and that his case from a pathological point of view is diagnosticated by m zola with all the skill of a physician moreover there can be but one opinion concerning the helpmate of his life the poor devoted christine and no one possessed of feeling will be able to read the history of little jacques unmoved stories of artistic life are not as a rule particularly popular with english readers but this is not surprising when one remembers that those who take a genuine interest in art in this country are still a small minority quite apart from artistic matters however there is i think an abundance of human interest in the pages of his masterpiece and thus i venture to hope that the present version which i have prepared as carefully as my powers permit will meet with the favour of those who have supported me for a good many years now in my endeavours to make the majority of m zola's works accessible in this country e a v merton surrey End of Preface Chapter 1, Part A of His Masterpiece This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Lisa Reichert His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. Chapter 1, Part A Claude was passing in front of the Hôtel de Ville, and the clock was striking two o'clock in the morning, when the storm burst forth. He had been roaming forgetfully about the central markets during that burning July night, like a loitering artist enamoured of nocturnal Paris. Suddenly the drops came down, so large and thick, that he took to his heels and rushed, wildly bewildered along the quai de la greve but on reaching the pont louis philippe he pulled up ragefully breathless he considered his fear of the rain to be idiotic and so amid the pitch-like darkness under the lashing shower which drowned the gas-jets he crossed the bridge slowly with his hands dangling by his side he had only a few more steps to go as he was turning on to the quai bourbon on the ile de saint louis a sharp flash of lightning illumined the straight, monotonous line of old houses bordering the narrow road in front of the Seine. It blazed upon the panes of the high, shutterless windows, showing up the melancholy frontages of the old-fashioned dwellings in all their details. Here a stone balcony, there the railing of a terrace, and there a garland sculptured on a frieze. The painter had his studio close by under the eaves of the old Hôtel du Martoy, nearly at the corner of the Rue de la Femme Sans Tête. So he went on while the quay, after flashing forth for a moment, relapsed into darkness, and a terrible thunderclap shook the drowsy quarter. When Claude, blinded by the rain, got to his door, a low rounded door studded with iron, he fumbled for the bell-knob, and he was exceedingly surprised, indeed he started, on finding a living, breathing body huddled against the woodwork. 
Then, by the light of a second flash, he perceived a tall young girl, dressed in black and drenched already, who was shivering with fear. When a second thunderclap had shaken both of them, Claude exclaimed, "'How you frightened one! Who are you, and what do you want?' He could no longer see her. He only heard her sob and stammer. Oh, monsieur, don't hurt me. It's the fault of the driver, whom I hired at the station, and who left me at this door, after ill-treating me. Yes, a train ran off the rails near Nevers. We were four hours late, and a person who was to wait for me had gone. Oh, dear me, I have never been in Paris before, and I don't know where I am. Another blinding flash cut her short, and with dilated eyes she stared, terror-stricken, at that part of the strange capital, that violet-tinted apparition of a fantastic city. The rain had ceased falling. On the opposite bank of the Seine was the Quai des Ormes, with its small grey houses variegated below by the woodwork of their shops, and with their irregular roofs boldly outlined above, while the horizon suddenly became clear on the left as far as the blue slate eaves of the Hôtel de Ville, and on the right as far as the leaden-hued dome of St. Paul. What startled her most of all, however, was the hollow of the stream, the deep gap in which the Seine flowed, black and turgid, from the heavy piles of the Pont-Marie to the light arches of the new Pont-Louis-Philippe. Strange masses peopled the river, a sleeping flotilla of small boats and yawls, a floating wash-house, and a dredger moored to the quay. Then, farther down, against the other bank, were lighters laden with coals, and barges full of millstone, dominated, as it were, by the gigantic arm of a steam crane. But, suddenly, everything disappeared again. Claude had an instinctive distrust of women, that story of an accident, of a belated train and a brutal cabman, seemed to him a ridiculous invention. At the second thunderclap the girl had shrunk farther still into her corner, absolutely terrified. "'But you cannot stop here all night,' he said. She sobbed still more and stammered, "'I beseech you, monsieur, take me to Passy. That's where I was going.' He shrugged his shoulders. "'Did she take him for a fool?' Mechanically, however, he turned towards the Quai de Célestine, where there was a cab stand. Not the faintest glimmer of a lamp to be seen. To Passé, my dear. Why not to Versailles? Where do you think one can pick up a cab at this time of night, and in such weather? Her only answer was a shriek, for a fresh flash of lightning had almost blinded her, and this time the tragic city had seemed to her to be spattered with blood. An immense chasm had been revealed the two arms of the river stretching far away amidst the lurid flames of a conflagration. The smallest details had appeared. The little closed shutters of the Quai des Ormes, and the two openings of the Rue de la Masseur and the Rue de Pays en Blanc, which made breaks in the line of frontages. Then, near the Pont-Marie, one could have counted the leaves on the lofty plane trees, which there form a bouquet of magnificent verdure while on the other side, beneath the Pont-Louis-Philippe, at the Maï, the barges, ranged in a quadruple line, had flared with the piles of yellow apples with which they were heavily laden, and there was also the ripple of the water, the high chimney of the floating wash-house, the tightening chain of the dredger, the heaps of sand on the banks, indeed an extraordinary agglomeration of things, quite a little world filling the great gap which seemed to stretch from one horizon to the other. But the sky became dark again, and the river flowed on, all obscurity, amid the crashing of the thunder. Thank heaven it's over! Oh, heaven, what's to become of me? Just then the rain began to fall again, so stiffly, and impelled by so strong a wind, that it swept along the quay with the violence of water escaping through an open lock. Come, let me get in, said Claude, I can stand this no longer. Both were getting drenched. By the flickering light of the gas lamp at the corner of the Rue de la Femme sans tête, the young man could see the water dripping from the girl's dress, which was clinging to her skin, in the deluge that swept against the door. He was seized with compassion. Had he not once picked up a cur on such a stormy night as this? Yet he felt angry with himself for softening. He never had anything to do with women. He treated them all as if ignorant of their existence, 
with a painful timidity which he disguised under a mask of bravado. And that girl must really think him a downright fool to bamboozle him with that story of adventure, only fit for a farce. Nevertheless, he ended by saying, That's enough. You'd better come in out of the wet. You can sleep in my rooms. But at this the girl became even more frightened and threw up her arms. In your rooms? Oh, good heavens! No, no, it's impossible. I beseech you, monsieur, take me to Passé. Let me beg of you. But Claude became angry. Why did she make all this fuss when he was willing to give her shelter? He had already rung the bell twice. At last the door opened, and he pushed the girl before him. No, no, monsieur, I tell you no. But another flash dazzled her, and when the thunder growled, she bounded inside, scarce knowing what she was about. The heavy door had closed upon them. She was standing under a large archway in complete darkness. It's I, Madame Joseph, cried Claude to the doorkeeper. Then he added in a whisper, Give me your hand, we have to cross the courtyard. The girl did as she was told. She no longer resisted. She was overwhelmed, worn out. Once more they encountered the diluvian rain as they ran side by side as hard as they could across the yard. It was a baronial courtyard, huge and surrounded with stone arcades, indistinct amidst the gloom. However, they came to a narrow passage without a door, and he let go her hand. She could hear him trying to strike some matches and swearing. They were all damp. It was necessary for them to grope their way upstairs. "'Take hold of the banisters and be careful,' said Claude. "'The steps are very high.' The staircase, a very narrow one, a former servant's staircase, was divided into three lofty flights, which she climbed, stumbling, with unskilful, weary limbs. Then he warned her that they had to turn down a long passage. She kept behind him, touching the walls on both sides with her outstretched hands, as she advanced along the endless passage, which bent and came back to the front of the building on the quay. Then there were still other stairs, right under the roof, creaking, shaky wooden stairs, which had no banister, and suggested the unplaned rungs of a miller's ladder. The landing at the top was so small that the girl knocked against the young man as he fumbled in his pocket for his key. At last, however, he opened the door. "'Don't come in, but wait, else you'll hurt yourself again.' She did not stir. She was panting for breath. Her heart was beating fast. There was a buzzing in her ears. She felt, indeed, exhausted by this ascent in the dense gloom. It seemed to her as if she had been climbing for hours, in such a maze, amidst such a turning and twisting of stairs, that she would never be able to find her way down again. Inside the studio there was a shuffling of heavy feet, a rustling of hands groping in the dark, a clatter of things being tumbled about, accompanied by stifled objurgations. At last the doorway was lighted up. Come in, it's all right now. She went in and looked around her without distinguishing anything. The solitary candle burned dim in that garret, more than fifteen feet high, and filled with a confused jumble of things whose big shadows showed fantastically on the walls, which were painted in grey distemper. No, she did not distinguish anything. She mechanically raised her eyes to the large studio window, against which the rain was beating with a deafening roll like that of a drum. But at that moment another flash of lightning illumined the sky, followed almost immediately by a thunderclap that seemed to split the roof. Dumb-stricken, pale as death, she dropped upon a chair. "'The devil!' muttered Claude, who was also rather pale. "'That clap wasn't far off.' We were just in time. It's better here than in the streets, isn't it? Then he went towards the door, closed it with a bang, and turned the key, while she watched him with a dazed look. There, now we are at home. But it was all over. There were only a few more thunderclaps in the distance, and the rain soon ceased altogether. Claude, who was now growing embarrassed, had examined the girl askance. She seemed by no means bad-looking, and assuredly she was young, twenty at the most. 
This scrutiny had the effect of making him more suspicious of her still, in spite of an unconscious feeling, a vague idea, that she was not altogether deceiving him. In any case, no matter how clever she might be, she was mistaken if she imagined she had caught him. To prove this, he willfully exaggerated his gruffness and curtness of manner. Her very anguish at his words and demeanour made her rise, and in her turn she examined him, though without daring to look him straight in the face. And the aspect of that bony young man, with his angular joints and wild bearded face, increased her fears. With his black felt hat and his old brown coat, discoloured by long usage, he looked like a kind of brigand. Directly he told her to make herself at home and go to bed, for he placed his bed at her disposal, she shrinkingly replied, "'Thank you. I'll do very well as I am. I'll not undress.' "'But your clothes are dripping,' he retorted. "'Come now, don't make an idiot of yourself.' And thereupon he began to knock about the chairs and flung aside an old screen, behind which she noticed a washstand and a tiny iron bedstead from which he began to remove the coverlet. "'No, no, monsieur, it isn't worth while. I assure you that I shall stay here.' At this, however, Claude became angry, gesticulating and shaking his fists. "'How much more of this comedy are we to have?' said he. "'As I give you my bed, what have you to complain of? You need not pay any attention to me. I shall sleep on that couch.' He strode towards her with a threatening look, and thereupon, beside herself with fear, Thinking that he was going to strike her, she tremblingly unfastened her hat. The water was dripping from her skirts. He kept on growling. Nevertheless, a sudden scruple seemed to come to him, for he ended by saying, condescendingly, "'Perhaps you don't like to sleep in my sheets. I'll change them.' He at once began dragging them from the bed and flinging them onto the couch at the other end of the studio, and afterwards he took a clean pair from the wardrobe and began to make the bed with all the deftness of a bachelor accustomed to that kind of thing. He carefully tucked in the clothes on the side near the wall, shook the pillows, and turned back a corner of the coverlet. "'There, that'll do, won't it?' said he. And as she did not answer, but remained motionless, he pushed her behind the screen. "'Good heavens! What a lot of fuss!' he thought. And after spreading his own sheets on the couch, and hanging his clothes on an easel, he quickly went to bed himself. When he was on the point of blowing out the candle, however, he reflected that if he did so, she would have to undress in the dark, and so he waited. At first he had not heard her stir. She had, no doubt, remained standing against the iron bedstead. But at last he detected a slight rustling, a slow, faint movement, as if amidst her preparations she also were listening, frightened, perchance, by the candle which was still alight. At last, after several minutes, the spring mattress creaked, and then all became silent. "'Are you comfortable, mademoiselle?' now asked Claude in a much more gentle voice. "'Yes, monsieur, very comfortable,' she replied in a scarcely audible voice, which still quivered with emotion. "'Very well, then. Good night.' "'Good night.' He blew out the candle, and the silence became more intense. In spite of his fatigue, his eyes soon opened again, and gazed upward at the large window of the studio. The sky had become very clear again, the stars were twinkling in the sultry July night, and despite the storm, the heat remained oppressive. Claude was thinking about the girl, agitated for a moment by contrary feelings, though at last contempt gained the mastery. He indeed believed himself to be very strong-minded. He imagined a romance concocted to destroy his tranquillity, and he jibed contentedly at having frustrated it. His experience of women was very slight. Nevertheless, he endeavoured to draw certain conclusions from the story she had told him, struck as he was at present by certain petty details, and feeling perplexed. But why, after all, should he worry his brain? What did it matter whether she had told him the truth or a lie? In the morning she would go off. There would be an end to it all, and they would never see each other again. Thus Claude lay cogitating, and it was only towards daybreak, when the stars began to pale, that he fell asleep. As for the girl behind the screen, 
in spite of the crushing fatigue of her journey, she continued tossing about uneasily, oppressed by the heaviness of the atmosphere beneath the hot zinc-work of the roof, and doubtless, too, she was rendered nervous by the strangeness of her surroundings. In the morning, when Claude awoke, his eyes kept blinking. It was very late, and the sunshine streamed through the large window. One of his theories was that young landscape painters should take studios despised by the academical figure painters, studios which the sun flooded with living beams. Nevertheless, he felt dazzled and fell back again on his couch. Why the devil had he been sleeping here? His eyes, still heavy with sleep, wandered mechanically round the studio, when all at once, beside the screen, he noticed a heap of petticoats. Then he at once remembered the girl. He began to listen, and heard a sound of long-drawn regular breathing, like that of a child comfortably asleep. Ah! So she was still slumbering, and so calmly that it would be a pity to disturb her. He felt dazed and somewhat annoyed at the adventure, however, for it would spoil his morning's work. He got angry at his own good nature. It would be better to shake her, so that she might go at once. Nevertheless, he put on his trousers and slippers softly, and walked about on tiptoes. The cuckoo clock struck nine, and Claude made a gesture of annoyance. Nothing had stirred. The regular breathing continued. The best thing to do, he thought, would be to set to work on his large picture. He would see to his breakfast later on, when he was able to move about. But, after all, he could not make up his mind. He who lived amid chronic disorder felt worried by that heap of petticoats lying on the floor. Some water had dripped from them, but they were damp still and so, while grumbling in a low tone, he ended by picking them up one by one and spreading them over the chairs in the sunlight. Had anyone ever seen the like, clothes thrown about anyhow? They would never get dry, and she would never go off. He turned all that feminine apparel over very awkwardly, got entangled with the black dress body, and went on all fours to pick up the stockings that had fallen behind an old canvas. They were Balbriggan stockings of a dark grey, long and fine, and he examined them before hanging them up to dry. The water oozing from the edge of the dress had soaked them, so he wrung and stretched them with his warm hands, in order that he might be able to send her away the quicker. Since he had been on his legs, Claude had felt sorely tempted to push aside the screen and take a look at his guest. This self-condemned curiosity only increased his bad temper. At last, with his habitual shrug of the shoulders, he was taking up his brushes when he heard some words stammered amidst a rustling of bedclothes. Then, however, soft breathing was heard again, and this time he yielded to the temptation, dropping his brushes and peeping from behind the screen. The sight that met his eyes rooted him to the spot, so fascinated that he muttered, "'Good gracious! Good gracious!' The girl, amidst the hothouse heat that came from the window, had thrown back her coverlet, and, overcome with the fatigue of a restless night, lay steeped in a flood of sunshine, unconscious of everything. In her feverish slumbers, a shoulder button had become unfastened, and a sleeve slipping down allowed her bosom to be seen, with skin which looked almost gilded and soft like satin. Her right arm rested beneath her neck, her head was thrown back, and her black, unwound tresses enwrapped her like a dusky cloak. "'Good gracious, but she's a beauty,' muttered Claude once more. There, in every point, was the figure he had vainly sought for his picture, and it was almost in the right pose. She was rather spare, perhaps, but then so lithe and fresh. With a light step, Claude ran to take his box of crayons and a large sheet of paper. Then, squatting on a low chair, he placed a portfolio on his knees and began to sketch with an air of perfect happiness. All else vanished amidst artistic surprise and enthusiasm. No thought of sex came to him. It was all a mere question of chaste outlines, splendid flesh tints, well-set muscles, face to face with nature, an uneasy mistrust of his powers made him feel small. So, squaring his elbows, he became very attentive and respectful. 
This lasted for about a quarter of an hour, during which he paused every now and then, blinking at the figure before him. As he was afraid, however, that she might change her position, he speedily set to work again, holding his breath, lest he should awaken her. And yet, while steadily applying himself to his work, vague fancies again assailed his mind. Who could she be? Assuredly no mere hussy. But why had she told him such an unbelievable tale? Thereupon he began to imagine other stories. Perhaps she had but lately arrived in Paris with a lover, who had abandoned her. Perhaps she was some young woman of the middle classes, led into bad company by a female friend, and not daring to go home to her relatives. Or else there was some still more intricate drama beneath it all, something horrible, inexplicable, the truth of which he would never fathom. All these hypotheses increased his perplexity. Meanwhile he went on sketching her face, studying it with care. The whole of the upper part, the clear forehead, as smooth as a polished mirror, the small nose with its delicately chiselled and nervous nostrils, denoted great kindliness and gentleness. One divined the sweet smile of the eyes beneath the closed lids, a smile that would light up the whole of the features. Unfortunately, the lower part of the face marred that expression of sweetness. The jaw was prominent, and the lips rather too full, showed almost blood-like over the strong white teeth. There was here, like a flash of passion, something that spoke of awakening womanhood, still unconscious of itself amidst those other traits of childlike softness. But suddenly a shiver rippled over the girl's satiny skin. Perhaps she had felt the weight of that gaze, thus mentally dissecting her. She opened her eyes very wide and uttered a cry. Ah, good heavens! Suddenly terror paralyzed her at the sight of that strange room, and that young man crouching in his shirt-sleeves in front of her and devouring her with his eyes. Flushing hotly, she impulsively pulled up the counterpane. Well, what's the matter? cried Claude, angrily, his crayon suspended in mid-air. What wasp has stung you now? He, whose knowledge of womankind was largely limited to professional models, was at a loss to understand the girl's action. She neither spoke nor stirred, but remained with the counterpane tightly wrapped round her throat, her body almost doubled up, and scarcely showing an outline beneath her coverings. "'I won't eat you, will I?' urged Claude. "'Come, just lie as you were, there's a good girl.' Again she blushed to her very ears. At last she stammered, "'Oh, no, monsieur, no, pray!' But he began to lose his temper altogether. One of the angry fits to which he was subject was coming upon him. He thought her obstinacy stupid, and, as in response to his urgent requests, she only began to sob, he quite lost his head in despair before his sketch, thinking that he would never be able to finish it, and would thus lose a capital study for his picture. "'Well, you won't, eh? But it's idiotic. What do you take me for? Have I annoyed you at all? You know I haven't.' Besides, listen, it is very unkind of you to refuse me this service, because, after all, I sheltered you, I gave up my bed to you. She only continued to cry, with her head buried in the pillow. I assure you that I am very much in want of this sketch, else I wouldn't worry you. He grew surprised at the girl's abundant tears, and ashamed at having been so rough with her, so he held his tongue at last, feeling embarrassed and wishing, too, that she might have time to recover a bit. Then he began again, in a very gentle tone, "'Well, as it annoys you, let's say no more about it. But if you only knew, I've got a figure in my picture yonder, which doesn't make headway at all, and you were just in the very note. As for me, when it's a question of painting, I'd kill father and mother, you know. Well, you'll excuse me, won't you?' and if you'd like me to be very nice, you'd just give me a few minutes more. No, no, keep quiet as you are. I only want the head, nothing but the head. If I could finish that, it would be all right. Really, now, be kind. Put your arm as it was before, and I should be very grateful to you, grateful all my life long. It was he who was entreating now, 
pitifully waving his crayon amid the emotion of his artistic craving. Besides, he had not stirred, but remained crouching on his low chair at a distance from the bed. At last she risked the ordeal and uncovered her tranquilized face. What else could she do? She was at his mercy, and he looked so wretchedly unhappy. Nevertheless, she still hesitated, she felt some last scruples, but eventually, without saying a word, she slowly brought her bare arm from beneath the coverings, and again slipped it under her head, taking care, however, to keep the counterpane tightly round her throat. "'Oh, how kind you are! I'll make haste. You will be free in a minute.' He bent over his drawing, and only looked at her now and then with the glance of a painter who simply regards the woman before him as a model." At first she became pink again. The consciousness that she was showing her bare arm, which she would have shown in a ballroom without thinking at all about it, filled her with confusion. Nevertheless, the young man seemed so reasonable that she became reassured. The blush left her cheeks, and her lips parted in a vague confiding smile. And from between her half-opened eyelids, she began to study him. How he had frightened her the previous night with his thick brown beard, his large head, and his impulsive gestures. And yet he was not ugly. She even detected great tenderness in the depths of his brown eyes. While his nose altogether surprised her, it was a finely cut woman's nose, almost lost amidst the bristling hair on his lips. He shook slightly with a nervous anxiety which made his crayon seem a living thing in his slender hand and which touched her, though she knew not why. She felt sure he was not bad-natured. His rough, surly ways arose from bashfulness. She did not decipher all this very clearly, but she divined it, and began to put herself at her ease, as if she were with a friend. Nevertheless, the studio continued to frighten her a little. She cast sidelong glances around it, astonished at so much disorder and carelessness. Before the stove, the cinders of the previous winter still lay in a heap. Besides the bed, the small washstand, and the couch, there was no other furniture than an old, dilapidated oaken wardrobe and a large deal table littered with brushes, colors, dirty plates, and a spirit lamp, atop of which was a saucepan with shreds of vermicelli sticking to its sides. Some rush-bottomed chairs, their seats the worse for wear were scattered about beside spavined easels. Near the couch the candlestick used on the previous night stood on the floor, which looked as if it had not been swept for fully a month. There was only the cuckoo clock, a huge one, with a dial illuminated with crimson flowers, that looked clean and bright, ticking sonorously all the while. But what especially frightened her were some sketches in oils that hung frameless from the walls, a serried array of sketches reaching to the floor, where they mingled with heaps of canvases thrown about anyhow. She had never seen such terrible painting, so coarse, so glaring, showing a violence of colour that jarred upon her nerves like a carter's oath heard on the doorstep of an inn. She cast her eyes down for a moment and then became attracted by a picture, the back of which was turned to her. It was the large canvas at which the painter was working, and which he pushed against the wall every night, the better to judge it on the morrow in the surprise of the first glance. What could it be, that one, she wondered, since he dared not even show it? And meantime, through the vast room, a sheet of burning sunlight falling straight from the window panes unchecked by any blind, spread with the flow of molten gold over all the broken-down furniture, whose devil-may-care shabbiness it threw into bold relief. End of chapter 1, part A Chapter 1, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert Claude began to feel the silence oppressive. He wanted to say something, no matter what, first in order to be polite, 
and more especially to divert her attention from her pose. But cudgel his brain as he would, he could only think of asking, "'Pray, what is your name?' She opened her eyes, which she had closed, as if she were feeling sleepy. "'Christine,' she said, at which he seemed surprised. Neither had he told her his name. Since the night before they had been together, side by side, without knowing one another. "'My name is Claude.' And having looked at her just at that moment, he saw her burst into a pretty laugh. It was the sudden merry peal of a big girl, still scarcely more than a hoyden. She considered this tardy exchange of names rather droll. Then something else amused her. How funny! Claude, Christine, they begin with the same letter. They both became silent once more. He was blinking at his work, growing absorbed in it, and at a loss how to continue the conversation. He fancied that she was beginning to feel tired and uncomfortable, and in his fear lest she should stir, he remarked at random, merely to occupy her thoughts, "'It feels rather warm.' This time she checked her laughter, her natural gaiety that revived and burst forth in spite of herself ever since she had felt easier in mind. Truth to tell, the heat was indeed so oppressive that it seemed to her as if she were in a bath, with skin moist and pale with the milky pallor of a camellia. "'Yes, it feels rather warm,' she said, seriously, though mirth was dancing in her eyes. Thereupon Claude continued, with a good-natured air, "'It's the sun falling straight in, but after all a flood of sunshine on one's skin does one good. We could have done with some of it last night at the door, couldn't we?' At this both burst out laughing, and he, delighted at having hit upon a subject of conversation, questioned her about her adventure, without, however, feeling inquisitive, for he cared little about discovering the real truth, and was only intent upon prolonging the sitting. Christine, simply and in a few words, related what had befallen her. Early on the previous morning she had left Claremont for Paris, where she was to take up a situation as reader and companion to the widow of a general, Madame Van Zad, a rich old lady who lived at Passy. The train was timed to reach Paris at ten minutes past nine in the evening, and a maid was to meet her at the station. They had even settled by letter upon a means of recognition. She was to wear a black hat with a grey feather in it. But a little above Nevers, her train had come upon a goods train, which had run off the rails, its litter of smashed trucks still obstructing the line. There was quite a series of mishaps and delays. First, an interminable wait in the carriages, which the passengers had to quit at last, luggage and all, in order to trudge to the next station, three kilometres distant, where the authorities had decided to make up another train. By this time they had lost two hours, and then another two were lost in the general confusion which the accident had caused from one end of the line to the other, in such wise that they reached the Paris terminus four hours behind time, that is, at one o'clock in the morning. "'Bad luck, indeed,' interrupted Claude, who was still sceptical, though half disarmed in his surprise at the neat way in which the girl arranged the details of her story. "'And, of course, there was no one at the station to meet you?' he added. Christine had, indeed, missed Madame Van Zad's maid, who, no doubt, had grown tired of waiting. She told Claude of her utter helplessness at the Lyon terminus, that large, strange, dark station, deserted at that late hour of night. She had not dared to take a cab at first, but had kept on walking up and down, carrying her small bag, and still hoping that somebody would come for her. When at last she made up her mind, there only remained one driver, very dirty and smelling of drink, who prowled round her, offering his cab in a knowing, impudent way. "'Yes, I know, a dawdler,' said Claude, getting as interested as if he were listening to a fairy tale. "'So you got into his cab?' Looking up at the ceiling, Christine continued without shifting her position. He made me. He called me his little dear and frightened me. When he found out that I was going to Passy, he became very angry, and whipped his horse so hard that I was obliged to hold on by the doors. 
After that I felt more easy, because the cab trundled along all right through the lighted streets, and I saw people about. At last I recognized the Seine, for though I was never in Paris before, I had often looked at a map. Naturally I thought he would keep along the quay, so I became very frightened again on noticing that we crossed a bridge. Just then it began to rain, and the cab, which had got into a very dark turning, suddenly stopped. The driver got down from his seat and declared it was raining too hard for him to remain on the box. Claude burst out laughing. He no longer doubted. She could not have invented that driver. And as she suddenly stopped, somewhat confused, he said, All right, the cabman was having a joke. I jumped out at once by the other door, resumed Christine. Then he began to swear at me, saying that we had arrived at Passy, and that he would tear my hat from my head if I did not pay him. It was raining in torrents, and the quay was absolutely deserted. I was losing my head, and when I had pulled out a five-franc piece, he whipped up his horse and drove off, taking my little bag, which luckily only contained two pocket handkerchiefs, a bit of cake, and the key of my trunk, which I had been obliged to leave behind me in the train. "'But you ought to have taken his number!' exclaimed the artist indignantly. In fact, he now remembered having been brushed against by a passing cab which had rattled by furiously while he was crossing the Pont Louis-Philippe amid the downpour of the storm. And he reflected how improbable truth often was. The story he had conjured up as being the most simple and logical was utterly stupid beside the natural chain of life's many combinations. "'You may imagine how I felt under the doorway,' concluded Christine. "'I knew well enough that I was not at Passy, and that I should have to spend the night there, in this terrible Paris. And there was the thunder and the lightning, those horrible blue and red flashes, which showed me things that made me tremble.' She closed her eyelids once more, she shivered, and the colour left her cheeks as, in her fancy, she again beheld the tragic city, that line of keys stretching away in a furnace-like blaze, the deep moat of the river, with its leaden waters obstructed by huge black masses, lighters looking like lifeless whales, and bristling with motionless cranes, which stretched forth gallows-like arms. Was that a welcome to Paris? Again did silence fall. Claude had resumed his drawing. But she became restless, her arm was getting stiff. "'Just put your elbow a little lower, please,' said Claude. Then, with an air of concern, as if to excuse his curtness, "'Your parents will be very uneasy if they have heard of the accident.' "'I have no parents.' "'What? Neither father nor mother? You are all alone in the world?' "'Yes, all alone.' She was eighteen years old, and had been born in Strasbourg, quite by chance, though, between two changes of garrison, for her father was a soldier, Captain Hullegrain. Just as she entered upon her twelfth year, the captain, a Gascon, hailing from Montauban, had died at Clermont, where he had settled when paralysis of the legs had obliged him to retire from active service. For nearly five years afterwards, her mother, a Parisian by birth, had remained in that dull provincial town, managing as well as she could with her scanty pension, but eking it out by fan-painting, in order that she might bring up her daughter as a lady. She had, however, now been dead for fifteen months, and had left her child penniless and unprotected, without a friend, save the superior of the sisters of the visitation, who had kept her with them. Christine had come straight to Paris from the convent, the superior having succeeded in procuring her a situation as reader and companion to her old friend, Madame Van Zad, who was almost blind. At these additional particulars, Claude sat absolutely speechless. That convent, that well-bred orphan, that adventure, all taking so romantic a turn, made him relapse into embarrassment again, into all his former awkwardness of gesture and speech, he had left off drawing, and sat looking with downcast eyes at his sketch. "'Is Clermont pretty?' he asked at last. "'Not very. It's a gloomy town. Besides, I don't know. 
I scarcely ever went out. She was resting on her elbow and continued, as if talking to herself in a very low voice, still tremulous from the thought of her bereavement. Mamma, who wasn't strong, killed herself with work. She spoilt me. Nothing was too good for me. I had all sorts of masters. But I did not get on very well, first because I fell ill, then because I paid no attention. I was always laughing and skipping about like a feather brain. I didn't care for music. Piano playing gave me a cramp in my arms. The only thing I cared about at all was painting. He raised his head and interrupted her. You can paint? Oh, no, I know nothing, nothing at all. Mamma, who was very talented, made me do a little watercolour, and I sometimes helped her with the backgrounds of her fans. She painted some lovely ones. In spite of herself, she then glanced at the startling sketches with which the walls seemed ablaze, and her limpid eyes assumed an uneasy expression at the sight of that rough, brutal style of painting. From where she lay she obtained a topsy-turvy view of the study of herself which the painter had begun, and her consternation at the violent tones she noticed, the rough crayon strokes with which the shadows were dashed off, prevented her from asking to look at it more closely. Besides, she was growing very uncomfortable in that bed where she lay broiling. She fidgeted with the idea of going off and putting an end to all these things which, ever since the night before, had seemed to her so much of a dream. Claude, no doubt, became aware of her discomfort, a sudden feeling of shame brought with it one of compunction. He put his unfinished sketch aside and hastily exclaimed, "'Much obliged for your kindness, mademoiselle. Forgive me. I have really abused it. Yes, indeed. Pray get up. It's time for you to look for your friends.' and without appearing to understand why she did not follow his advice, but hid more and more of her bare arm in proportion as he grew nearer, he still insisted upon advising her to rise. All at once, as the real state of things struck him, he swung his arms about like a madman, set the screen in position, and went to the far end of the studio, where he began noisily setting his crockery in order, so that she might jump out and dress herself without fear of being overheard. Amidst the din he had thus raised, he failed to hear her hesitating voice, "'Monsieur, monsieur,' at last he caught her words, "'Monsieur, would you be so kind? I can't find my stockings.' Claude hurried forward. What had he been thinking of? What was she to do behind that screen without her stockings and petticoats, which he had spread out in the sunlight? The stockings were dry, he assured himself of that, by gently rubbing them together, and he handed them to her over the partition, again noticing her arm, bare, plump, and rosy like that of a child. Then he tossed the skirts on to the foot of the bed and pushed her boots forward, leaving nothing but her bonnet suspended from the easel. She had thanked him, and that was all. He scarcely distinguished the rustling of her clothes and the discreet splashing of water. Still, he continued to concern himself about her. "'You will find the soap in a saucer on the table. Open the drawer and take a clean towel. Do you want more water? I'll give you the pitcher.' Suddenly the idea that he was blundering again exasperated him. "'There, there, I am only worrying you. I'll leave you to your own devices. Do as if you were at home. And he continued to potter about among the crockery. He was debating with himself whether he should ask her to stay for breakfast. He ought not let her go out like that. On the other hand, if she did stay, he would never get done. It would mean a loss of his whole morning. Without deciding anything, as soon as he had lighted his spirit lamp, he washed his saucepan and began to make some chocolate. He thought it more distingué, feeling rather ashamed of his vermicelli, which he mixed with bread and soused with oil, as people do in the south of France. However, he was still breaking the chocolate into bits when he uttered a cry of surprise. What, already? It was Christine who had pushed back the screen, and who appeared looking neat and correct in her black dress, duly laced and buttoned up, equipped, as it were, in a twinkle. 
Her rosy face did not even show traces of the water. Her thick hair was twisted in a knot at the back of her head, not a single lock out of place, and Claude remained open-mouthed before that miracle of quickness, that proof of feminine skill in dressing well and promptly. "'The deuce, if you go about everything in that way,' said he. He found her taller and handsomer than he had fancied, but what struck him most— was her look of quiet decision. She was evidently no longer afraid of him. It seemed as though she had redonned her armour and become an Amazon again. She smiled and looked him straight in the face, whereupon he said what he was still reluctant to say. You'll breakfast with me, won't you? But she refused the offer. No, thank you. I am going to the station where my trunk must have arrived by now, and then I shall drive to Passy. It was in vain that he told her that she must be hungry, that it was unreasonable for her to go out without eating something. "'Well, if you won't, I'll go down and fetch you a cab,' he ended by exclaiming. "'Pray don't take such trouble.' "'But you can't go such a distance on foot. Let me at least take you to the cab stand, as you don't know Paris.' "'No, really, I do not need you. If you wish to oblige me, let me go away by myself.' She had evidently made up her mind. She no doubt shrank from the idea of being seen with a man, even by strangers. She meant to remain silent about that strange night. She meant to tell some falsehood, and keep the recollection of her adventure entirely to herself. He made a furious gesture, which was tantamount to sending her to the devil. Good riddance! It suited him better not to have to go down. But all the same— he felt hurt at heart, and considered that she was ungrateful. "'As you please, then. I shan't resort to force,' he said. At these words, Christine's vague smile became more accentuated. She did not reply, but took her bonnet and looked round in search of a glass. Failing to find one, she tied the strings as best she could. With her arms uplifted, she leisurely arranged and smoothed the ribbons, her face turned towards the golden rays of the sun. Somewhat surprised, Claude looked in vain for the traits of childish softness that he had just portrayed. The upper part of her face, her clear forehead, her gentle eyes had become less conspicuous, and now the lower part stood out with its somewhat sensual jaw, ruddy mouth, and superb teeth. And still she smiled with that enigmatical girlish smile, which was perhaps an ironical one. At any rate, he said in a vexed tone, I do not think you have anything to reproach me with. At which she could not help laughing with a slight nervous laugh. No, no, monsieur, not in the least. He continued staring at her, fighting the battle of inexperience and bashfulness over again, and fearing that he had been ridiculous. Now that she no longer trembled before him, had she become contemptuously surprised at having trembled at all? What, had he not made the slightest attempt at courtship, not even pressed a kiss on her fingertips? The young fellow's bearish indifference, of which she had assuredly been conscious, must have hurt her budding womanly feelings. You were saying, she resumed, becoming sedate once more, that the cab stand is at the end of the bridge on the opposite quay? Yes, at the spot where there is a clump of trees. She had finished tying her bonnet strings, and stood ready gloved, with her hands hanging by her side, and yet she did not go, but stared straight in front of her. As her eyes met the big canvas turned to the wall, she felt a wish to see it, but did not dare ask. Nothing detained her. Still, she seemed to be looking around as if she had forgotten something there, something which she could not name. At last she stepped towards the door. Claude was already opening it, and a small loaf, placed erect against the post, tumbled into the studio. "'You see,' he said, "'you ought to have stopped to breakfast with me. My doorkeeper brings the bread up every morning.' She again refused with a shake of the head. When she was on the landing she turned round, and for a moment remained quite still. Her gay smile had come back. She was the first to hold out her hand. "'Thank you. Thank you very much.' 
he had taken her small gloved hand within his large one, all pastel-stained as it was. Both hands remained like that for a few moments, closely and cordially pressed. The young girl was still smiling at him, and he had a question on the tip of his tongue. "'When shall I see you again?' But he felt ashamed to ask it, and after waiting a while she withdrew her hand. "'Good-bye, monsieur.' "'Good-bye, mademoiselle.' Christine, without another glance, was already descending the steep ladder-like stairway, whose steps creaked, when Claude turned abruptly into his studio, closing the door with a bang, and shouting to himself, "'Ah, those confounded women!' He was furious, furious with himself, furious with everyone. Kicking about the furniture, he continued to ease his feelings in a loud voice. Was not he right in never allowing them to cross his threshold? They only turned a fellow's head. What proof had he, after all, that yonder chit, with the innocent look, who had just gone, had not fooled him most abominably? And he had been silly enough to believe in her cock-and-bull stories. All his suspicions revived. No one would ever make him swallow that fairy tale of the general's widow, the railway accident, and especially the cabman. Did such things ever happen in real life? Besides, that mouth of hers told a strange tale, and her looks had been very singular, just as she was going. Ah, if he could only have understood why she had told him all those lies. But no, they were profitless, inexplicable. It was art for art's sake. How she must be laughing at him by this time. He roughly folded up the screen and sent it flying into a corner. She had no doubt left all in disorder. And when he found that everything was in its proper place, basin, towel, and soap, he flew into another rage, because she had not made the bed. With a great deal of fuss he began to make it himself, lifting the mattress in his arms, banging the pillow about with his fists, and feeling oppressed by the pure scent of youth that rose from everything. Then he had a good wash to cool himself, and in the damp towel he found the same virgin fragrance, which seemed to spread through the studio. Swearing the while, he drank his chocolate from the saucepan, so excited, so eager to set to work, as to swallow large mouthfuls of bread without taking breath. "'Why, it's enough to kill one here!' he suddenly exclaimed. It must be this confounded heat that's making me ill. After all, the sun had shifted, and it was far less hot. But he opened a small window on a level with the roof and inhaled, with an air of profound relief, the whiff of warm air that entered. Then he took up his sketch of Christine's head, and for a long while he lingered, looking at it. End of chapter 1, part B Chapter 2, part A of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert It had struck twelve, and Claude was working at his picture when there was a loud, familiar knock at the door. With an instinctive yet involuntary impulse, the artist slipped the sketch of Christine's head, by the aid of which he was remodelling the principal figure of his picture, into a portfolio, after which he decided to open the door. "'You, Pierre!' he exclaimed. "'Already!' Pierre Sandoz, a friend of his boyhood, was about twenty-two, very dark, with a round and determined head, a square nose and gentle eyes set in energetic features, girt round with a sprouting beard. "'I breakfasted earlier than usual,' he answered, "'in order to give you a long sitting. "'The devil! You're getting on with it!' He had stationed himself in front of the picture, and he added almost immediately, "'Hallo! You have altered the character of your woman's features!' Then came a long pause. They both kept staring at the canvas. It measured about sixteen feet by ten, and was entirely painted over, though little of the work had gone beyond the roughing out. This roughing out, hastily dashed off, was superb in its violence and ardent vitality of colour. 
a flood of sunlight streamed into a forest clearing with thick walls of verdure. To the left stretched a dark glade with a small luminous speck in the far distance. On the grass, amidst all the summer vegetation, lay a nude woman with one arm supporting her head, and though her eyes were closed, she smiled amidst the golden shower that fell around her. In the background, two other women, one fair and the other dark, wrestled playfully, setting light flesh tints amidst all the green leaves. And as the painter had wanted something dark by way of contrast in the foreground, he had contented himself with seating there a gentleman dressed in a black velveteen jacket. This gentleman had his back turned, and the only part of his flesh that one saw was his left hand, with which he was supporting himself on the grass. "'The woman promises well,' said Sandoz, at last. "'But, dash it, there will be a lot of work in all this.' Claude, with his eyes blazing in front of his picture, made a gesture of confidence. "'I've lots of time from now till the salon. One can get through a deal of work in six months.' and perhaps this time I'll be able to prove that I'm not a brute. Thereupon he set up a whistle, inwardly pleased at the sketch he had made of Christine's head, and buoyed up by one of those flashes of hope, whence he so often dropped into torturing anguish, like an artist whom passion for nature consumed. "'Come, no more idling,' he shouted. "'As you're here, let us set to.' Sandoz, out of pure friendship, and to save Claude the cost of a model, had offered to pose for the gentleman in the foreground. In four or five Sundays, the only day of the week on which he was free, the figure would be finished. He was already donning the velveteen jacket when a sudden reflection made him stop. "'But I say, you haven't really lunched, since you were working when I came in. Just go down and have a cutlet while I wait here.' The idea of losing time revolted, Claude. "'I tell you, I have breakfasted.' Look at the saucepan. Besides, you can see there's a crust of bread left. I'll eat it. Come to work, to work, lazy bones. And he snatched up his palette and caught his brushes, saying as he did so, Debouche is coming to fetch us this evening, isn't he? Yes, about five o'clock. Well, that's all right, then. We'll go down to dinner directly he comes. Are you ready? The hand more to the left, and your head a little more forward. Having arranged some cushions, Sandoz settled himself on the couch in the required attitude. His back was turned, but all the same the conversation continued for another moment, for he had that very morning received a letter from Plassans, the little Provençal town, where he and the artist had known each other when they were wearing out their first pairs of trousers on the eighth form of the local college. However, they left off talking. The one was working with his mind far away from the world, while the other grew stiff and cramped with the sleepy weariness of protracted immobility. It was only when Claude was nine years old that a lucky chance had enabled him to leave Paris and return to the little place in Provence where he had been born. His mother, a hard-working laundress, footnote, Gervaise of The Dram Shop, La Samoir, editor, end of footnote, whom his ne'er-do-well father had scandalously deserted, had afterwards married an honest artisan who was madly in love with her. But in spite of their endeavours, they failed to make both ends meet. Hence they gladly accepted the offer of an elderly and well-to-do townsman to send the lad to school and keep him with him. It was the generous freak of an eccentric amateur of painting who had been struck by the little figures that the urchin had often daubed, and thus for seven years Claude had remained in the South, at first boarding at the college, and afterwards living with his protector. The latter, however, was found dead in his bed one morning. He left the lad a thousand francs a year, with the faculty of disposing of the principal when he reached the age of twenty-five. Claude, already seized with a passion for painting, immediately left school without even attempting to secure a bachelor's degree, and rushed to Paris, whither his friend Sandoz had preceded him. At the college of Plassans, while still in the lowest form, Claude Lantier, Pierre Sandoz, and another lad named Louis de Bouche had been three inseparables. Sprung from three different classes of society, by no means similar in character, but simply born in the same year at a few months' interval, 
they had become friends at once and for aye, impelled thereto by certain secret affinities, the still vague promptings of a common ambition, the dawning consciousness of possessing greater intelligence than the set of dunces who maltreated them. Sandoz's father, a Spaniard who had taken refuge in France in consequence of some political disturbances in which he had been mixed up, had started near Plassans a paper mill with new machinery of his own invention. When he had died, heartbroken by the petty local jealousy that had sought to hamper him in every way, his widow had found herself in so involved a position, and burdened with so many tangled lawsuits, that the whole of her remaining means were swallowed up. She was a native of Burgundy. Yielding to her hatred of the Provençals, and laying at their door even the slow paralysis from which she was suffering, she removed to Paris with her son, who then supported her out of a meagre clerk's salary, he himself haunted by the vision of literary glory. As for Dubouche, he was the son of a baker of Plassans. Pushed by his mother, a covetous and ambitious woman, he had joined his friends in Paris later on. He was attending the courses at the School of Arts as a pupil architect, living as best he might upon the last five-franc pieces that his parents staked on his chances, with the obstinacy of usurers discounting the future at the rate of a hundred per cent. "'Dash it!' at last exclaimed Sandoz, breaking the intense silence that hung upon the room. "'This position isn't at all easy. My wrist feels broken. Can I move for a moment?' Claude let him stretch himself without answering. He was now working at the velveteen jacket, laying on the colour with thick strokes. However, stepping backward and blinking, he suddenly burst into loud laughter at some reminiscence. "'I say, do you recollect, when we were in the sixth form, how one day Puyot lighted the candles in that idiot Lulubi's cupboard? And how frightened Lulubi was when, before going to his desk, he opened the cupboard to take his books and found it transformed into a mortuary chapel? Five hundred lines to everyone in the form!' Sandoz, unable to withstand the contagion of the other's gaiety, flung himself back on the couch. As he resumed his pose, he remarked, "'Ah, oh, that brute of a Puyod! You know that in his letter this morning he tells me of Lulubi's forthcoming marriage? The old hack is marrying a pretty girl. But you know her. She's the daughter of Galassar, the haberdasher, the little fair-haired girl whom we used to serenade.' Once on the subject of their recollections, there was no stopping them, though Claude went on painting with growing feverishness, while Pierre, still turned towards the wall, spoke over his shoulders, shaking every now and then with excitement. First of all came recollections of the college, the old dank convent that extended as far as the town ramparts, the two courtyards with their huge plane trees, the slimy sedge-covered pond where they had learned to swim, and the classrooms with dripping plaster walls on the ground floor. Then the refectory, with its atmosphere constantly poisoned by the fumes of dishwater, the dormitory of the little ones famous for its horrors, the linen room and the infirmary full of gentle sisters, nuns in black gowns who looked so sweet beneath their white coifs. What a to-do there had been when Sister Angela, she whose Madonna-like face had turned the heads of all the big fellows, disappeared one morning with Hermeline, a stalwart first-form lad, who, from sheer love, purposely cut his hands with his penknife so as to get an opportunity of seeing and speaking to her, while she dressed his self-inflicted injuries with gold-beater's skin. Then they passed the whole college staff in review, a pitiful, grotesque, and terrible procession it was, with such heads as are seen on Meerschaum pipes, and profiles instinct with hatred and suffering. There was the headmaster, who ruined himself in giving parties in order to marry his daughters, two tall, elegant girls, the butt of constant and abominable insults, written and sketched on every wall. There was the comptroller, Piffard, whose wonderful nose betrayed his presence behind every door when he went eavesdropping. And there were all the teachers, each befouled with some insulting nickname, the severe Radamantus, who had never been seen to smile, Filth, who by the constant rubbing of his head had left his mark on the wall behind every professional seat he occupied. 
thou hast deceived me adele the professor of physics at whom ten generations of schoolboys had tauntingly flung the name of his unfaithful wife there were others still spontini the ferocious usher with his corsican knife rusty with the blood of three cousins little chantecaille who was so good-natured that he allowed the pupils to smoke when out walking and also a scullion and a scullery maid two ugly creatures who had been nicknamed paraboulomenos and paraleluca and who were accused of kissing one another over the vegetable parings then came comical reminiscences the sudden recollection of practical jokes at which they shook with laughter after all those years oh the morning when they had burned the shoes of mimi la morte alias the skeleton day boarder a lank lad who smuggled snuff into the school for the whole of the form and then that winter evening when they had bagged some matches lying near the lamp in the chapel in order to smoke dry chestnut leaves in reed pipes sandoz who had been the ringleader on that occasion now frankly avowed his terror the cold perspiration that had come upon him when he had scrambled out of the choir wrapped in darkness and again there was the day when claude had hit upon the sublime idea of roasting some cockchafers in his desk to see whether they were good to eat as people said they were so terrible had been the stench so dense the smoke that poured from the desk that the usher had rushed to the water pitcher under the impression that the place was on fire and then their marauding expeditions the pillaging of onion beds while they were out walking the stones thrown at windows the correct thing being to make the breakage resemble a well-known geographical map also the greek exercises written beforehand in large characters on the blackboard so that every dunce might easily read them though the master remained unaware of it the wooden seats of the courtyard sawn off and carried round the basin like so many corpses the boys marching in procession and singing funeral dirges yes that had been a capital prank dubouche who played the priest had tumbled into the basin while trying to scoop some water into his cap which was to serve as a holy water pot but the most comical and amusing of all the pranks had perhaps been that devised by pouillaud who one night had fastened all the unmentionable crockery of the dormitory to one long string passed under the beds at dawn it was the very morning when the long vacation began he had pulled the string and skedaddled down the three flights of stairs with this frightful tail of crockery bounding and smashing to pieces behind him at the recollection of this last incident claude remained grinning from ear to ear his brush suspended in mid-air that brute of a pouillaud he laughed and so he has written to you what is he doing now why nothing at all old man answered sandow seating himself more comfortably on the cushions his letter is idiotic he is just finishing his law studies and he will inherit his father's practice as a solicitor you ought to see the style he has already assumed all the idiotic austerity of a philistine who has turned over a new leaf they were silent once more until sandoz added you see old boy we have been protected against that sort of thing then they relapsed again into reminiscences but such as made their hearts thump the remembrance of the many happy days they had spent far away from the college in the open air and the full sunlight when still very young and only in the sixth form the three inseparables had become passionately fond of taking long walks the shortest holidays were eagerly seized upon to tramp for miles and miles and getting bolder as they grew up they finished by scouring the whole of the countryside by making journeys that sometimes lasted for days they slept where they could in the cleft of a rock on some threshing floor still burning hot where the straw of the beaten corn made them a soft couch or in some deserted hut the ground of which they covered with wild thyme and lavender those were flights far from the everyday world when they became absorbed in healthy mother nature herself adoring trees and streams and mountains reveling in the supreme joy of being alone and free dubouche who was a boarder had only joined them on half holidays and during the long vacation besides his legs were heavy and he had the quiet nature of a studious lad 
but Claude and Sandoz never wearied. They awakened each other every Sunday morning by throwing stones at their respective shutters. In summer, above all, they were haunted by the thought of the Viorne, the torrent whose tiny stream waters the low-lying pastures of Plessant. When scarcely twelve, they already knew how to swim, and it became a passion with them to potter about in the holes where the water accumulated to spend whole days there stark naked drying themselves on the burning sand and then replunging into the river living there as it were on their backs on their stomachs searching among the reeds on the banks immersed up to their ears and watching the hiding places of the eels for hours at a stretch that constant contact of water beneath a burning sun prolonged their childhood as it were and lent them the joyous laughter of truant urchins, though they were almost young men, when of an evening they returned to the town amidst the still oppressive heat of a summer sunset. Later on they became very fond of shooting, but shooting such as is carried on in a region devoid of game, where they had to trudge a score of miles to pick off half a dozen petty chaps or fig-peckers, wonderful expeditions, whence they returned with their bags empty, or with a mere bat which they had managed to bring down while discharging their guns at the outskirts of the town. Their eyes moistened at the recollection of those happy days. They once more beheld the white, endless roads covered with layers of dust as if there had been a fall of snow. They paced them again and again in their imagination, happy to hear the fancied creaking of their heavy shoes. Then they cut across the fields, over the reddish-brown ferruginous soil, careering madly on and on, and there was a sky of molten lead above them, not a shadow anywhere, nothing but dwarf olive trees and almond trees with scanty foliage, and then the delicious drowsiness of fatigue on their return, their triumphant bravado at having covered yet more ground than on the previous journey the delight of being no longer conscious of effort, of advancing solely by dint of strength acquired, spurring themselves on with some terrible martial strain which helped to make everything like a dream. Already at that time Claude, in addition to his powder flask and cartridge belt, took with him an album in which he sketched little bits of country, while Sandoz, on his side, always had some favourite poet in his pocket. They lived in a perfect frenzy of romanticism, winged strophes alternated with coarse garrison stories, odes were flung upon the burning, flashing, luminous atmosphere that enwrapped them, and when perchance they came upon a small rivulet, bordered by half a dozen willows, casting grey shadows on the soil all ablaze with colour, they at once went into the seventh heaven. They, there by themselves, performed the dramas they knew by heart, inflating their voices when repeating the speeches of the heroes, and reducing them to the merest whisper when they replied as queens and lovesick maidens. On such days the sparrows were left in peace. In that remote province, amidst the sleepy stupidity of that small town, they had thus lived on from the age of fourteen, full of enthusiasm, devoured by a passion for literature and art. The magnificent scenarios devised by Victor Hugo, the gigantic fantasies which fought therein amidst a ceaseless cross-fire of antithesis, had at first transported them into the fullness of epic glory. Gesticulating, watching the sun decline behind some ruins, seeing life pass by amidst all the superb but false glitter of a fifth act, then Musset had come to unman them with his passion and his tears. They heard their own hearts throb in response to his. A new world opened to them, a world more human, that conquered them by its cries for pity and of eternal misery, which henceforth they were to hear rising from all things. Besides, they were not difficult to please. They showed the veracity of youth, a furious appetite for all kinds of literature, good and bad alike. So eager were they to admire something, that often the most execrable works threw them into a state of exultation similar to that which the purest masterpieces produce. And as Sandoz now remarked, it was their great love of bodily exercise, 
their very revels of literature that had protected them against the numbing influence of their ordinary surroundings. They never entered a café. They had a horror of the streets, even pretending to molt in them like caged eagles, whereas their schoolfellows were already rubbing their elbows over the small marble tables and playing at cards for drinks. Provincial life, which dragged other lads when still young within its cogged mechanism, that habit of going to one's club, of spelling out the local paper from its heading to the last advertisement, the everlasting game of dominoes no sooner finished than renewed, the same walk at the self-same hour and ever along the same roads, all that brutifies the mind like a grindstone crushing the brain filled them with indignation, called forth their protestations. They preferred to scale the neighboring hills in search of some unknown solitary spot, where they declaimed verses even amidst drenching showers, without dreaming of shelter in their very hatred of town life. They had even planned an encampment on the banks of the Viorne, where they were to live like savages, happy with constant bathing and the company of five or six books, which would amply suffice for their wants. Even womankind was to be strictly banished from that camp, being very timid and awkward in the presence of the gentler sex, they pretended to the asceticism of superior intellects. For two years Claude had been in love with a prentice hat trimmer, whom every evening he had followed at a distance, but to whom he had never dared to address a word. Sandoz nursed dreams of ladies met while travelling, beautiful girls, who would suddenly spring up in some unknown wood, charm him for a whole day, and melt into air at dusk. The only love adventure which they had ever met with still evoked their laughter, so silly did it seem to them now. It consisted of a series of serenades which they had given to two young ladies during the time when they, the serenaders, had formed part of the college band. They passed their nights beneath a window, playing the clarinet and the cornet à piston, and thus raising a discordant din which frightened all the folk of the neighbourhood until one memorable evening the indignant parents had emptied all the water-pitchers of the family over them. Ah, those were happy days, and how loving was the laughter with which they recalled them! On the walls of the studio hung a series of sketches which Claude, it so happened, had made during a recent trip southward. Thus it seemed as if they were surrounded by the familiar vistas of bright blue sky overhanging a tawny countryside. Here stretched a plain dotted with little greyish olive trees as far as a rosy network of distant hills. There, between sunburnt russet slopes, the exhausted Viorne was almost running dry beneath the span of an old dust-bepowdered bridge, without a bit of green, nothing save a few bushes dying for want of moisture. Farther on, the mountain gorge of the Enfernay showed its yawning chasm amidst tumbled rocks struck down by lightning a huge chaos a wild desert rolling stony billows as far as the eye could reach then came all sorts of well-remembered nooks the valley of repentance narrow and shady a refreshing oasis amid calcined fields the wood of les trois bon Dieu, with hard green varnished pines shedding pitchy tears beneath the burning sun the sheep-walk of Buffon, showing white like a mosque amidst a far-stretching blood-red plain. And there were yet bits of blinding, sinuous roads, ravines where the heat seemed even to wring bubbling perspiration from the pebbles, stretches of arid, thirsty sand, drinking up rivers drop by drop, mole-hills, goat-paths, and hill-crests half lost in the azure sky. Hello! exclaimed Sandoz, turning towards one sketch. What's that? Claude, indignant, waved his palette. What, don't you remember? We were very nigh breaking our necks there. Surely you recollect the day we clambered from the very bottom of Jomagard with Debouche? The rock was as smooth as your hand, and we had to cling to it with our nails, so that at one moment we could neither get up nor go down again. When we were once atop and about to cook our cutlets, we, you and I, nearly came to blows. Sandoz now remembered. Yes, yes, each had to roast his own cutlet on rosemary sticks, and as mine took fire, 
you exasperated me by chaffing my cutlet, which was being reduced to cinders. They both shook with laughter, until the painter resumed his work, gravely concluding, That's all over, old man. There's to be no more idling at present. He spoke the truth. Since the three inseparables had realized their dream of meeting together in Paris, which they were bent upon conquering, their life had been terribly hard. They had tried to renew the long walks of old. On certain Sunday mornings they had started on foot from the Fontainebleau gate, had scoured the copses of Verrières, gone as far as the Bièvre, crossed the woods of Moudon and Bellevue, and returned home by way of Grenelle. But they taxed Paris with spoiling their legs. They scarcely ever left the pavement now, entirely taken up as they were, with the struggle for fortune and fame. From Monday morning till Saturday night, Sandoz sat fuming and fretting at the municipal building of the fifth arrondissement in a dark corner of the registry office for births, rooted to his stool by the thought of his mother, whom his salary of a hundred and fifty francs a month helped in some fashion to keep. Dubouche, anxious to pay his parents the interest of the money placed on his head, was ever on the lookout for some petty jobs among architects, outside his studies at the School of Arts. As for Claude, thanks to his thousand francs a year, he had his full liberty. But the latter days of each month were terrible enough, especially if he had to share the fag end of his allowance. Luckily he was beginning to sell a little, disposing of tiny canvases at the rate of ten and twelve francs apiece to Papa Malgras, a wary picture dealer. After all, he preferred starvation to turning his art into mere commerce by manufacturing portraits of tradesmen and their wives, concocting conventional religious pictures, or daubing blinds for restaurants, or signboards for accoucheuses. When first he had returned to Paris, he had rented a very large studio in the Impasse des Bourdonnais, but he had moved to the Quai du Bourbon from motives of economy, he lived there like a savage, with an absolute contempt for everything that was not painting. He had fallen out with his relatives who disgusted him. He had even ceased visiting his aunt who kept a pork butcher's shop near the central markets, because she looked too flourishing and plump. Footnote. This aunt is Lisa, of The Fat and the Thin, Le Ventre de Paris, in a few chapters of which Claude figures. Editor. End of footnote. Respecting the downfall of his mother, who was being eaten out of doors and driven into the streets, he nursed a secret grief. Suddenly he shouted to Sandoz, "'Will you be kind enough not to tumble to pieces?' But Sandoz declared that he was getting stiff and jumped from the couch to stretch his legs a bit. They took ten minutes' rest, talking meanwhile about many things. Claude felt condescendingly good-tempered. When his work went smoothly, he brightened up and became talkative. He, who painted with his teeth set, and raged inwardly directly he felt that nature was escaping him. Hence his friend had scarcely resumed his attitude before he went on chattering, without, however, missing a stroke of his brush. "'It's going on all right, old boy, isn't it? You look all there in it. Oh, the brutes! I'll just see whether they'll refuse me this time.' I am more severe for myself than they are for themselves, I'm sure of it, and whenever I pass one of my own pictures, it's more serious than if it had passed before all the hanging committees on earth. You know my picture of the markets, with the two urchins tumbling about on a heap of vegetables? Well, I've scratched it all out. It didn't come right. I found that I had got hold of a beastly machine. Footnote. In familiar conversation, French artists, playwrights, and novelists invariably call their productions by the slang term machines. Editor. End of footnote. A deal too heavy for my strength. But never you fear, I'll take the subject up again some day, when I know better, and I'll take up others, machines which will knock them all cock-a-hoop with surprise. He made a magnificent gesture as if to sweep a whole crowd away, emptied a tube of cobalt on his palette, and then began to jeer, asking what his first master would say to a picture like this. His first master, indeed, Papa Belloc, 
a retired infantry captain with one arm, who for a quarter of a century had taught drawing to the youth of Plassans in one of the galleries of the museum. Then, in Paris, hadn't the celebrated Bertou, the painter of Nero in the Circus, Bertou, whose lessons he had attended for six long months, told him a score of times that he would never be able to do anything. How he now regretted those six months wasted in idiotic efforts, absurd studies under the iron rule of a man whose ideas differed so much from his own. He at last began to hold forth against working at the Louvre. He would, he said, sooner chop his hand off than return there to spoil his perception of nature by undertaking one of those copies which forever dim the vision of the world in which one lives. Was there aught else in art than the rendering of what one felt within oneself? Was not the whole of art reduced to placing a woman in front of one and then portraying her according to the feelings that she inspired? Was not a bunch of carrots, yes, a bunch of carrots, studied from nature and painted unaffectedly in a personal style, worth all the everlasting smudges of the school of arts, all that tobacco-juice painting, cooked up according to certain given recipes. The day would come when one carrot originally rendered would lead to a revolution. It was because of this that he now contented himself with going to the Boutine studio, a free studio kept by a former model, in the Rue de la Huchette. When he had paid his twenty francs, he was put in front of as many men and women as he cared for, and set about his work with a will, never thinking of eating or drinking, but struggling unrestingly with nature, mad almost with the excitement of work, by the side of a pack of dandies who accused him of ignorant laziness and arrogantly prated about their studies, because they copied noses and mouths under the eye of a master. Listen to this, old man. When one of those whippersnappers can build up a torso like that one over yonder, he may come up and tell me, and we'll have a talk together. With the end of his brush he pointed to a study of the nude, suspended from the wall near the door. It was really magnificent, full of masterly breadth of colouring. By its side were some other admirable bits, a girl's feet exquisite in their delicate truthfulness, and a woman's trunk with quivering satin-like skin. In his rare moments of content he felt proud of those few studies, the only ones which satisfied him, which, as it were, foretold a great painter, admirably gifted but hampered by sudden and inexplicable fits of impotency. Dealing sabre-like strokes at the velveteen jacket, he continued lashing himself into excitement with his uncompromising theories which respected nobody. They are all so many daubers of penny prints, who have stolen their reputations, a set of idiots or knaves on their knees before public imbecility. Not one among them dares to give the Philistines a slap in the face. And while we are about it, you know that old Angre turns me sick with his glary painting. Nevertheless, he's a brick and a plucky fellow, and I take off my hat to him, for he did not care a curse for anybody, and he used to draw like the very devil. He ended by making the idiots, who nowadays believe they understand him, swallow that drawing of his. After him, there are only two worth speaking of, Delacroix and Courbet. The others are only numbskulls. Oh, that old romantic lion, the carriage of him. He was a decorator who knew how to make the colors blaze. And what a grasp he had. He would have covered every wall in Paris if they had let him. His palette boiled and boiled over. I know very well that it was only so much phantasmagoria. Never mind, I like it for all that, as it was needed to set the school on fire. Then came the other, a stout workman, that one the truest painter of the century, and altogether classical besides, a fact which not one of the dullards understood. They yelled, of course, they shouted about profanation and realism, when, after all, the realism was only in the subject. The perception remained that of the old masters, and the execution resumed and continued the best bits of work one can find in our public galleries. Both Delacroix and Courbet came at the proper time, 
each made a stride forward. And now, ah, oh, now! He ceased speaking and drew back a few steps to judge of the effect of his picture, becoming absorbed in contemplation for a moment, and then resuming, Yes, nowadays we want something different. What I don't exactly know. If I did and could do it, I should be clever indeed. No one else would be in the race with me. All I do know and feel is that Delacroix's grand romantic scenes are foundering and splitting, that Courbet's black painting already reeks of the mustiness of a studio which the sun never penetrates. You understand me, don't you? We perhaps want the sun, the open air, a clear, youthful style of painting, men and things such as they appear in the real light. In short, I myself am unable to say what our painting should be the painting that our eyes of today should execute and behold. His voice fell again. He stammered and found himself unable to explain the formulas of the future that were rising within him. Deep silence came while he continued working at the velveteen jacket, quivering all the time. Sandoz had been listening to him without stirring from his position. His back was still turned, and he said slowly, as if speaking to the wall in a kind of dream, no, one does not know, and still we ought to know. But each time a professor has wanted to impress a truth upon me, I have mistrustfully revolted, thinking, he's either deceiving himself or deceiving me. Their ideas exasperate me. It seems to me that truth is larger, more general. How beautiful would it be if one could devote the whole of one's existence to one single work, into which one could endeavour to put everything, the beasts of the field as well as mankind, in short, a kind of immense arc, and not in the order indicated by manuals of philosophy, or according to the idiotic hierarchy on which we pride ourselves, but according to the full current of life, a world in which we should be nothing more than an accident, in which the passing cur, even the stones of the roads, would complete and explain us. In sum, the grand whole, without low or high, or clean or unclean, such as it indeed is in reality. It is certainly to science that poets and novelists ought to address themselves, for it is the only possible source of inspiration today. But what are we to borrow from it? How are we to march in its company? The moment I begin to think about that sort of thing, I feel that I am floundering. Oh, if only I knew what a series of books I would hurl at the heads of the crowd! He also became silent. The previous winter he had published his first book, a series of little sketches brought from Plaisant, among which only a few rougher notes indicated that the author was a mutineer, a passionate lover of truth and power and lately he had been feeling his way, questioning himself, while all sorts of confused ideas throbbed in his brain. At first, smitten with the thought of undertaking something Herculean, he had planned a genesis of the universe in three phases or parts, the creation narrated according to science, mankind supervening at the appointed hour and playing its part in the chain of beings and events, then the future, beings constantly following one another, and finishing the creation of the world by the endless labour of life. But he had calmed down in presence of the venturesome hypotheses of this third phase, and he was now looking out for a more restricted, more human framework, in which, however, his vast ambition might find room. "'Ah, to be able to see and paint everything!' exclaimed Claude after a long interval." to have miles upon miles of walls to cover, to decorate the railway stations, the markets, the municipal offices, everything that will be built when architects are no longer idiots. Only strong heads and strong muscles will be wanted, for there will be no lack of subjects. Life such as it runs about the streets, the life of the rich and the poor, in the marketplace and on the race course, on the boulevards, in the populous alleys, and every trade being plied, and every passion portrayed in full daylight. And the peasants, too, and the beasts of the fields and the landscapes. Ah, 
you'll see it all unless I am a downright brute. My very hands are itching to do it. Yes, the whole of modern life, frescoes as high as the Pantheon, a series of canvases big enough to burst the Louvre. Whenever they were thrown together, the painter and the author generally reached this state of excitement. They spurred each other mutually. They went mad with dreams of glory, and there was such a burst of youth, such a passion for work about their plans, that they themselves often smiled afterwards at those great, proud dreams which seemed to endow them with suppleness, strength, and spirit. Claude, who had stepped back as far as the wall, remained leaning against it and gazing at his work. Seeing which, Sandoz, overcome by fatigue, left the couch and joined him. Then both looked at the picture without saying a word. The gentleman in the velveteen jacket was entirely roughed in. His hand, more advanced than the rest, furnished a pretty fresh patch of flesh colour amid the grass, and the dark coat stood out so vigorously that the little silhouettes in the background, the two little women wrestling in the sunlight, seemed to have retreated further into the luminous quivering of the glade. The principal figure, the recumbent woman, as yet scarcely more than outlined, floated about like some aerial creature seen in dreams, some eagerly desired Eve springing from the earth, with her features vaguely smiling and her eyelids closed. "'Well, now, what are you going to call it?' asked Sandoz. "'The open air,' replied Claude, somewhat curtly. The title sounded rather technical to the writer, who, in spite of himself, was sometimes tempted to introduce literature into pictorial art. "'The open air, that doesn't suggest anything.' There's no occasion for it to suggest anything. Some women and a man are reposing in a forest in the sunlight. Does not that suffice? Don't fret. There's enough in it to make a masterpiece. He threw back his head and muttered between his teeth, Dash it all! It's very black still. I can't get Delacroix out of my eye. Do what I will. And then the hand, that's Courbet's manner. Every one of us dabs his brush into the romantic sauce now and then. We had too much of it in our youth. We floundered in it up to our very chins. We needed jolly good wash to get clear of it. Sandoz shrugged his shoulders with a gesture of despair. He also bewailed the fact that he had been born at what he called the confluence of Hugo and Balzac. Nevertheless, Claude remained satisfied, full of the happy excitement of a successful sitting. If his friend could give him two or three more Sundays, the man in the jacket would be all there. He had enough of him for the present. Both began to joke, for, as a rule, Claude almost killed his models, only letting them go when they were fainting, half dead with fatigue. He himself now very nigh dropped, his legs bending under him and his stomach empty. And as the cuckoo clock struck five, he snatched at his crust of bread and devoured it. Thoroughly worn out, he broke it with trembling fingers and scarcely chewed it, again standing before his picture, pursued by his passion to such a degree as to be unconscious even that he was eating. End of chapter 2, part A Chapter 2, part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. Five o'clock, said Sandoz, as he stretched himself with his arms upraised. Let's go and have dinner. Ah, here comes Dubouche, just in time. There was a knock at the door, and Dubouche came in. He was a stout young fellow, dark with regular but heavy features, close-cropped hair and moustaches already full-blown. He shook hands with both his friends and stopped before the picture, looking nonplussed. In reality, that harem-scarum style of painting upset him. Such was the even balance of his nature, such his reverence as a steady student for the established formulas of art and it was only his feeling of friendship which, as a rule, prevented him from criticizing. But this time his whole being revolted visibly. "'Well, what's the matter? Doesn't it suit you?' asked Sandoz, who was watching him. 
Yes, oh, yes, it's very well painted, but... Well, spit it out. What is it that ruffles you? Not much, only the gentleman is fully dressed and the women are not. People have never seen anything like that before. This sufficed to make both the others wild. Why were there not a hundred pictures in the Louvre, composed in precisely the same way? Hadn't all Paris and all the painters and tourists of the world seen them? And besides, if people had never seen anything like it, they would see it now. After all, they didn't care a fig for the public. Not in the least disconcerted by these violent replies, Dubouche repeated quietly, The public won't understand. The public will think it indecorous, and so it is. You wretched bourgeois philistine, exclaimed Claude, exasperated. They are making a famous idiot of you at the School of Arts. You weren't such a fool formerly. These were the current amenities of his two friends since Dubouche had attended the School of Arts. He thereupon beat a retreat, rather afraid of the turn the dispute was taking, and saved himself by belaboring the painters of the school. Certainly his friends were right in one respect. The school painters were real idiots. But as for the architects, that was a different matter. Where was he to get his tuition, if not there? Besides, his tuition would not prevent him from having ideas of his own later on. Wherewith he assumed a very revolutionary air. All right, said Sandoz. The moment you apologize, let's go and dine. But Claude had mechanically taken up a brush and set to work again. Beside the gentleman in the velveteen jacket, the figure of the recumbent woman seemed to be fading away. Feverish and impatient, he traced a bold outline round her so as to bring her forward. Are you coming? In a minute. Hang it, what's the hurry? Just let me set this right, and I'll be with you. Sandoz shook his head and then remarked very quietly, lest he should still further annoy him. You do wrong to worry yourself like that, old man. Yes, you are knocked up and have had nothing to eat, and you'll only spoil your work, as you did the other day. But the painter waved him off with a peevish gesture. It was the old story. He did not know when to leave off. He intoxicated himself with work in his craving for an immediate result in order to prove to himself that he held his masterpiece at last. Doubts had just driven him to despair in the midst of his delight at having terminated a successful sitting. Had he done right, after all, in making the velveteen jacket so prominent? And would he not afterwards fail to secure the brilliancy which he wished the female figure to show? Rather than remain in suspense, he would have dropped down dead on the spot. Feverishly drawing the sketch of Christine's head from the portfolio where he had hidden it, he compared it with the painting on the canvas, assisting himself, as it were, by means of this document derived from life. Hello! exclaimed Dubouche. Where did you get that from? Who is it? Claude, startled by the questions, did not answer. Then, without reflecting, he who usually told them everything brusquely lied, prompted by a delicate impulse to keep silent respecting the adventure of the night. Tell us who it is, repeated the architect. Nobody at all. A model. A model? A very young one, isn't she? She looks very nice. I wish you would give me her address, not for myself, but for a sculptor I know who's on the lookout for a psyche. Have you got the address there? Thereupon, Dubouche turned to a corner of the greyish wall, on which the addresses of several models were written in chalk, haphazard. The women particularly left their cards in that way, in awkward childish handwriting. Zoe Pedifer, 7 Rue Campagne Premier, a big brunette who was getting rather too stout had scrawled her sign manual right across the names of little Flore Beauchamp, 32 Rue de Laval, and Judith Vaquez, 69 Rue du Rocher, a Jewess, both of whom were too thin. I say, have you got the address? resumed Dubouche. Then Claude flew into a passion. Don't pester me! I don't know and I don't care! You're a nuisance, worrying like that, just when a fellow wants to work. Sandoz had not said a word. Surprised at first, he had soon smiled. 
He was gifted with more penetration than Dubouche, so he gave him a knowing nod, and they then began to chaff. They begged Claude's pardon. The moment he wanted to keep the young person for his personal use, they would not ask him to lend her. Ha, ha, the scamp went hunting about for pretty models, and where had he picked up that one? More and more embarrassed by these remarks, Claude went on fidgeting. What a couple of idiots you are, he exclaimed. If you only knew what fools you are making of yourselves, that'll do. You really make me sorry for both of you. His voice sounded so stern that they both became silent immediately, while he, after once more scratching out the woman's head, drew it anew and began to paint it in, following his sketch of Christine, but with a feverish, unsteady touch which went at random. "'Just give me another ten minutes, will you?' he repeated. "'I'll rough in the shoulders to be ready for tomorrow, and then we'll go down.' Sandoz and Dubouche knowing that it was of no use to prevent him from killing himself in this fashion, resigned themselves to the inevitable. The latter lighted his pipe and flung himself on the couch. He was the only one of the three who smoked. The others had never taken kindly to tobacco, always feeling qualmish after a cigar. And when Dubouche was stretched on his back, his eyes turned towards the clouds of smoke he raised, he began to talk about himself in an interminable, monotonous fashion. Ah, that confounded Paris! How one had to work one's fingers to the bone in order to get on! He recalled the fifteen months of apprenticeship he had spent with his master, the celebrated de Quersonniere, a former grand prize man, now architect of the civil branch of public works, an officer of the Legion of Honour, and a member of the Institute, whose chief architectural performance, the Church of Saint Matthieu, was a cross between a pastry cook's mould and a clock in the so-called First Empire style. A good sort of fellow, after all, was this de Carcenier, whom de Bouche chaffed while inwardly sharing his reverence for the old classical formulas. However, but for his fellow pupils, the young man would not have learnt much at the studio in the Rue du Four, for the old master only paid a running visit to the place some three times a week. A set of ferocious brutes were those comrades of his, who had made his life jolly hard in the beginning, but who, at least, had taught him how to prepare a surface, outline, and wash in a plan. And how often had he had to content himself with a cup of chocolate and a roll for déjeuner, in order to pay the necessary five-and-twenty francs to the superintendent? And the sheets of paper he had laboriously smudged, and the hours he had spent in poring over books before he had dared to present himself at the school, and he had narrowly escaped being plucked in spite of all his assiduous endeavours. He lacked imagination, and the drawings he submitted, a caryatid and a summer dining-room, both extremely mediocre performances, had classed him at the bottom of the list. Fortunately, he had made up for this in his oral examination with his logarithms, geometry, and history of architecture, for he was very strong in the scientific parts. Now that he was attending the school as a second-class student, he had to toil and moil in order to secure a first-class diploma. It was a dog's life. There was no end to it, said he. He stretched his legs apart, high upon the cushions, and smoked vigorously and regularly. What with their courses of perspective, of descriptive geometry, of stereotomy, of building, and of the history of art, oh, upon my word, they do make one blackened paper with notes— and every month there is a competitive examination in architecture, sometimes a simple sketch, at others a complete design. There's no time for pleasure if a fellow wishes to pass his examinations and secure the necessary honourable mentions, especially if, besides all that, he has to find time to earn his bread. As for myself, it's almost killing me. One of the cushions having slipped upon the floor, he fished it up with his feet. All the same, I'm lucky. There are so many of us scouring the town every day without getting the smallest job. The day before yesterday I discovered an architect who works for a large contractor. You can have no idea of such an ignoramus of an architect, a downright numbskull, incapable even of tracing a plan. He gives me twenty-five sous an hour, and I set his houses straight for him. It came just in time, too, for my mother sent me word that she was quite cleared out. 
Poor mother, what a lot of money I have to refund her. As Dubouche was evidently talking to himself, chewing the cud of his everyday thoughts, his constant thoughts of making a rapid fortune, Sandoz did not even trouble to listen to him. He had opened the little window and seated himself on a level with the roof, for he felt oppressed by the heat in the studio. But all at once he interrupted the architect. "'I say, are you coming to dinner on Thursday? All the other fellows will be there. Fagerol, Mahoudeau, Jory, Gagnière. Every Thursday quite a band met at Sandoz's. Friends from Plassans and others met in Paris, revolutionaries to a man, and all animated by the same passionate love of art. "'Next Thursday? No, I think not,' answered Dubouche. "'I'm obliged to go to a dance at a family's, I know. "'Where you expect to get hold of a dowry, I suppose?' "'Well, it wouldn't be such a bad speck. He shook the ashes from his pipe onto his left palm, and then, suddenly raising his voice, "'I almost forgot. I've had a letter from Pouillot. "'You too. Well, I think he's pretty well done for, Pouillot. "'Another good fellow gone wrong.' "'Why gone wrong? He'll succeed his father. "'He'll spend his money quietly down there. "'He writes rationally enough. "'I always said he'd show us a thing or two, "'in spite of all his practical jokes. "'Oh, that beast of a Pouillot!' Sandoz, furious, was about to reply when a despairing oath from Claude stopped him. The latter had not opened his lips since he had so obstinately resumed his work. To all appearance he had not even listened. "'Curse it! I have failed again! Decidedly I'm a brute! I shall never do anything!' And in a fit of mad rage he wanted to rush at his picture and dash his fist through it. His friends had to hold him back. Why, it was simply childish to get into such a passion— would matters be improved when, to his mortal regret, he had destroyed his work? Still shaking, he relapsed into silence, and stared at the canvas with an ardent fixed gaze that blazed with all the horrible agony born of his powerlessness. He could no longer produce anything clear or lifelike. The woman's breast was growing pasty with heavy colouring. That flesh which, in his fancy, ought to have glowed, was simply becoming grimy, he could not even succeed in getting a correct focus. What on earth was the matter with his brain that he heard it bursting asunder, as it were, amidst his vain efforts? Was he losing sight that he was no longer able to see correctly? Were his hands no longer his own that they refused to obey him? And thus he went on winding himself up, irritated by the strange hereditary lesion which sometimes so greatly assisted his creative powers, but at others reduced him to a state of sterile despair, such as to make him forget the first elements of drawing. Ah, to feel giddy with vertiginous nausea, and yet to remain there, full of a furious passion to create, when the power to do so fled with everything else, when everything seemed to founder around him. The pride of work, the dreamt of glory, the whole of his existence— "'Look here, old boy,' said Sandoz at last. "'We don't want to worry you, but it's half-past six, and we are starving. "'Be reasonable, and come down with us.' Claude was cleaning a corner of his palette. Then he emptied some more tubes on it, and in a voice like thunder, replied with one single word, "'No!' For the next ten minutes nobody spoke. The painter beside himself wrestled with his picture, whilst his friends remained anxious at this attack, which they did not know how to allay. Then, as there came a knock at the door, the architect went to open it. Allo, it's Papa Malgras. Malgras, the picture dealer, was a thick-set individual with close-cropped, brush-like white hair and a red, splotchy face. He was wrapped in a very dirty old green coat that made him look like an untidy cabman. In a husky voice he exclaimed, I happened to pass along the quay on the other side of the way, and I saw that gentleman at the window— so I came up. Claude's continued silence made him pause. The painter had turned to his picture again with an impatient gesture. Not that this silence in any way embarrassed the newcomer, who, standing erect on his sturdy legs and feeling quite at home, carefully examined the new picture with his bloodshot eyes. Without any ceremony, he passed judgment upon it in one phrase, half ironic, half affectionate. Well, well. "'There's a machine.' 
Then, seeing that nobody said anything, he began to stroll round the studio, looking at the paintings on the walls. Papa Malgras, beneath his thick layer of grease and grime, was really a very cute customer, with taste and scent for good painting. He never wasted his time or lost his way among mere daubers. He went straight, as if from instinct, to individualists whose talent was contested still, but whose future fame his flaming drunkard's nose sniffed from afar. Added to this, he was a ferocious hand at bargaining, and displayed all the cunning of a savage in his efforts to secure, for a song, the pictures that he coveted. True, he himself was satisfied with very honest profits, twenty per cent, thirty at the most. He based his calculations on quickly turning over his small capital, never purchasing in the morning, without knowing where to dispose of his purchase at night. As a superb liar, moreover, he had no equal. Pausing near the door, before the studies from the nude, painted at the Boutin studio, he contemplated them in silence for a few moments, his eyes glistening the while with the enjoyment of a connoisseur, which his heavy eyelids tried to hide. Assuredly, he thought, there was a great deal of talent and sentiment of life about that big crazy fellow Claude, who wasted his time in painting huge sketches of canvas which no one would buy. The girl's pretty legs, the admirably painted woman's trunk, filled the dealer with delight. But there was no sale for that kind of stuff, and he had already made his choice. A tiny sketch, a nook of the country round Plaisant, at once delicate and violent, which he pretended not to notice. At last he drew near and said in an off-hand way, "'What's this? Ah, yes, I know, one of the things you brought back with you from the South. It's too crude. I still have the two I bought of you.' And he went on in mellow, long-winded phrases, "'You'll perhaps not believe me, Monsieur Lantier, but that sort of thing doesn't sell at all, not at all. I've a set of rooms full of them. I'm always afraid of smashing something when I turn round. I can't go on like that.' honor bright. I shall have to go into liquidation, and I shall end my days in the hospital. You know me, eh? My heart is bigger than my pocket, and there's nothing I like better than to oblige young men of talent like yourself. Oh, for the matter of that, you've got talent, and I keep on telling them so, nay, shouting it to them. But what's the good? They won't nibble. They won't nibble. He was trying the emotional dodge, then with the spirit of a man about to do something rash. Well, it shan't be said that I came in to waste your time. What do you want for that rough sketch? Claude, still irritated, was painting nervously. He dryly answered without even turning his head. Twenty francs. Nonsense! Twenty francs! You must be mad! You sold me the others ten francs apiece, and today I won't give a copper more than eight francs. As a rule, the painter closed with him at once, ashamed and humbled at this miserable chaffering, glad also to get a little money now and then. But this time he was obstinate, and took to insulting the picture-dealer, who, giving tit-for-tat, all at once dropped the formal you to assume the glib thou, denied his talent, overwhelmed him with invective, and taxed him with ingratitude. Meanwhile, however, he had taken from his pocket three successive five-franc pieces, which, as if playing at Chuck Farthing, he flung from a distance upon the table where they rattled among the crockery. One, two, three, not one more, dust here, for there's already one too many, and I'll take care to get it back. I'll deduct it from something else of thine as I live. Fifteen francs for that. Thou art wrong, my lad, and thou'lt be sorry for this dirty trick." Quite exhausted, Claude let him take down the little canvas which disappeared as if by magic in his capacious green coat. Had it dropped into a special pocket, or was it reposing on Papa Malgras' ample chest? Not the slightest protuberance indicated its whereabouts. Having accomplished his stroke of business, Papa Malgras abruptly calmed down and went towards the door. But he suddenly changed his mind and came back. "'Just listen, Lantier,' he said in the honeyest of tones. "'I want a lobster painted. "'You really owe me that much after fleecing me. "'I'll bring you the lobster. "'You'll paint me a bit of still life from it "'and keep it for your pains. "'You can eat it with your friends. "'It's settled, isn't it?' 
At this proposal, Sandoz and Dubouche, who had hitherto listened inquisitively, burst into such loud laughter that the picture-dealer himself became gay. Those confounded painters, they did themselves no good, they simply starved. What would have become of the lazy beggars if he, Papa Malgras, hadn't brought a leg of mutton now and then, or a nice fresh place, or a lobster with its garnish of parsley? You'll paint me my lobster, eh, Lantier? Much obliged. And he stationed himself anew before the large canvas, with his wanted smile of mingled derision and admiration. And at last he went off, repeating, Well, well, there's a machine. Claude wanted to take up his palette and brushes once more, but his legs refused their service. His arms fell to his side, stiff, as if pinioned there by some occult force. In the intense melancholy silence that had followed the din of the dispute, he staggered distracted, bereft of sight, before his shapeless work. "'I'm done for! I'm done for!' he gasped. "'That brute has finished me off!' The clock had just struck seven. He had been at work for eight mortal hours without tasting anything but a crust of bread, without taking a moment's rest, ever on his legs, shaken by feverish excitement. And now the sun was setting, shadows began to darken the studio, which in the gloaming assumed a most melancholy aspect. When the light went down like this on the crisis of a bad day's work, it seemed to Claude as if the sun would never rise again but had for ever carried life and all the jubilant gaiety of colour away. Come, implored Sandoz, with all the gentleness of brotherly compassion. Come, there's a good fellow. Even Dubouche added, You'll see more clearly into it tomorrow. Come and dine. For a moment Claude refused to surrender. He stood rooted to the spot, deaf to their friendly voices and fiercely obstinate. What did he want to do then, since his tired fingers were no longer able to grasp the brush? He did not know, but however powerless he might be, he was gnawed by a mad craving to go on working still, and to create in spite of everything. Even if he did nothing, he would at least stay there, he would not vacate the spot. All at once, however, he made up his mind, shaken the while as by a big sob, he clutched firmly hold of his broadest palette knife, and with one deep, slow sweep, he obliterated the woman's head and bosom. It was veritable murder, a pounding away of human flesh. The whole disappeared in a murky, muddy mash. By the side of the gentleman in the dark jacket, amidst the bright verdure where the two little wrestlers, so lightly tinted, were disporting themselves, there remained naught of the nude, headless, breastless woman, but a mutilated trunk, a vague, cadaverous stump, an indistinct, lifeless patch of visionary flesh. Sandoz and Dubouche were already descending the stairs with a great clatter, and Claude followed them, fleeing his work, in agony at having to leave it thus scarred with a gaping gash. End of chapter 2, part B Chapter 3, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert The beginning of the week proved disastrous to Claude. He had relapsed into one of those periods of self-doubt that made him hate painting, with the hatred of a lover betrayed, who overwhelms the faithless one with insults, although tortured by an uncontrollable desire to worship her yet again. So on the Thursday, after three frightful days of fruitless and solitary battling, he left home as early as eight in the morning, banging his door violently, and feeling so disgusted with himself that he swore he would never take up a brush again. When he was unhinged by one of these attacks, there was but one remedy. He had to forget himself, and to do so it was needful that he should look up some comrades with whom to quarrel, and above all, walk about and trudge across Paris until the heat and odour of battle rising from her paving stones put heart into him again. That day, like every other Thursday, 
he was to dine at Sandoz's in company with their friends. But what was he to do until the evening? The idea of remaining by himself, of eating his heart out, disgusted him. He would have gone straight to his friend, only he knew that the latter must be at his office. Then the thought of Dubouche occurred to him, but he hesitated, for their old friendship had lately been cooling down. He felt that the fraternity of their earlier times of effort no longer existed between them. He guessed that Dubouche lacked intelligence, had become covertly hostile, and was occupied with ambitions different from his own. However, he, Claude, must go somewhere. So he made up his mind and repaired to the Rue Jacob, where the architect rented a small room on the sixth floor of a big, frigid-looking house. Claude was already on the landing of the second floor when the doorkeeper, calling him back, snappishly told him that Monsieur de Bouche was not at home and had, in fact, stayed out all night. The young man slowly descended the stairs and found himself in the street, stupefied, as it were, by so prodigious an event as an escapade on the part of Dubouche. It was a piece of inconceivable bad luck. For a moment he strolled along aimlessly. But as he paused at the corner of the Rue de Seine, not knowing which way to go, he suddenly recollected what his friend had told him about a certain night spent at the de Cersonnière studio, a night of terrible hard work, the eve of the day on which the pupils' designs had to be deposited at the School of Arts. At once he walked towards the Rue de Four, where the studio was situated. Hitherto he had carefully abstained from calling there for Dubouche, from fear of the yells with which outsiders were greeted. But now he made straight for the place without flinching, his timidity disappearing so thoroughly before the anguish of loneliness that he felt ready to undergo any amount of insult, could he but secure a companion in misfortune. The studio was situated in the narrowest part of the Rue de Four, at the far end of a decrepit, tumble-down building. Claude had to cross two evil-smelling courtyards to reach a third, across which ran a sort of big closed shed, a huge outhouse of board and plasterwork, which had once served as a packing-case maker's workshop. From outside, through the four large windows, whose panes were daubed with a coating of white lead, nothing could be seen but the bare whitewashed ceiling. Having pushed the door open, Claude remained motionless on the threshold. The place stretched out before him, with its four long tables ranged lengthwise to the windows. Broad double tables they were, which had swarms of students on either side, and were littered with moist sponges, paint saucers, iron candlesticks, water bowls, and wooden boxes, in which each pupil kept his white linen blouse, his compasses, and colours. In one corner, the stove, neglected since the previous winter, stood rusting by a side of a pile of coke that had not been swept away while at the other end a large iron cistern with a tap was suspended between two towels, and amidst the bare untidiness of this shed the eye was especially attracted by the walls which, above, displayed a litter of plaster casts ranged in haphazard fashion on shelves, and disappeared lower down behind forests of T-squares and bevels and piles of drawing-boards tied together with webbing straps. Bit by bit, such parts of the partitions as had remained unoccupied had become covered with inscriptions and drawings, a constantly rising flotsam and jetsam of scrawls traced there as on the margin of an ever-open book. There were caricatures of the students themselves, coarse witticisms fit to make a gendarme turn pale, epigrammatic sentences, addition sums, addresses, and so forth, while above all else, written in big letters, and occupying the most prominent place, appeared this inscription. On the 7th of June, Gorfou declared that he didn't care a hang for Rome. Signed, Godemard. Footnote. The allusion is to the French art school at Rome, and the competitions into which students enter to obtain admission to it, or to secure the prizes offered for the best exhibits which, during their term of residence, they sent to Paris, editor. End of footnote. Claude was greeted with a growl, like that of wild beasts disturbed in their lair. What kept him motionless was the strange aspect of this place, 
on the morning of the truck night, as the embryo architects termed the crucial night of labour. Since the previous evening, the whole studio, some sixty pupils, had been shut up there. Those who had no designs to exhibit, the niggers, as they were called, remaining to help the others, the competitors who, being behind time, had to knock off the work of a week in a dozen hours. Already at midnight they had stuffed themselves with brawn, saveloys, and similar viands, washed down with cheap wine. Towards one o'clock they had secured the company of some ladies, and without the work abating, the feast had turned into a Roman orgy, blended with a smoking competition. On the damp, stained floor there remained a great litter of greasy paper and broken bottles, while the atmosphere reeked of burnt tallow, musk, highly seasoned sausages, and cheap bluish wine. And now many voices savagely yelled, "'Turn him out! Oh, that mug! What does he want, that guy? Turn him out! Turn him out!' For a moment Claude, quite dazed, staggered beneath the violence of the onslaught. But the epithets became viler, for the acme of elegance, even for the more refined among these young fellows, was to rival one's friends in beastly language. He was nevertheless recovering and beginning to answer when Dubouche recognized him. The latter turned crimson, for he detested that kind of adventure. He felt ashamed of his friend and rushed towards him amidst the jeers which were now levelled at himself. "'What, is it you?' he gasped. "'I told you never to come in. "'Just wait for me a minute in the yard.' At that moment, Claude, who was stepping back, narrowly escaped being knocked down by a little hand-truck which two big, full-bearded fellows brought up at a gallop. It was from this truck that the night of heavy toil derived its name, and for the last week the students who had got behind-hand with their work, through taking up petty paid jobs outside, had been repeating the cry, "'Oh, I'm in the truck, and no mistake!' The moment the vehicle appeared, a clamour arose. It was a quarter to nine o'clock. There was barely time to reach the School of Arts. However, a helter-skelter rush emptied the studio. Each brought out his chases amidst a general jostling. Those who obstinately wished to give their designs a last finishing touch were knocked about and carried away with their comrades. In less than five minutes every frame was piled upon the truck, and the two bearded fellows, the most recent additions to the studio, harnessed themselves to it like cattle, and drew it along with all their strength, the others vociferating and pushing from behind. It was like the rush of a sluice. The three courtyards were crossed amidst a torrential crash, and the street was invaded, flooded by the howling throng. Claude, nevertheless, had set up running by the side of Dubouche, who came at the fag end, very vexed at not having had another quarter of an hour to finish a tinted drawing more carefully. "'What are you going to do afterwards?' asked Claude. "'Oh, I've errands which will take up my whole day.' The painter was grieved to see that even this friend escaped him. "'All right, then,' said he. "'In that case I leave you. Shall we see you at Sandoz's tonight?' "'Yes, I think so.' unless I'm kept to dinner elsewhere. Both were getting out of breath. The band of embryo architects, without slackening their pace, had purposely taken the longest way round for the pleasure of prolonging their uproar. After rushing down the Rue de Four, they dashed across the Place Goslin and swept into the Rue de l'Echaudet. Heading the procession was the truck, drawn and pushed along more and more vigorously, and constantly rebounding over the rough paving stones amid the jolting of the frames with which it was laden. Its escort galloped along madly, compelling the passers-by to draw back close to the houses in order to save themselves from being knocked down, while the shopkeepers, standing open-mouthed on their doorsteps, believed in a revolution. The whole neighbourhood seemed topsy-turvy. In the Rue Jacob, such was the rush, so frightful were the yells, that several house-shutters were hastily closed. As the Rue Bonaparte was at last being reached, one tall, fair fellow thought it a good joke to catch hold of a little servant girl who stood bewildered on the pavement, and drag her along with them, like a wisp of straw caught in a torrent. "'Well,' said Claude, "'good-bye, then. I'll see you to-night.' 
Yes, tonight. The painter, out of breath, had stopped at the corner of the Rue des Beaux-Arts. The court gates of the art school stood wide open in front of him, and the procession plunged into the yard. After drawing breath, Claude retraced his steps to the Rue de Seine. His bad luck was increasing. It seemed ordained that he should not be able to beguile a chum from work that morning. So he went up the street and slowly walked on as far as the Place du Pantheon without any definite aim. Then it occurred to him that he might just look into the municipal offices, if only to shake hands with Sandoz. That would, at any rate, mean ten minutes well spent. But he positively gasped when he was told by an attendant that Monsieur Sandoz had asked for a day off to attend a funeral. However, he knew the trick of old. His friend always found the same pretext whenever he wanted to do a good day's work at home. He had already made up his mind to join him there, when a feeling of artistic brotherliness, the scruple of an honest worker, made him pause. Yes, it would be a crime to go and disturb that good fellow, and infect him with the discouragement born of a difficult task, at the very moment when he was, no doubt, manfully accomplishing his own work. So Claude had to resign himself to his fate. He dragged his black melancholy along the quays until midday, his head so heavy, so full of thoughts of his lack of power, that he only espied the well-loved horizons of the Seine through a mist. Then he found himself once more in the Rue de la Femme Sans Tête, where he breakfasted at Gomard's wine-shop, whose sign, the Dog of Montargis, inspired him with interest. Some stonemasons, in their working blouses, bespattered with mortar, were there at table, and like them, and with them, he ate his eight sous ordinary. Some beef broth in a bowl, in which he soaked some bread, followed by a slice of boiled soup beef, garnished with haricot beans, and served up on a plate damp with dishwater. However, it was still too good, he thought, for a brute unable to earn his bread. Whenever his work miscarried, he undervalued himself, ranked himself lower than a common labourer, whose sinewy arms could at least perform their appointed task. For an hour he lingered in the tavern, brutifying himself by listening to the conversation at the tables around him. Once outside, he slowly resumed his walk in haphazard fashion. When he got to the Place de l'Hôtel de Ville, however, a fresh idea made him quicken his pace. Why had he not thought of Fagerolles? Fagerolles was a nice fellow, gay, and by no means a fool, although he studied at the School of Arts. One could talk with him, even when he defended bad painting. If he had lunched at his father's, in the Rue Veille de Temple, he must certainly still be there. On entering the narrow street, Claude felt a sensation of refreshing coolness come over him. In the sun it had grown very warm, and moisture rose from the pavement, which, however bright the sky, remained damp and greasy beneath the constant tramping of the pedestrians. Every minute, when a push obliged Claude to leave the footwalk, he found himself in danger of being knocked down by trucks or vans. Still the street amused him, with its straggling houses out of line, their flat frontages checkered with signboards up to the very eaves, and pierced with small windows, whence came the hum of every kind of handiwork that can be carried on at home. In one of the narrowest parts of the street, a small newspaper shop made him stop. It was betwixt a hairdresser's and a tripe seller's, and had an outdoor display of idiotic prints, romantic balderdash mixed with filthy caricatures fit for a barrack room. In front of these pictures, a lank hobbledehoy stood lost in reverie, while two young girls nudged each other and jeered. He felt inclined to slap their faces, but he hurried across the road, for Fagerolles' house happened to be opposite. It was a dark old tenement, standing forward from the others, and was bespattered, like them, with the mud from the gutters. As an omnibus came up, Claude barely had time to jump upon the foot pavement, there reduced to the proportions of a simple ledge. The wheels brushed against his chest, and he was drenched to his knees. Monsieur Fagerol, senior, a manufacturer of artistic zinc work, had his workshops on the ground floor of the building, 
and having converted two large front rooms on the first floor into a warehouse, he personally occupied a small, dark, cellar-like apartment overlooking the courtyard. It was there that his son Henri had grown up, like a true specimen of the flora of the Paris streets, at the edge of that narrow pavement, constantly struck by the omnibus wheels, always soddened by the gutter water, and opposite the print and newspaper shop, flanked by the barbers and tripe sellers. At first his father had made an ornamental draftsman of him for personal use. But when the lad had developed higher ambition, taking to painting proper, and talking about the school of arts, there had been quarrels, blows, a series of separations and reconciliations. Even now, although Henri had already achieved some successes, the manufacturer of artistic zinc work, while letting him have his will, treated him harshly, like a lad who was spoiling his career. After shaking off the water, Claude went up the deep archway entrance to a courtyard, where the light was quite greenish, and where there was a dank, musty smell like that at the bottom of a tank. There was an overhanging roofing of glass and iron at the foot of the staircase, which was a wide one, with a wrought iron railing eaten with rust. As the painter passed the warehouse on the first floor, he glanced through a glass door and noticed M. Fagerolles examining some patterns. Wishing to be polite, he entered, in spite of the artistic disgust he felt, for all that zinc coloured to imitate bronze, and having all the repulsive mendacious pettiness of spurious art. "'Good morning, monsieur. Is Henri still at home?' The manufacturer, a stout, sallow-looking man, drew himself straight amidst all his nosegay vases and cruets and statuettes. He had in his hand a new model of a thermometer, formed of a juggling girl, who crouched and balanced the glass tube on her nose. "'Henri did not come in to lunch,' he answered dryly. This cool reception upset Claude. "'Ah, he did not come back. I beg pardon for having disturbed you, then. Good day, monsieur. Good day.' Once more outside, Claude began to swear to himself. His ill luck was complete. Fagerolles escaped him also. He even felt vexed with himself for having gone there, and having taken an interest in that picturesque old street. He was infuriated by the romantic gangrene that ever sprouted afresh within him, do what he might. It was his malady, perhaps, the false principle which he sometimes felt like a bar across his skull. And when he had reached the keys again, he thought of going home, to see whether his picture was really so very bad. But the mere idea made him tremble all over. His studio seemed a chamber of horrors, where he could no more continue to live, as if, indeed, he had left the corpse of some beloved being there. No, no, to climb the three flights of stairs, to open the door, to shut himself up face to face with that, would have needed strength beyond his courage. So he crossed the Seine and went along the Rue Saint-Jacques. He felt too wretched and lonely, and come what might, he would go to the Rue d'Enfer to turn Sandoz from his work. Sandoz's little fourth-floor flat consisted of a dining-room, a bedroom, and a strip of kitchen. It was tenanted by himself alone. His mother, disabled by paralysis, occupied on the other side of the landing a single room, where she lived in morose and voluntary solitude. The street was a deserted one. The windows of the rooms overlooked the gardens of the deaf and dumb asylum, above which rose the rounded crest of a lofty tree and the square tower of Saint-Jacques-de-Haupas. Claude found Sandoz in his room, bending over his table, busy with a page of copy. "'Am I disturbing you?' said Claude. "'Not at all. I've been working ever since morning, and I've had enough of it. I've been killing myself for the last hour over a sentence that reads anyhow, and which has worried me all through my lunch.' The painter made a gesture of despair and the other, seeing him so gloomy, at once understood matters. "'You don't get on either, eh? Well, let's go out. A sharp walk will take a little of the rust off us. Shall we go?' As he was passing the kitchen, however, an old woman stopped him. 
it was his charwoman who as a rule came only for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening on thursdays however she remained the whole afternoon in order to look after the dinner then it's decided monsieur she asked it's to be a piece of skate and a leg of mutton with potatoes yes if you like for how many am i to lay the cloth oh as for that one never knows lay for five at any rate we'll see afterwards dinner at seven eh we'll try to be home by then when they were on the landing sandoz leaving claude to wait for him stole into his mother's room when he came out again in the same discreet affectionate manner they both went downstairs in silence outside having sniffed to right and left as if to see which way the wind blew they ended by going up the street reached the place de l'observatoire and turned down the boulevard de montparnasse this was their ordinary promenade they reached this spot instinctively being fond of the wide expanse of the outer boulevards where they could roam and lounge at ease they continued silent for their heads were heavy still but the comfort of being together gradually made them more serene still it was only when they were opposite the western railway station that sandoz spoke i say suppose we go to mahoudot's to see how he's getting on with his big machine i know that he has given his gods and saints the slip to-day all right answered claude let's go to mahoudot's they at once turned into the rue de cherche midi there at a few steps from the boulevard mahoudot a sculptor had rented the shop of a fruiterer who had failed in business and he had installed his studio therein contenting himself with covering the windows with a layer of whitening at this point the street wide and deserted has a quiet provincial aspect with a somewhat ecclesiastical touch large gateways stand wide open showing a succession of deep roomy yards from a cowkeeper's establishment comes a tepid pungent smell of litter and the dead wall of a convent stretches away for a goodly length it was between this convent and a herbalist's that the shop transformed into a studio was situated it still bore on its signboard the inscription fruit and vegetables in large yellow letters claude and sandoz narrowly missed being blinded by some little girls who were skipping in the street on the foot pavement sat several families whose barricades of chairs compelled the friends to step down onto the roadway however they were drawing nigh when the sight of the herbalist's shop delayed them for a moment between its windows decked with enemas bandages and similar things beneath the dried herbs hanging above the doorway whence came a constant aromatic smell a thin dark woman stood taking stock of them while behind her in the gloom of the shop one saw the vague silhouette of a little sickly-looking man who was coughing and expectorating the friends nudged each other their eyes lighted up with bantering mirth and then they turned the handle of mahoudot's door the shop though tolerably roomy was almost filled by a mass of clay a colossal bacante falling back upon a rock the wooden stays bent beneath the weight of that almost shapeless pile of which nothing but some huge limbs could as yet be distinguished some water had been spilt on the floor several muddy buckets straggled here and there while a heap of moistened plaster was lying in a corner on the shelves formerly occupied by fruit and vegetables were scattered some casts from the antique covered with a tracery of cinder-like dust which had gradually collected there a wash-house kind of dampness a stale smell of moist clay rose from the floor and the wretchedness of this sculptor's studio and the dirt attendant upon the profession were made still more conspicuous by the wan light that filtered through the shop windows besmeared with whitening what is it you shouted mahoudot who sat before his female figure smoking a pipe he was small and thin with a bony face already wrinkled at twenty-seven his black mane-like hair lay entangled over his very low forehead and his sallow mask ugly almost to ferociousness was lighted up by a pair of childish eyes bright and empty which smiled with winning simplicity the son of a stonemason of plassans he had achieved great success at the local art competitions 
and had afterwards come to Paris as the town laureate, with an allowance of 800 francs per annum for a period of four years. In the capital, however, he had found himself at sea, defenceless, failing in his competitions at the School of Arts, and spending his allowance to no purpose, so that at the end of his term he had been obliged for a livelihood to enter the employment of a dealer in church statues, at whose establishment for ten hours a day he scraped away at St. Joseph's, St. Roche's, Mary Magdalene's, and in fact all the saints of the calendar. For the last six months, however, he had experienced a revival of ambition on finding himself once more among his comrades of Provence, the eldest of whom he was, fellows whom he had known at Gerard's boarding school for little boys, and who had since grown into savage revolutionaries. At present, through his constant intercourse with impassioned artists, who troubled his brain with all sorts of wild theories, his ambition aimed at the gigantic. "'The devil!' said Claude. "'There's a lump!' The sculptor, delighted, gave a long pull at his pipe and blew a cloud of smoke. "'Eh, isn't it? I'm going to give them some flesh, and living flesh, too, not the bladders of lard that they turn out.' "'It's a woman bathing, isn't it?' asked Sandoz. "'No, I shall put some vine leaves around her head. A bacante, you understand.' At this Claude flew into a violent passion. "'A bacante! Do you want to make fools of people? Does such a thing as a bacante exist? A vintaging girl, eh? And quite modern, dash it all. I know she's nude, so let her be a peasant woman who has undressed. And that must be properly conveyed, mind.' People must realize that she lives. Maudo, taken aback, listened, trembling. He was afraid of Claude, and bowed to his ideal of strength and truth. So he even improved upon the painter's idea. Yes, yes, that's what I meant to say, a vintaging girl. And you'll see whether there isn't a real touch of woman about her. At that moment, Sandoz, who had been making the tour of the huge block of clay, exclaimed, Why? Here's that sneak of a Shen. Behind the pile, indeed, sat Shen, a burly fellow who was quietly painting away, copying the fireless, rusty stove on a small canvas. It could be told that he was a peasant by his heavy, deliberate manner, and his bull neck tanned and hardened like leather. His only noticeable feature was his forehead, displaying all the bumps of obstinacy for his nose was so small as to be lost between his red cheeks, while a stiff beard hid his powerful jaws. He came from Saint-Fermain, a village about six miles from Plassans, where he had been a cowboy, until he drew for the conscription, and his misfortunes dated from the enthusiasm that a gentleman of the neighbourhood had shown for the walking-stick handles which he carved out of roots with his knife. From that moment, having become a rustic genius, an embryo great man for this local connoisseur, who happened to be a member of the museum committee, he had been helped by him, adulated and driven crazy with hopes. But he had successively failed in everything, his studies and competitions, thus missing the town's purse. Nevertheless, he had started for Paris, after worrying his father, a wretched peasant, into premature payment of his heritage, a thousand francs, on which he reckoned to live for a twelve-month while awaiting the promised victory. The thousand francs had lasted eighteen months. Then, as he had only twenty francs left, he had taken up his quarters with his friend Maudot. They both slept in the same bed in the dark back shop. They both, in turn, cut slices from the same loaves of bread, of which they bought sufficient for a fortnight at a time, so that it might get very hard and that they might thus be able to eat but little of it. "'I say, Shane,' continued Sandoz, "'your stove is really very exact.' Shane, without answering, gave a chuckle of triumph, which lighted up his face like a sunbeam. By a crowning stroke of imbecility, and to make his misfortunes perfect, his protector's advice had thrown him into painting, in spite of the real taste that he showed for wood-carving and he painted like a whitewasher, mixing his colours as a hodman mixes his mortar, and managing to make the clearest 
and brightest of them quite muddy. His triumph consisted, however, in combining exactness with awkwardness. He displayed all the naive minuteness of the primitive painters. In fact, his mind, barely raised from the clods, delighted in petty details. The stove, with its perspective all awry, was tame and precise, and in colour as dingy as mire. Claude approached and felt full of compassion at the sight of that painting, and though he was as a rule so harsh towards bad painters, his compassion prompted him to say a word of praise. Ah, one can't say that you are a trickster. You paint, at any rate, as you feel. Very good indeed. However, the door of the shop had opened, and a good-looking, fair fellow with a big pink nose and large blue short-sighted eyes entered, shouting, I say, why does that herbalist woman next door always stand on her doorstep? What an ugly mug she's got. They all laughed, except Maudot who seemed very much embarrassed. "'Jory, the king of blunderers,' declared Sandoz, shaking hands with the newcomer. "'Why, what, is Maudot interested in her? I didn't know,' resumed Jory, when he had at length grasped the situation. "'Well, well, what does it matter? When everything's said, they are all irresistible.' "'As for you,' the sculptor rejoined, I can see you have tumbled on your lady love's fingernails again. She has dug a bit out of your cheek. They all burst out laughing anew, while Jory in his turn reddened. In fact, his face was scratched. There were even two deep gashes across it. The son of a magistrate of Plassans, whom he had driven half crazy by his dissolute conduct, he had crowned everything by running away with a music hall singer under the pretext of going to Paris to follow the literary profession. During the six months that they had been camping together in a shady hotel of the Quartier Latin, the girl had almost flayed him alive each time she caught him paying attention to anybody else of her sex. And as this often happened, he always had some fresh scar to show, a bloody nose, a torn ear, or a damaged eye, swollen and blackened. At last they all began to talk, with the exception of Shane, who went on painting with the determined expression of an ox at the plough. Jory had at once gone into ecstasies over the roughly indicated figure of the vintaging girl. He worshipped a massive style of beauty. His first writings in his native town had been some Parnassian sonnets, celebrating the copious charms of a handsome pork butcheress. In Paris, where he had fallen in with the whole band of Plassans, he had taken to art criticism, and for a livelihood he wrote articles for twenty francs apiece in a small, slashing paper called The Drummer. Indeed, one of these articles, a study on a picture by Claude, exhibited at Papa Malgras, had just caused a tremendous scandal, for Jory had therein run down all the painters whom the public appreciated to extol his friend whom he set up as the leader of a new school, the school of the open air. Very practical at heart, he did not care in reality a rap about anything that did not conduce to his own pleasures. He simply repeated the theories he heard enunciated by his friends. "'I say, Maudot,' he exclaimed, "'you shall have an article. I'll launch that woman of yours. What limbs, my boys! She's magnificent!' Then, suddenly changing the conversation, "'By the way,' he said, "'my miserly father has apologized. "'He's afraid I shall drag his name through the mud, "'so he sends me a hundred francs a month now. "'I am paying my debts.' "'Debts? "'You are too careful to have any,' muttered Sandoz with a smile. "'In fact, Jory displayed a hereditary tightness of fist "'which much amused his friends.' He managed to lead a profligate life without money and without incurring debts, and with the skill he thus displayed was allied constant duplicity, a habit of incessantly lying, which he had contracted in the devout sphere of his family, where his anxiety to hide his vices had made him lie about everything at all hours and even without occasion. But he now gave a superb reply, the cry of a sage of deep experience. Oh, you fellows, you don't know the worth of money. This time he was hooted. What a philistine! 
and the invectives continued, when some light taps on one of the window panes suddenly made the din cease. "'She is really becoming a nuisance,' said Maudo, with a gesture of annoyance. "'Eh? Who is it? The herbalist woman?' asked Jory. "'Let her come in. It'll be great fun.' The door, indeed, had already been opened, and Maudot's neighbour, Madame Jabouille, or Mathilde, as she was familiarly called, appeared on the threshold. She was about thirty, with a flat face horribly emaciated, and passionate eyes, the lids of which had a bluish tinge as if they were bruised. It was said that some members of the clergy had brought about her marriage with little Jabouille, at a time when the latter's business was still flourishing, thanks to the custom of all the pious folks of the neighbourhood. The truth was that one sometimes espied black cassocks stealthily crossing that mysterious shop, where all the aromatic herbs set a perfume of incense. A kind of cloistral quietude pervaded the place. The devotees who came in spoke in low voices, as if in a confessional, slipped their purchases into their bags furtively, and went off with downcast eyes. Unfortunately, some very horrid rumours had got abroad, slander invented by the wine-shop keeper opposite said pious folks at any rate since the widower had remarried the business had been going to the dogs the glass jars seemed to have lost all their brightness and the dried herbs suspended from the ceiling were tumbling to dust jabouille himself was coughing his life out reduced to a very skeleton and though mathilde professed to be religious the pious customers gradually deserted her, being of opinion that she made herself too conspicuous with young fellows of the neighbourhood, now that Jabouille was almost eaten out of house and home. For a moment Mathilde remained motionless, blinking her eyes. A pungent smell had spread through the shop, a smell of simples which she brought with her in her clothes and greasy tumbled hair, the sickly sweet of mallow, the sharp odour of elder-seed, the bitter effluvia of rhubarb, but above all the hot whiff of peppermint, which seemed like her very breath. She made a gesture of feigned surprise. Oh, dear me, you have company. I did not know. I'll drop in again. Yes, do, said Maudot, looking very vexed. Besides, I'm going out. You can give me a sitting on Sunday. At this, Claude, stupefied, fairly stared at the emaciated Mathilde, and then at the huge vintaging woman. What, he cried, is it Madame who poses for that figure? The Dickens, you exaggerate. Then the laughter began again, while the sculptor stammered his explanations. Oh, she only poses for the head and the hands, and merely just to give me a few indications. Mathilde, however, laughed with the others, with a sharp, brazen-faced laughter, showing the while the gaping holes in her mouth, where several teeth were wanting. Yes, resumed Maudo, I have to go out on some business now. Isn't it so, you fellows? We are expected over yonder? He had winked at his friends, feeling eager for a good lounge. They all answered that they were expected, and helped him to cover the figure of the vintaging girl, with some strips of old linen which were soaking in a pail of water. However, Mathilde, looking submissive but sad, did not stir. She merely shifted from one place to another when they pushed against her, while Chêne, who was no longer painting, glanced at her over his picture. So far he had not opened his lips, but as Maudot at last went off with his three friends, he made up his mind to ask, in his husky voice, "'Shall you come home to-night?' "'Very late. Have your dinner and go to bed. Good-bye.' Then Chêne remained alone with Mathilde in the damp shop, amidst the heaps of clay and the puddles of water, while the chalky light from the whitened windows glared crudely over all the wretched untidiness. End of chapter 3, part A Chapter Three, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lisa Reichert. 
Meantime, the four others, Claude and Mahoudeau, Jory and Sandoz, strolled along, seeming to take up the whole width of the Boulevard des Invalides. It was the usual thing. The band was gradually increased by the accession of comrades picked up on the way, and then came the wild march of a horde upon the warpath. With the bold assurance of their twenty summers, these young fellows took possession of the foot pavement. The moment they were together, trumpets seemed to sound in advance of them. They seized upon Paris and quietly dropped it into their pockets. There was no longer the slightest doubt about their victory. They freely displayed their threadbare coats and old shoes, like destined conquerors of tomorrow who disdained bagatelles and had only to take the trouble to become the masters of all the luxury surrounding them. And all this was attended by huge contempt for everything that was not art. Contempt for fortune, contempt for the world at large, and above all, contempt for politics. What was the good of all such rubbish? Only a lot of incapables meddled with it. A warped view of things, magnificent in its very injustice, exalted them. An intentional ignorance of the necessities of social life, the crazy dream of having none but artists upon earth. They seemed very stupid at times, but all the same, their passion made them strong and brave. Claude became excited. Faith in himself revived amidst the glow of common hopes. His worry of the morning had only left a vague numbness behind, and he now once more began to discuss his picture with Sandoz and Mahoudeau, swearing, it is true, that he would destroy it the next day. Jory, who was very short-sighted, stared at all the elderly ladies he met, and aired his theories on artistic work. A man ought to give his full measure at once in the first spurt of inspiration. As for himself, he never corrected anything. And, still discussing, the four friends went on down the boulevard, which, with its comparative solitude and its endless rows of fine trees, seemed to have been expressly designed as an arena for their disputations. When they reached the esplanade, the wrangling became so violent that they stopped in the middle of that large open space. Beside himself, Claude called Jory a numbskull. Was it not better to destroy one's work than to launch a mediocre performance upon the world? Truckling to trade was really disgusting. Maudot and Sandoz, on their side, shouted both together at the same time. Some passers-by, feeling uneasy, turned round to look, and at last gathered round these furious young fellows, who seemed bent on swallowing each other. But they went off vexed, thinking that some practical joke had been played upon them, when they suddenly saw the quartet, all good friends again, go into raptures over a wet nurse, dressed in light colours, with long cherry-tinted ribbons streaming from her cap. There, now, that was something like. What a tint! What a bright note it set amid the surroundings! Delighted, blinking their eyes, they followed the nurse under the trees, and then suddenly seemed roused and astonished to find that they had already come so far. The esplanade, open on all sides, save on the south, where rose the distant pile of the Hôtel des Invalides, delighted them. It was so vast, so quiet. They there had plenty of room for their gestures, and they recovered breath there, although they were always declaring that Paris was far too small for them, and lacked sufficient air to inflate their ambitious lungs. "'Are you going anywhere particular?' asked Sandoz of Mahoudeau and Jory. "'No,' answered the latter. "'We are going with you. Where are you going?' Claude, gazing carelessly about him, muttered, "'I don't know. That way, if you like.' They turned on to the Quai d'Orsay, and went as far as the Pont de la Concorde. In front of the corps législatif, the painter remarked, with an air of disgust, "'What a hideous pile!' "'Jules Favre made a fine speech the other day. How he did rile Rouer, said Jory. However, the others left him no time to proceed. The disputes began afresh. "'Who was Jules Favre, and who was Rouer?' a parcel of idiots whom no one would remember ten years after their death. The young men had now begun to cross the bridge, and they shrugged their shoulders with compassion. 
Then, on reaching the Place de la Concorde, they stopped short and relapsed into silence. Well, opined Claude at last, this isn't bad by any means. It was four o'clock, and the day was waning amidst a glorious powdery shimmer. To the right and left, towards the Madeleine and towards the Corps Legislatif, lines of buildings stretched away, showing against the sky, while in the Tuileries Gardens rose gradients of lofty rounded chestnut trees, and between the verdant borders of the pleasure walks, the avenue of the champs Élysées sloped upward as far as the eye could reach, topped by the colossal Arc de Triomphe, agape in front of the infinite. A double current, a twofold stream rolled along, horses showing like living eddies, vehicles like retreating waves, which the reflections of a panel or the sudden sparkle of the glass of a carriage lamp seemed to tip with white foam. Lower down, the square, with its vast footways, its roads as broad as lakes, was filled with a constant ebb and flow, crossed in every direction by whirling wheels and peopled with black specks of men, while the two fountains plashed and streamed, exhaling delicious coolness amidst all the ardent life. Claude, quivering with excitement, kept saying, Oh, Paris, it's ours. We have only to take it. They all grew excited, their eyes opened wide with desire. Was it not Glory herself that swept from the summit of that avenue over the whole capital? Paris was there, and they longed to make her theirs. Well, we'll take her one day, said Sandoz, with his obstinate air. To be sure we shall, said Mahoudeau and Jory, in the simplest manner. They had resumed walking. They still roamed about, found themselves behind the Madeleine, and went up the Rue Tranchée. At last, as they reached the Place d'Ave, Sandoz exclaimed, So we are going to Baudequin's, eh? The others looked as if they had dropped from the sky. In fact, it did seem as if they were going to Baudequin's. What day of the week is it? asked Claude. Thursday, eh? Then Fagerolles and Gagnière are sure to be there. Let's go to Baudequin's and thereupon they went up the Rue d'Amsterdam. They had just crossed Paris, one of their favourite rambles, but they took other routes at times, from one end of the quays to the other, or from the Porte Saint-Jacques to Moulineau, or else to Père Lachaise, followed by a roundabout return along the outer boulevards. They roamed the streets, the open spaces, the crossways. They rambled on for whole days, as long as their legs would carry them, as if intent on conquering one district after another, by hurling their revolutionary theories at the house-fronts. And the pavement seemed to be their property. All the pavement touched by their feet, all that old battleground whence arose intoxicating fumes, which made them forget their lassitude. The Café Baudequin was situated on the Boulevard des Batignolles, at the corner of the Rue d'Orsay. Without the least why or wherefore, it had been selected by the band as their meeting place, though Gagnière alone lived in the neighbourhood. They met there regularly on Sunday nights, and on Thursday afternoons at about five o'clock, those who were then at liberty had made it a habit to look in for a moment. That day, as the weather was fine and bright, the little tables outside under the awning were occupied by rows of customers, obstructing the footway. But the band hated all elbowing and public exhibition, so they jostled the other people in order to go inside, where all was deserted and cool. "'Allo, there's Fagerol by himself!' exclaimed Claude. He had gone straight to their usual table at the end of the café, on the left, where he shook hands with a pale, thin young man, whose pert, girlish face was lighted up, by a pair of winning, satirical grey eyes, which at times flashed like steel. They all sat down and ordered beer, after which the painter resumed. "'Do you know that I went to look for you at your father's, and a nice reception he gave me?' Fagerol, who affected a low, devil-may-care style, slapped his thighs. "'Oh, the old fellow plagues me. I hooked it this morning after a row.' He wants me to draw some things for his beastly zinc stuff. As if I hadn't enough zinc stuff at the art school. This slap at the professors delighted the young man's friends. 
he amused them and made himself their idol by dint of alternate flattery and blame. His smile went from one to the other, while by the aid of a few drops of beer spilt on the table, his long nimble fingers began tracing complicated sketches. His art evidently came very easily to him. It seemed as if he could do anything with a turn of the hand. "'And Gagnière?' asked Maudot. "'Haven't you seen him?' "'No, I've been here for the last hour.' Just then, Jory, who had remained silent, nudged Sandoz and directed his attention to a girl seated with a gentleman at a table at the back of the room. There were only two other customers present, two sergeants who were playing cards. The girl was almost a child, one of those young Parisian hussies who are as lank as ever at eighteen. She suggested a frizzy poodle, with the shower of fair little locks that fell over her dainty little nose and her large, smiling mouth set between rosy cheeks. She was turning over the leaves of an illustrated paper, while the gentleman, accompanying her, gravely sipped a glass of Madeira. But every other minute she darted gay glances from over the newspaper towards the band of artists. "'Pretty, isn't she?' whispered Jory. "'Who is she staring at? Why, she's looking at me!' But Fagerolles suddenly broke in. "'I say, no nonsense!' "'Don't imagine that I have been here for the last hour merely waiting for you.' The others laughed, and lowering his voice he told them about the girl, who was named Irma Bécot. She was the daughter of a grocer in the Rue Montorgueil, and she had been to school in the neighbourhood till she was sixteen, writing her exercises between two bags of lentils and finishing off her education on her father's doorstep, lolling about on the pavement amidst the jostling of the throng, and learning all about life from the everlasting tittle-tattle of the cooks, who retailed all the scandal of the neighbourhood while waiting for five sous' worth of gruyere cheese to be served them. Her mother having died, her father himself had begun to lead rather a gay life, in such wise that the whole of the grocery stores, tea, coffee, dried vegetables, and jars and drawers of sweet stuff, were gradually devoured. Irma was still going to school when one day the place was sold up. Her father died of a fit of apoplexy, and Irma sought refuge with a poor aunt who gave her more kicks than halfpence, with the result that she ended up by running away and taking her flight through all the dancing places of Montmartre and Batignolles. Claude listened to the story with his usual air of contempt for women. Suddenly, however, as the gentleman rose and went out after whispering in her ear, Irma Bacco, after watching him disappear, bounded from her seat with the impulsiveness of a schoolgirl in order to join Fagerolles, beside whom she made herself quite at home, giving him a smacking kiss and drinking out of his glass. And she smiled at the others in a very engaging manner, for she was partial to artists and regretted that they were generally so miserably poor. As Jory was smoking, she took his cigarette out of his mouth and set it in her own, but without pausing in her chatter, which suggested that of a saucy magpie. "'You are all painters, aren't you? How amusing! But why do those three look as if they were sulking? Just laugh a bit, or I shall make you, you'll see.' As a matter of fact, Sandoz, Claude, and Maudot, quite taken aback, were watching her most gravely. She herself remained listening, and on hearing her companion come back, she hastily gave Fagerolle an appointment for the morrow. Then, after replacing the cigarette between Jory's lips, she strode off with her arms raised and making a very comical grimace, in such wise that when the gentleman reappeared, looking sedate and somewhat pale, he found her in her former seat still looking at the same engraving in the newspaper. The whole scene had been acted so quickly and with such jaunty drollery, that the two sergeants who sat nearby, good-natured fellows both of them, almost died of laughter as they shuffled their cards afresh. In fact, Irma had taken them all by storm. Sandoz declared that her name of Beco was very well suited for a novel. Claude asked whether she would consent to pose for a sketch, while Maudot already pictured her as a Paris gamin, a statuette that would be sure to sell. She soon went off, however, and, behind the gentleman's back, she wafted kisses to the whole party, a shower of kisses, which quite upset the impressionable Jory. 
It was five o'clock, and the band ordered some more beer. Some of the usual customers had taken possession of the adjacent tables, and these Philistines cast sidelong glances at the artist's corner, glances in which contempt was curiously mingled with a kind of uneasy deference. The artists were indeed well known. A legend was becoming current respecting them. They themselves were now talking on commonplace subjects, about the heat, the difficulty of finding room in the omnibus to the Odéon, and the discovery of a wine-shop where real meat was obtainable. One of them wanted to start a discussion about a number of idiotic pictures that had lately been hung in the Luxembourg Museum. But there was only one opinion on the subject, that the pictures were not worth their frames. Thereupon they left off conversing. They smoked, merely exchanging a word or a significant smile now and then. Well, asked Claude at last, are we going to wait for Gagnière? At this there was a protest. Gagnière was a bore. Besides, he would turn up as soon as he smelt the soup. Let's be off, then, said Sandoz. There's a leg of mutton this evening, so let's try to be punctual. Each paid his score, and they all went out. Their departure threw the café into a state of emotion. Some young fellows, painters, no doubt, whispered together as they pointed at Claude, much in the same manner as if he were the redoubtable chieftain of a horde of savages. Jory's famous article was producing its effect. The very public was becoming his accomplice, and of itself was soon to found that school of the open air, which the band had so far only joked about. As they gaily said, the Café Baudequin was not aware of the honour they had done it, on the day when they selected it to be the cradle of a revolution. Fagerolles, having reinforced the group, they now numbered five, and slowly took their way across Paris, with their tranquil look of victory. The more numerous they were, the more did they stretch across the pavement, and carry away on their heels the burning life of the streets. When they had gone down the Rue de Clichy, they went straight along the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin, turned towards the Rue de Richelieu, crossed the Seine by the Pont des Arts, so as to fling their jibes at the Institute, and finally reached the Luxembourg by way of the Rue de Seine, where a poster printed in three colours, the garish announcement of a travelling circus, made them all shout with admiration. Evening was coming on. The stream of wayfarers flowed more slowly. The tired city was awaiting the shadows of night, ready to yield to the first comer who might be strong enough to take her. On reaching the Rue d'Enfer, where Sandos had ushered his four friends into his own apartments, he once more vanished into his mother's room. He remained there for a few moments, and then came out without saying a word, but with the tender, gentle smile habitual to him on such occasions. And immediately afterwards a terrible hubbub of laughter, argument, and mere shouting arose in his little flat. Sandoz himself set the example, all the while assisting the charwoman, who burst into bitter language because it was half-past seven and her leg of mutton was drying up. The five companions, seated at table, were already swallowing their soup, a very good onion soup, when a newcomer suddenly appeared. "'Allo, here's Gagnière!' was the vociferous chorus. Gagnière, short, slight, and vague-looking, with a doll-like startled face, set off by a fair curly beard, stood for a moment on the threshold blinking his green eyes. He belonged to Melun, where his well-to-do parents, who were both dead, had left him two houses, and he had learnt painting unassisted in the forest of Fontainebleau. His landscapes were at least conscientiously painted, excellent in intention, but his real passion was music, a madness for music, a cerebral bonfire which set him on a level with the wildest of the band. "'Am I in the way?' he gently asked. "'Not at all. Come in!' shouted Sandoz. The charwoman was already laying an extra knife and fork. "'Suppose she lays a place for Dubouche while she's about it,' said Claude. He told me he would perhaps come. But they were all down upon Dubouche, who frequented women in society." Jory said that he had seen him in a carriage with an old lady and her daughter, whose parasols he was holding on his knees. "'Where have you come from to be so late?' asked Fagerolles of Gagnier. The latter, who was about to swallow his first spoonful of soup, set it in his plate again. "'I was in the Rue de l'Henri, 
you know, where they have chamber music. Oh, my boy, some of Schumann's machines. You haven't an idea of them. They clutch hold of you at the back of your head, just as if somebody were breathing down your back. Yes, yes, it's something much more immaterial than a kiss, just a whiff of breath. Upon my honour, a fellow feels as if he were going to die. His eyes were moistening and he turned pale, as if experiencing some over-acute enjoyment. "'Eat your soup,' said Maudot. "'You'll tell us all about it afterwards.' The skate was served, and they had the vinegar bottle put on the table to improve the flavour of the black butter, which seemed rather insipid. They ate with a will, and the hunks of bread swiftly disappeared. There was nothing refined about the repast, and the wine was mere common stuff, which they watered considerably from a feeling of delicacy, in order to lessen their host's expenses. They had just saluted the leg of mutton with a hurrah, and the host had begun to carve it, when the door opened anew, but this time there were furious protests. No, no, not another soul! Turn him out! Turn him out! Dubouche, out of breath with having run, bewildered at finding himself amidst such howling, thrust his fat, pallid face forward, whilst stammering explanations. Really, now, I assure you, it was the fault of the omnibuses. I had to wait for five of them in the champs Élysées. No, no, he's lying. Let him go. He shan't have any of that mutton. Turn him out. Turn him out. All the same, he ended by coming in, and it was then noticed that he was stylishly attired, all in black, trousers and frock coat alike, and cravatted and booted in the stiff ceremonious fashion of some respectable member of the middle classes going out to dinner. Hallo, he has missed his invitation, chaffed Fagerolles. Don't you see that his fine ladies didn't ask him to stay to dinner, and so now he's come to gobble up our leg of mutton, as he doesn't know where else to go? At this Dubouche turned red and stammered, Oh, what an idea! How ill-natured you are! And besides, just attend to your own business. Sandals and Claude, seated next to each other, smiled, and the former, beckoning to Dubouche, said to him, Lay your own place. Bring a plate and a glass and sit between us. Like that, they'll leave you alone. However, the chaff continued all the time that the mutton was being eaten. When the charwoman had brought Dubouche a plate of soup and a piece of skate, he himself fell in with the jokes good-naturedly. He pretended to be famished, greedily mopped out his plate, and related a story about a mother having refused him her daughter because he was an architect. The end of the dinner thus became very boisterous, they all rattled on together. The only dessert, a piece of brie cheese, met with enormous success. Not a scrap of it was left, and the bread almost ran short. The wine did run short, so they each swallowed a clear draught of water, smacking their lips the while amidst great laughter. And with faces beaming, and well-filled paunches, they passed into the bedroom with the supreme content of folks who have fared very sumptuously indeed. Those were Sandoz's jolly evenings. Even at the times when he was hard up, he had always had some boiled beef and broth to share with his comrades. He felt delighted at having a number of them around him, all friends inspired by the same ideas. Though he was of their own age, he beamed with fatherly feelings and satisfied good nature when he saw them in his rooms, around him, hand in hand, and intoxicated with hope. As he had but two rooms, the bedroom did duty as a drawing-room, and became as much theirs as his. For lack of sufficient chairs, two or three had to seat themselves on the bed, and on those warm summer evenings the window remained wide open to let in the air. From it, two black silhouettes were to be seen rising above the houses, against the clear sky, the tower of saint jacques du pas and the tree of the deaf and dumb asylum. When money was plentiful there was beer. Everyone brought his own tobacco. The room soon became full of smoke, and, without seeing each other, they ended by conversing far into the night, amidst the deep, mournful silence of that deserted district. On that particular evening, at about nine o'clock, the charwoman came in. "'Monsieur, I have done. Can I go?' "'Yes, go to bed. You have left the kettle on the fire, haven't you? I'll make the tea myself. Sandoz had risen. He went off at the heels of the charwoman, 
and only returned a quarter of an hour afterwards. He had no doubt been to kiss his mother, whom he tucked up every night before she dozed off. Meanwhile the voices had risen to a high pitch again. Fagerolles was telling a story. "'Yes, old fellow, at the school they even correct nature herself. The other day Mazelle comes up to me and says, "'Those two arms don't correspond.' Whereupon I reply, "'Look for yourself, monsieur, the models are like that. It was little Flory Beauchamp, you know.' Well, Mazelle furiously replies, "'If she has them like that, it's very wrong of her.' They almost all shrieked, especially Claude, to whom Fagerolles told the story by way of paying court. For some time previously the younger artist had yielded to the elder's influence, and although he continued to paint with purely tricky skill, he no longer talked of anything but substantial, thickly painted work, of bits of nature thrown on to canvas, palpitating with life, such as they really were. This did not prevent him, though, from elsewhere chaffing the adepts of the open-air school, whom he accused of impasting with a kitchen ladle. Dubouche, who had not laughed, his sense of rectitude being offended, made so bold as to reply, "'Why do you stop at the school if you think you are being brutified there? It's simple enough. One goes away. Oh, I know you are all against me, because I defend the school. But you see, my idea is that— when a fellow wants to carry on a trade, it is not a bad thing for him to begin by learning it. Ferocious shouts arose at this, and Claude had need of all his authority to secure a hearing. He is right, one must learn one's trade, but it won't do to learn it under the ferrule of professors who want to cram their own views forcibly into your nut. That Mazelle is a perfect idiot." He flung himself backward on the bed on which he had been sitting, and with his eyes raised to the ceiling he went on in an excited tone. Ah, life, life, to feel it and portray it in its reality, to love it for itself, to behold in it the only real, lasting, and changing beauty, without any idiotic idea of ennobling it by mutilation, to understand that all so-called ugliness is nothing but the mark of individual character. To create real men and endow them with life, yes, that's the only way to become a god. His faith was coming back to him. The march across Paris had spurred him on once more. He was again seized by his passion for living flesh. They listened to him in silence. He made a wild gesture, then calmed down. No doubt everyone has his own ideas, but the annoyance is that at the Institute they are even more intolerant than we are. The hanging committee of the Salon is in their hands. I am sure that that idiot Mazelle will refuse my picture. Thereupon they all broke into imprecations, for this question of the hanging committee was the everlasting subject of their wrath. They demanded reforms. Everyone had a solution of the problem ready from universal suffrage applied to the election of a hanging committee, liberal in the widest sense of the word, down to unrestricted liberty, a salon open to all exhibitors. Footnote. The reader will bear in mind that all these complaints made by Claude and his friends apply to the old salons, as organized under government control at the time of the Second Empire. Editor. End of footnote. While the others went on discussing the subject, Gagnière drew Mahoudeau to the open window, where, in a low voice, his eyes the while staring into space, he murmured, "'Oh, it's nothing at all, only four bars, a simple impression jotted down there and then. But what a deal there is in it! To me it's first of all a landscape, dwindling away in the distance.' bit of melancholy road with the shadow of a tree that one cannot see, and then a woman passes along, scarcely a silhouette. On she goes, and you never meet her again, no, never more again. Just at that moment, however, Fagerolles exclaimed, I say, Gagnière, what are you going to send to the Salon this year? Gagnière did not hear, but continued talking, enraptured as it were, in Schumann one finds everything, the infinite, and Wagner too, whom they hissed again last Sunday. But a fresh call from Fagerolles made him start. 
Eh, what? What am I going to send to the salon? A small landscape, perhaps, a little bit of the Seine. It is so difficult to decide. First of all, I must feel pleased with it myself. He had suddenly become timid and anxious again. His artistic scruples, his conscientiousness, kept him working for months on a canvas the size of one's hand. Following the tracks of the French landscape painters, those masters who were the first to conquer nature, he worried about correctness of tone, pondering and pondering over the precise value of tints, till theoretical scruples ended by making his touch heavy. And he often did not dare to chance a bright dash of colour, but painted in a greyish, gloomy key, which was astonishing when one remembered his revolutionary passions. "'For my part,' said Maudot, "'I feel delighted at the prospect of making them squint with my woman.' Claude shrugged his shoulders. "'Oh, you'll get in. The sculptors have broader minds than the painters. And besides, you know very well what you are about. You have something at your fingers' ends that pleases. There will be plenty of pretty bits about your vintaging girl.' The compliment made Maudot feel serious. He posed above all for vigour of execution. He was unconscious of his real vein of talent, and despised gracefulness, though it ever invincibly sprung from his big coarse fingers, the fingers of an untaught working man, like a flower that obstinately sprouts from the hard soil where the wind has flung its seed. Fagerolles, who was very cunning, had decided to send nothing, for fear of displeasing his masters, and he chaffed the salon, calling it a foul bazaar, where all the bad painting made even the good turn musty. In his inmost heart he was dreaming of one day securing the Rome prize, though he ridiculed it as he did everything else. However, Jory stationed himself in the middle of the room, holding up his glass of beer. Sipping every now and then, he declared, "'Well, your hanging committee quite disgusts me. I say, shall I demolish it? I'll begin bombarding it in our very next number. You'll give me some notes, eh, and we'll knock it to pieces. That'll be fine fun.' Claude was at last fully wound up, and general enthusiasm prevailed. Yes, yes, they must start a campaign. They would all be in it, and, pressing shoulder to shoulder, march to the battle together. At that moment there was not one of them who reserved his share of fame, for nothing divided them as yet. Neither the profound dissemblance of their various natures, of which they themselves were ignorant, nor their rivalries which would some day bring them into collision was not the success of one the success of all the others. Their youth was fermenting, they were brimming over with mutual devotion. They indulged anew in their everlasting dream of gathering into a phalanx to conquer the world, each contributing his individual effort, this one helping that one forward, and the whole band reaching fame at once in one row. Claude, as the acknowledged chief, was already sounding the victory, distributing laurels with such lyrical abundance that he overlooked himself. Fagerolles himself, jibing Parisian though he might be, believed in the necessity of forming an army, while even Jory, although he had a coarser appetite, with a deal of the provincial still about him, displayed much useful comradeship, catching various artistic phrases as they fell from his companion's lips, and already preparing in his mind the articles which would herald the advent of the band and make them known. And Maudot purposely exaggerated his intentional roughness, and clasped his hands like an ogre kneading human flesh, while Gagnière, in ecstasy, as if freed from the everlasting greyishness of his art, sought to refine sensation to the utmost limits of intelligence and Dubouche, with his matter-of-fact convictions, threw in but a word here and there, words, however, which were like club blows in the very midst of the fray. Then Sandoz, happy and smiling at seeing them so united, all in one shirt, as he put it, opened another bottle of beer. He would have emptied every one in the house. "'Eh?' he cried. "'We're agreed. Let's stick to it.' It's really pleasant to come to an understanding among fellows who have something in their nuts. So may the thunderbolts of heaven sweep all idiots away. At that same moment a ring at the bell stupefied him. Amidst the sudden silence of the others he inquired, 
Who to the deuce can that be at eleven o'clock? He ran to open the door, and they heard him utter a cry of delight. He was already coming back again, throwing the door wide open as he said, Ah, it's very kind indeed to think of us and surprise us like this. Bon grand, gentlemen. The great painter, whom the master of the house announced in this respectfully familiar way, entered, holding out both hands. They all eagerly rose, full of emotion, delighted with that manly, cordial handshake so willingly bestowed. Bongrand was then forty-five years old, stout, and with a very expressive face and long grey hair. He had recently become a member of the Institute, and wore the rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honour in the top buttonhole of his unpretentious alpaca jacket. He was fond of young people. He liked nothing so much as to drop in from time to time, and smoke a pipe among these beginners, whose enthusiasm warmed his heart. "'I'm going to make the tea,' exclaimed Sandoz. When he came back from the kitchen, carrying the teapot and cups, he found Bongrand installed astride a chair, smoking his short cutty amidst the din which had again arisen. Bongrand himself was holding forth in a stentorian voice. The grandson of a farmer of the Beauce region, the son of a man risen to the middle classes, with peasant blood in his veins, indebted for his culture to a mother of very artistic tastes, he was rich, had no need to sell his pictures, and retained many tastes and opinions of bohemian life. "'The hanging committee? Well, I'd sooner hang myself than belong to it,' said he, with sweeping gestures. "'Am I an executioner to kick poor devils, who often have to earn their bread, out of doors? "'Still, you might render us great service by defending our pictures before the committee,' observed Claude. "'Oh, dear, no!' I should only make matters worse for you. I don't count. I'm nobody. There was a chorus of protestations. Fagerol objected in a shrill voice. Well, if the painter of the village wedding does not count. But Bongrand was getting angry. He had risen, his cheeks afire. Eh, don't pester me with the wedding. I warn you, I'm getting sick of that picture. It's becoming a perfect nightmare to me ever since it has been hung in the Luxembourg Museum. This village wedding, a party of wedding guests roaming through a cornfield, peasants studied from life with an epic look of the heroes of Homer about them, had so far remained his masterpiece. The picture had brought about an evolution in art, for it had inaugurated a new formula. Coming after Delacroix, and parallel with Courbet, it was a piece of romanticism tempered by logic, with more correctness of observation, more perfection in the handling. And though it did not squarely tackle nature amidst the crudity of the open air, the new school claimed connection with it. "'There can be nothing more beautiful,' said Claude, "'than the two first groups, the fiddler, and then the bride with the old peasant.' "'And the strapping peasant girl, too,' added Maudot the one who's turning round and beckoning. I had a great mind to take her for the model of a statue. And that gust of wind among the corn, added Gagnier, and the pretty bit of the boy and girl skylarking in the distance. Bongrand sat listening with an embarrassed air and a smile of inward suffering, and when Fagerolles asked him what he was doing just then, he answered with a shrug of his shoulders, Well, nothing, some little things, but I shan't exhibit this time. I should like to find a telling subject. Oh, you fellows are happy at still being at the bottom of the hill. A man has good legs, then. He feels so plucky when it's a question of getting up. But when once he is atop, the deuce take it, the worries begin. A real torture, fisticuffs, efforts which must be constantly renewed, lest one should slip down too quickly. Really, now, one would prefer being below, for the pleasure of still having everything to do. Ah, you may laugh, but you'll see it all for yourselves some day. They were indeed laughing, thinking it a paradox, or a little piece of affectation, which they excused. To be hailed like Bongrand with the name of master, was that not the height of bliss? He, with his arms resting on the back of his chair, listening to them in silence, leisurely puffing his pipe, and renouncing the idea of trying to make them understand him. Meanwhile, 
Dubouche, who had rather domesticated tastes, helped Sandoz to hand the tea round, and the din continued. Fagerolles related a story about Daddy Malgras and a female cousin by marriage, whom the dealer offered as a model on conditions that he was given a presentation of her in oils. Then they began to talk of models. Maudot waxed furious because the really well-built female models were disappearing. It was impossible to find one with a decent figure now. Then suddenly the tumult increased again. Gagnière was being congratulated about a connoisseur whose acquaintance he had made in the Palais Royal one afternoon, while the band played, an eccentric gentleman living on a small income, who never indulged in any other extravagance than that of buying pictures. The other artists laughed and asked for the gentleman's address. Then they fell foul of the picture dealers, dirty blackguards, who preyed on artists and starved them. It was really a pity that connoisseurs mistrusted painters to such a degree as to insist upon a middleman under the impression that they would thus make a better bargain. This question of bread and butter excited them yet more, though Claude showed magnificent contempt for it all. The artist was robbed, no doubt, but what did that matter if he had painted a masterpiece and had some water to drink? Jory, having again expressed some low ideas about lucre, aroused general indignation. Out with the journalist! He was asked stringent questions. Would he sell his pen? Would he not sooner chop off his wrist than write anything against his convictions? But they scarcely waited for his answer, for the excitement was on the increase. It became the superb madness of early manhood, contempt for the whole world, an absorbing passion for good work, freed from all human weaknesses, soaring in the sky like a very sun. Ah, how strenuous was their desire to lose themselves, consume themselves in that brazier of their own kindling. Bongrand, who had not stirred the while, made a vague gesture of suffering at the sight of that boundless confidence, that boisterous joy at the prospect of attack. He forgot the hundred paintings which had brought him his glory. He was thinking of the work which he had left roughed out on his easel now. Taking his cutty from between his lips, he murmured, his eyes glistening with kindliness, "'Oh, youth, youth!' Until two in the morning, Sandoz, who seemed ubiquitous, kept on pouring fresh supplies of hot water into the teapot. From the neighbourhood, now asleep, one now only heard the meowing of an amorous tabby. They all talked at random, intoxicated by their own words, hoarse with shouting, their eyes scorched, and when at last they made up their minds to go, Sandoz took the lamp to show them a light over the banisters, saying very softly, "'Don't make a noise. My mother is asleep.' The hushed tread of their boots on the stairs died away at last, and deep silence fell upon the house. It struck four. Claude, who had accompanied Bongrand, still went on talking to him in the deserted streets. He did not want to go to bed. He was waiting for daylight with impatient fury, so that he might set to work at his picture again. This time he felt certain of painting a masterpiece, exalted as he was by that happy day of good fellowship, his mind pregnant with a world of things. He had discovered at last what painting meant, and he pictured himself re-entering his studio as one returns into the presence of a woman one adores, his heart throbbing violently, regretting even this one day's absence, which seemed to him endless desertion and he would go straight to his canvas and realize his dream in one sitting. However, at every dozen steps or so, amidst the flickering light of the gas lamps, Bongrand caught him by a button of his coat to repeat to him that, after all, painting was an accursed trade. Sharp as he, Bongrand, was supposed to be, he did not understand it yet. At each new work he undertook, he felt as if he were making a debut. It was enough to make one smash one's head against the wall. The sky was now brightening. Some market gardeners' carts began rolling down towards the central markets, and the pair continued chattering, each talking for himself in a loud voice, beneath the paling stars. End of chapter 3, part B
Chapter Four, Part A of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Six weeks later, Claude was painting one morning amidst a flood of sunshine that streamed through the large window of his studio. Constant rain had made the middle of August very dull, but his courage for work returned with the blue sky. His great picture did not make much progress, albeit he worked at it throughout long, silent mornings, like the obstinate, pugnacious fellow he was. All at once there came a knock at his door. He thought that Madame Joseph, the doorkeeper, was bringing up his lunch, and as the key was always in the door, he simply called, Come in! The door had opened. There was a slight rustle, and then all became still. He went on painting without even turning his head but the quivering silence and the consciousness of some vague gentle breathing near him at last made him fidgety. He looked up and felt amazed. A woman stood there, clad in a light gown, her features half hidden by a white veil, and he did not know her, and she was carrying a bunch of roses which completed his bewilderment. All at once he recognized her. You, mademoiselle! Well, I certainly didn't expect you! It was Christine. He had been unable to restrain that somewhat unamiable exclamation, which was a cry from the heart itself. At first he had certainly thought of her, then, as the days went by for nearly a couple of months without sign of her, she had become for him merely a fleeting, regretted vision, a charming silhouette which had melted away in space and would never be seen again. "'Yes, monsieur, it's I. I wished to come. I thought it was wrong not to come and thank you.' She blushed and stammered at a loss for words. She was out of breath, no doubt through climbing the stairs, for her heart was beating fast. What, was this long-debated visit out of place after all? It had ended by seeming quite natural to her. The worst was that, in passing along the quay, she had bought that bunch of roses with the delicate intention of thereby showing her gratitude to the young fellow, and the flowers now dreadfully embarrassed her. How was she to give them to him? What would he think of her? The impropriety of the whole proceeding had only struck her as she opened the door. But Claude, more embarrassed still, resorted to exaggerated politeness. He had thrown aside his palette and was turning the studio upside down in order to clear a chair. Pray, be seated, mademoiselle. This is really a surprise. You are too kind. Once seated, Christine recovered her equanimity. He looked so droll with his wild, sweeping gestures, and she felt so conscious of his shyness that she began to smile, and bravely held out the bunch of roses. Look here, I wish to show you that I am not ungrateful. At first he said nothing, but stood staring at her, thunderstruck. When he saw, though, that she was not making fun of him, he shook both her hands with almost sufficient energy to dislocate them. Then he at once put the flowers in his water jug, repeating, "'Ah, oh, now you are a good fellow, you really are. This is the first time I pay that compliment to a woman, honour bright.' He came back to her, and looking straight into her eyes, he asked, "'Then you have not altogether forgotten me?' "'You see that I have not,' she replied, laughing. "'Why, then, did you wait two months before coming to see me?' Again she blushed. The falsehood she was about to tell revived her embarrassment for a moment. "'But you know that I am not my own mistress,' she said. "'Oh, Madame Van Zad is very kind to me, only she is a great invalid and never leaves the house. But she grew anxious as to my health and compelled me to go out to breathe a little fresh air.' She did not allude to the shame which she had felt during the first few days after her adventure on the Quai de Bourbon. Finding herself in safety beneath the old lady's roof, the recollection of the night she had spent in Claude's room had filled her with remorse. But she fancied at last that she had succeeded in dismissing the matter from her mind. It was no longer anything but a bad dream, which grew more indistinct each day. Then, how it was she could not tell, but amidst the profound quietude of her existence, the image of that young man who had befriended her had returned to her once more, becoming more and more precise, till at last it occupied her daily thoughts. Why should she forget him? 
she had nothing to reproach him with. On the contrary, she felt she was his debtor. The thought of seeing him again, dismissed at first, struggled against later on, at last became an all-absorbing craving. Each evening the temptation to go and see him came strong upon her in the solitude of her own room. She experienced an uncomfortable, irritating feeling, a vague desire which she could not define, and only calmed down somewhat on ascribing this troubled state of mind to a wish to evince her gratitude. She was so utterly alone, she felt so stifled in that sleepy abode, the exuberance of youth seized so strongly within her, her heart craved so desperately for friendship. So I took advantage of my first day out, she continued, and besides, the weather was so nice this morning after all the dull rain. Claude, feeling very happy and standing before her, also confessed himself, but he had nothing to hide. For my part, said he, I dared not think of you any more. You were like one of the fairies of the story-books who spring from the floor and disappear into the walls at the very moment one least expects it, aren't you now? I said to myself, it's all over. It was perhaps only in my fancy that I saw her come to this studio. Yet here you are. Well, I am pleased at it, very pleased indeed. Smiling but embarrassed, Christine averted her head, pretending to look around her. But her smile soon died away. The ferocious-looking paintings which she again beheld, the glaring sketches of the South, the terrible anatomical accuracy of the studies from the nude, all chilled her as on the first occasion. She became really afraid again, and she said gravely, in an altered voice, "'I am disturbing you. I am going.' "'Oh, not at all, not at all!' exclaimed Claude, preventing her from rising. "'It does me good to have a talk with you, for I was working myself to death. Oh, that confounded picture! It's killing me as it is!' Thereupon Christine, lifting her eyes, looked at the large picture, the canvas that had been turned to the wall on the previous occasion, and which she had vainly wished to see. The background, the dark glade pierced by a flood of sunlight, was still only broadly brushed in. But the two little wrestlers, the fair one and the dark, almost finished by now, showed clearly in the light. In the foreground, the gentleman in the velveteen jacket, three times begun afresh, had now been left in distress. The painter was more particularly working at the principal figure, the woman lying on the grass. He had not touched the head again. He was battling with the body changing his model every week, so despondent at being unable to satisfy himself, that for a couple of days he had been trying to improve the figure from imagination, without recourse to nature, although he boasted that he never invented. Christine at once recognized herself. Yes, that nude girl sprawled on the grass, one arm behind her head, smiling with lowered eyelids, was herself, for she had her features. The idea absolutely revolted her, and she was wounded, too, by the wildness of the painting, so brutal indeed that she considered herself abominably insulted. She did not understand that kind of art. She thought it execrable, and felt a hatred against it, the instinctive hatred of an enemy. She rose at last and curtly repeated, I must be going. Claude watched her attentively, both grieved and surprised by her sudden change of manner. "'Going, already?' "'Yes, they are waiting for me. Good-bye.' And she had already reached the door before he could take her hand, and ventured to ask her, "'When shall I see you again?' She allowed her hand to remain in his. For a moment she seemed to hesitate. "'I don't know. I'm so busy.' Then she withdrew her hand and went off, hastily, saying, "'One of these days, when I can. Good-bye.' Claude remained stock still on the threshold. He wondered what had come over her again to cause her sudden coolness, her covert irritation. He closed the door and walked about with dangling arms and without understanding, seeking vainly for the phrase, the gesture that could have offended her. And he in his turn became angry, and launched an oath into space with a terrific shrug of the shoulders, as if to rid himself of this silly worry. Did a man ever understand women? However, the sight of the roses overlapping the water-jug pacified him, 
They smelt so sweet. Their scent pervaded the whole studio, and silently he resumed his work amidst the perfume. Two more months passed by. During the earlier days, Claude, at the slightest stir of a morning, when Madame Joseph brought him up his breakfast or his letters, quickly turned his head and could not control a gesture of disappointment. He no longer went out until after four, and the doorkeeper, having told him one evening on his return home that a young person had called to see him at about five, he had only grown calm on ascertaining that the visitor was merely a model, Zoe Piedifer. Then, as the days went by, he was seized with a furious fit of work, becoming unapproachable to everyone, indulging in such violent theories that even his friends did not venture to contradict him. He swept the world from his path with one gesture. There was no longer to be anything but painting left. One might murder one's parents, comrades, and women especially, and it would all be a good riddance. After this terrible fever, he fell into abominable despondency, spending a week of impotence and doubt, a whole week of torture, during which he fancied himself struck silly. But he was getting over it. He had resumed his usual life, his resigned, solitary struggle with his great picture, when, one foggy morning, towards the end of October, he started and hastily set his palette aside. There had been no knock, but he had just recognized the footfall coming up the stairs. He opened the door, and she walked in. She had come at last. Christine that day wore a large cloak of grey material which enveloped her from head to foot. Her little velvet hat was dark, and the fog outside had pearled her black lace veil. But he thought her looking very cheerful, with the first slight shiver of winter upon her. She at once began to make excuses for having so long delayed her return. She smiled at him in her pretty, candid manner, confessed that she had hesitated, and that she had almost made up her mind to come no more. Yes, she had her own opinions about things, which she felt sure he understood. As it happened, he did not understand at all. He had no wish to understand, seeing that she was there. It was quite sufficient that she was not vexed with him, that she would consent to look in now and then like a chum. There were no explanations. They kept their respective torments and the struggles of recent times to themselves. For nearly an hour they chatted together right pleasantly, with nothing hidden nor antagonistic remaining between them. It was as if an understanding had been arrived at, unknown to themselves and while they were far apart. She did not even appear to notice the sketches and studies on the walls. For a moment she looked fixedly at the large picture, at the figure of the woman lying on the grass under the blazing golden sun. No, it was not like herself. That girl had neither her face nor her body. How silly to have fancied that such a horrid mess of colour was herself. And her friendship for the young fellow was heightened by a touch of pity. He could not even convey a likeness. When she went off, it was she who, on the threshold, cordially held out her hand. "'You know, I shall come back again.' "'Yes, in two months' time.' "'No, next week. You'll see, next Thursday.' On the Thursday, she punctually returned, and after that she did not miss a week. At first she had no particular day for calling, simply taking advantage of her opportunities, but subsequently she selected Monday— the day allowed her by Madame Vansade, in order that she might have a walk in the fresh open air of the Bois de Boulogne. She had to be back home by eleven, and she walked the whole way very quickly, coming in all aglow from the run, for it was a long stretch from Passy to the Quai du Bourbon. During four winter months, from October to February, she came in this fashion, now in drenching rain, now among the mists from the Seine, now in the pale sunlight that threw a little warmth over the keys. Indeed, after the first month, she at times arrived unexpectedly, taking advantage of some errand in town to look in, and then she could only stay for a couple of minutes. They had barely had time enough to say, How do you do? when she was already scampering down the stairs again, exclaiming, Goodbye! And now Claude learned to know Christine. With his everlasting mistrust of woman, a suspicion had remained to him. 
the suspicion of some love adventure in the provinces. But the girl's soft eyes and bright laughter had carried all before them. He felt that she was as innocent as a big child. As soon as she arrived, quite unembarrassed, feeling fully at her ease as with a friend, she began to indulge in a ceaseless flow of chatter. She had told him a score of times about her childhood at Claremont, and she constantly reverted to it. On the evening that her father, Captain Hallegrain, had suddenly died, she and her mother had been to church. She perfectly remembered their return home, and the horrible night that had followed. The captain, very stout and muscular, lying stretched on a mattress, with his lower jaw protruding to such a degree that in her girlish memory she could not picture him otherwise. She also had that same jaw, and when her mother had not known how to master her, she had often cried, "'Oh, you punch! You'll eat your heart's blood out like your father!' Poor mother! How she, Christine, had worried her with her love of horseplay, with her mad, turbulent fits! As far back as she could remember, she pictured her mother, ever seated at the same window, quietly painting fans, a slim little woman with very soft eyes, the only thing she had inherited of her. When people wanted to please her mother, they told her, she has got your eyes. And then she smiled, happy in the thought of having contributed at least that touch of sweetness to her daughter's features. After the death of her husband, she had worked so late as to endanger her eyesight. But how else could she have lived? Her widow's pension, five hundred francs per annum, barely sufficed for the needs of her child. For five years Christine had seen her mother grow thinner and paler, wasting away a little bit each day, until she became a mere shadow. And now she felt remorseful at not having been more obedient, at having driven her mother to despair by lack of application. She had begun each week with magnificent intentions, promising that she would soon help her to earn money. But her arms and legs got the fidgets in spite of her efforts. The moment she became quiet, she fell ill. Then one morning her mother had been unable to get up, and had died, her voice too weak to make itself heard, her eyes full of big tears. Ever did Christine behold her thus dead, with her weeping eyes wide open and fixed on her. At other times Christine, when questioned by Claude about Claremont, forgot those sorrows to recall more cheerful memories. She laughed gaily at the idea of their encampment, as she called it, in the Rue de l'Eclache. She born in Strasbourg, her father a Gascon, her mother a Parisian, and all three thrown into that nook of Auvergne, which they detested. The Rue de l'Eclache, sloping down to the botanical gardens, was narrow and dank, gloomy like a vault. Not a shop, never a passer-by, nothing but melancholy frontages with shutters always closed at the back however their windows overlooking some courtyards were turned to the full sunlight the dining-room opened even on to a spacious balcony a kind of wooden gallery whose arcades were hung with a giant wisteria which almost smothered them with foliage and the girl had grown up there at first near her invalid father then cloistered as it were with her mother whom the least exertion exhausted. She had remained so complete a stranger to the town and its neighbourhood that Claude and herself burst into laughter when she met his inquiries with the constant answer, I don't know. The mountains? Yes, there were mountains on one side. They could be seen at the end of the streets. While on the other side of town, after passing along other streets, there were flat fields stretching far away. But she never went there. The distance was too great. The only height she remembered was the Pied de Dôme, rounded off at the summit like a hump. In the town itself she could have found her way to the cathedral blindfold. One had to turn round by the Place de Jode and take the Rue des Gras. But more than that she could not tell him. The rest of the town was an entanglement, a maze of sloping lanes and boulevards, a town of black lava ever dipping downward, where the rain of the thunderstorms swept by torrentially amidst formidable flashes of lightning. Oh, those storms! She still shuddered to think of them. 
Just opposite her room, above the roofs, the lightning conductor of the museum was always on fire. In the sitting-room she had her own window, a deep recess as big as a room itself, where her work-table and personal knick-knacks stood. It was there that her mother had taught her to read. It was there that, later on, she had fallen asleep while listening to her masters, so greatly did the fatigue of learning daze her. And now she made fun of her own ignorance. She was a well-educated lady, and no mistake, unable even to repeat the names of the kings of France, with the dates of their accessions. A famous musician, too, who had never got further than that elementary pianoforte exercise, the little boats. A prodigy in watercolour painting, who scamped her trees because foliage was too difficult to imitate. Then she skipped, without any transition, to the fifteen months she had spent at the convent of the visitation, after her mother's death, a large convent outside the town, with magnificent gardens. There was no end to her stories about the good sisters, their jealousies, their foolish doings, their simplicity that made one start. She was to have taken the veil, but she felt stifled the moment she entered a church. It had seemed to be all over with her when the superior, by whom she was treated with great affection, diverted her from the cloister by procuring her that situation at Madame Van Zad's. She had not yet got over the surprise. How had Mother de Saint-Ange been able to read her mind so clearly? For, in fact, since she had been living in Paris, she had dropped into complete indifference about religion. When all the reminiscences of Claremont were exhausted, Claude wanted to hear about her life at Madame Van Zad's, and each week she gave him fresh particulars. The life led in the little house at Passy, silent and shut off from the outer world, was a very regular one, with no more noise about it than the faint tick-tack of an old-fashioned timepiece. Two antiquated domestics, a cook and a manservant, who had been with the family for forty years, alone glided in their slippers across the deserted rooms, like a couple of ghosts. Now and then, at very long intervals, there came a visitor, some octogenarian general, so desiccated, so slight of build, that he scarcely pressed on the carpet. The house was also the home of shadows. The sun filtered with the mere gleam of a nightlight through the Venetian blinds. Since Madame had become paralyzed in the knees and stone-blind, so that she no longer left her room, she had had no other recreation than that of listening to the reading of religious books. Ah, those endless readings! How they weighed upon the girl at times! If she had only known a trade, how gladly she would have cut out dresses, concocted bonnets, or goffered the petals of artificial flowers! And to think that she was capable of nothing— when she had been taught everything, and that there was only enough stuff in her to make a salaried drudge, a semi-domestic. She suffered horribly, too, in that stiff, lonely dwelling which smelt of the tomb. She was seized more and more with the vertigo of her childhood, as when she had striven to compel herself to work in order to please her mother. Her blood rebelled. She would have liked to shout and jump about in her desire for life, but Madame treated her so gently, sending her away from her room and ordering her to take long walks, that she felt full of remorse when, on her return to the Quai de Bourbon, she was obliged to tell a falsehood, to talk of the Bois de Boulogne, or invent some ceremony at church where she now never set foot. Madame seemed to take to her more and more every day. There were constant presents, now a silk dress, now a tiny gold watch, even some underlinen. She herself was very fond of Madame Van Zad. She had wept one day when the latter had called her daughter. She had sworn never to leave her, such was her heartfelt pity, at seeing her so old and helpless. Well, said Claude one morning, you'll be rewarded. She'll leave you her money. Christine looked astonished. Do you think so? It is said that she is worth three millions of francs. No, no, I have never dreamt of such a thing, and I won't. What would become of me? Claude had averted his head and hastily replied, Well, you'd become rich, that's all. But no doubt she'll first of all marry you off. On hearing this, Christine could hold out no longer, but burst into laughter. 
to one of her old friends eh perhaps the general who has a silver chin what a good joke so far they had gone no further than chumming like old friends he was almost as new to life as she having had nothing but chance adventures and living in an ideal world of his own fanciful amid romantic amours to see each other in secret like this from pure friendship without anything more tender passing between them than a cordial shake of the hand at her arrival and another one when she left seemed to them quite natural still for her part she scented that he was shy and at times she looked at him fixedly with the wondering perturbation of unconscious passion but as yet nothing ardent or agitating spoilt the pleasure they felt in being together their hands remained cool they spoke cheerfully on all subjects they sometimes argued like friends who feel sure they will not fall out only this friendship grew so keen that they could no longer live without seeing one another the moment christine came claude took the key from outside the door she herself insisted upon this lest somebody might disturb them after a few visits she had taken absolute possession of the studio she seemed to be at home there she was tormented by a desire to make the place a little more tidy for such disorder worried her and made her uncomfortable but it was not an easy matter the painter had strictly forbidden madame joseph to sweep up things lest the dust should get on the fresh paint so on the first occasions when his companion attempted to clean up a bit he watched her with anxious entreating eyes what was the good of changing the place of things didn't it suffice to have them at hand however she exhibited such gay determination she seemed so happy at playing the housewife that he let her have her own way at last and now the moment she had arrived and taken off her gloves she pinned up her dress to avoid soiling it and set the big studio in order in the twinkling of an eye there was no longer a pile of cinders before the stove the screen hid the bedstead and the washstand the couch was brushed the wardrobe polished and the deal table was cleared of the crockery and had not a stain of paint and above the chairs which were symmetrically arranged and the spanned easels propped against the walls the big cuckoo clock with full-blown pink flowers on its dial seemed to tick more sonorously altogether it was magnificent one would not have recognized the place he stupefied watched her trotting to and fro twisting about and singing as she went was this then the lazy bones who had such dreadful headaches at the least bit of work but she laughed at head work yes but exertion with her hands and feet did her good seemed to straighten her like a young sapling she confessed even as she would have confessed some depraved taste her liking for lowly household cares a liking which had greatly worried her mother whose educational ideal consisted of accomplishments and who would have made her a governess with soft hands touching nothing vulgar how christine had been chided indeed whenever she was caught as a little girl sweeping dusting and playing delightedly at being cook even nowadays if she had been able to indulge in a bout with the dust at madame van zad's she would have felt less bored but what would they have said to that she would no longer have been considered a lady and so she came to satisfy her longings at the quai de bourbon panting with the exercise all aglow her eyes glistening with a woman's delight at biting into forbidden fruit claude by this time grew conscious of having a woman's care around him in order to make her sit down and chat quietly he would ask her now and then to sew a torn cuff or coat-tail she herself had offered to look over his linen but it was no longer with the ardour of a housewife eager to be up and doing first of all she hardly knew how to work she held her needle like a girl brought up in contempt of sewing besides the enforced quiescence and the attention that had to be given to such work the small stitches which had to be looked to one by one exasperated her thus the studio was bright with cleanliness like a drawing-room but claude himself remained in rags and they both joked about it thinking it great fun End of chapter 4, part A
Chapter Four, Part B of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. How happy were those months that they spent together, those four months of frost and rain wild away in the studio, where the red-hot stove roared like an organ pipe. The winter seemed to isolate them from the world still more. When the snow covered the adjacent roofs, when the sparrows fluttered against the window, they smiled at feeling warm and cosy, at being lost, as it were, amidst the great silent city. But they did not always confine themselves to that one little nook, for she allowed him at last to see her home. For a long while she had insisted upon going away by herself, feeling ashamed of being seen in the streets on a man's arm. Then one day, when the rain fell all of a sudden, she was obliged to let him come downstairs with an umbrella. The rain having ceased almost immediately, she sent him back when they reached the other side of the Pont Louis-Philippe. They only remained a few moments beside the parapet, looking at the mail and happy at being together in the open air. Down below, large barges moored against the quay, and full of apples were ranged four rows deep, so close together that the planks thrown across them made a continuous path for the women and children running to and fro. They were amused by the sight of all that fruit, those enormous piles littering the banks, the round baskets which were carried hither and thither, while a strong odour, suggestive of cider in fermentation, mingled with the moist gusts from the river. A week later, when the sun again showed itself, and Claude extolled the solitude of the quays round the Ile Saint-Louis, Christine consented to take a walk. They strolled up the Quai de Brabant and the Quai d'Anjou, pausing at every few steps and growing interested in the various scenes of river life, the dredger whose buckets grated against their chains, the floating wash-house which resounded with the hubbub of a quarrel, and the steam-cranes busy unloading the lighters. She did not cease to wonder at one thought which came to her. Was it possible that yonder Quai des Ormes, so full of life across the stream, that this Quai Henri IV, with its broad embankment and lower shore, where bands of children and dogs rolled over in the sand, that this panorama of an active, densely populated capital was the same accursed scene that had appeared to her for a moment in a gory flash on the night of her arrival? They went round the point of the island, strolling more leisurely still, to enjoy the solitude and tranquillity which the old historic mansions seemed to have implanted there. They watched the water seething between the wooden piles of the estacade, and returned by way of the Quai de Béthune and the Quai d'Orléans, instinctively drawn closer to each other by the widening of the stream, keeping elbow to elbow at sight of the vast flow, with their eyes fixed on the distant Halle aux Vins and the Jardin des Plantes. In the pale sky, the cupolas of the public buildings assumed a bluish hue. When they reached the Pont Saint-Louis, Claude had to point out Notre-Dame by name, for Christine did not recognize the edifice from the rear, where it looked like a colossal creature crouching down between its flying buttresses, which suggested sprawling paws, while above its long leviathan spine its towers rose like a double head. Their real find that day, however, was at the western point of the island, that point like the prow of a ship always riding at anchor, afloat between two swift currents, in sight of Paris, but ever unable to get into port. They went down some very steep steps there, and discovered a solitary bank planted with lofty trees. It was a charming refuge, a hermitage in the midst of a crowd. Paris was rumbling all around them, on the quays, on the bridges, while they, at the water's edge, tasted the delight of being alone, ignored by the whole world. From that day forth, that bank became a little rustic coin of theirs, a favourite open-air resort where they took advantage of the sunny hours, when the great heat of the studio, where the red-hot stove kept roaring, oppressed them too much, filling their hands with a fever of which they were afraid. Nevertheless, Christine had so far objected to be accompanied farther than the mail. At the Quai des Ormes, 
she always bade Claude go back, as if Paris, with her crowds and possible encounters, began at the long stretch of quays which she had to traverse on her way home. But Passy was so far off, and she felt so dull at having to go such a distance alone, that gradually she gave way. She began by allowing Claude to see her as far as the Hôtel de Ville, then as far as the Pont Neuf, at last as far as the Tuileries. She forgot the danger. They walked arm in arm like a young married couple, and that constantly repeated promenade, that leisurely journey over the self-same ground by the riverside, acquired an infinite charm, full of a happiness such as could scarcely be surpassed in after-times. They truly belonged to each other, though they had not erred. It seemed as if the very soul of the great city, rising from the river, wrapped them around with all the love that had throbbed behind the grey stone walls through the long lapse of ages. Since the nipping colds of December, Christine only came in the afternoon, and it was about four o'clock when the sun was sinking that Claude escorted her back on his arm. On days when the sky was clear, they could see the long line of quays stretching away into space directly they had crossed the Pont Louis-Philippe. From one end to the other, the slanting sun powdered the houses on the right bank with golden dust, while on the left, the islets, the buildings, stood out in a black line against the blazing glory of the sunset. Between the somber and the brilliant margin, the spangled river sparkled, cut in twain every now and then by the long bars of its bridges, the five arches of the Pont Notre-Dame showing under the single span of the Pont d'Arcol, then the Pont au Change and the Pont Neuf, beyond each of whose shadows appeared a luminous patch, a sheet of bluish satiny water, growing paler here and there with a mirror-like reflection. And while the dusky outlines on the left terminated in the silhouettes of the pointed towers of the Palais de Justice, sharply and darkly defined against the sky, a gentle curve undulated on the right, stretching away so far that the Pavillon de Flore, who stood forth like a citadel at the curve's extreme end, seemed a fairy castle, bluey, dreamlike and vague, amidst the rosy mist on the horizon. But Claude and Christine, with the sunlight streaming on them, athwart the leafless plane trees, turned away from the dazzlement, preferring to gaze at certain spots, one above all, a block of old houses just above the mail. Below there was a series of one-storied tenements, little huckster and fishing-tackle shops, with flat terrace roofs, ornamented with laurel and Virginia creeper, and in the rear rose loftier but decrepit dwellings, with linen hung out to dry at their windows, a collection of fantastic structures, a confused mass of woodwork and masonry, overtoppling walls and hanging gardens, in which coloured glass balls shone out like stars. They walked on, leaving behind them the big barracks and the Hôtel de Ville, and feeling much more interest in the Cité, which appeared across the river, pent between lofty, smooth embankments rising from the water. Above the darkened houses rose the towers of Notre Dame, as resplendent as if they had been newly gilt, then the second-hand bookstalls began to invade the quays. Down below a lighter full of charcoal struggled against the strong current, beneath an arch of the Pont Notre-Dame. And then, on the days when the flower market was held, they stopped, despite the inclement weather, to inhale the scent of the first violets and the early gilly-flowers. On their left a long stretch of bank now became visible, Beyond the pepper-caster turrets of the Palais de Justice, the small murky tenements of the Quai d'Horloge showed as far as the clump of trees midway across the Pont Neuf. Then, as they went farther on, other quays emerged from the mist. In the far distance, the Quai Voltaire, the Quai Malaquais, the Dome of the Institute of France, the square pile of the Mint, a long grey line of frontages of which they could not even distinguish the windows, a promontory of roofs, which, with their stacks of chimney-pots, looked like some rugged cliff dipping down into a phosphorescent sea. 
In front, however, the pavilion de flore lost its dreamy aspect and became solidified in the final sun blaze. Then, right and left, on either bank of the river, came the long vistas of the Boulevard de Sebastopol and the Boulevard du Palais, the handsome new buildings of the Quai de la Mégisserie, with the new prefecture of police across the water, and the old Pont Neuf, with its statue of Henri IV, looking like a splash of ink. The Louvre, the Tuileries, followed, and beyond Grenelle there was a far-stretching panorama of the slopes of Sèvres, the country steeped in a stream of sun-rays. Claude never went farther. Christine always made him stop just before they reached the Pont Royal, near the fine trees beside Vigier's swimming baths. And when they turned round to shake hands once more in the golden sunset, now flushing into crimson, they looked back, and on the horizon espied the Ile Saint-Louis, whence they had come, the indistinct distance of the city upon which night was already descending from the slate-hued eastern sky. Ah, oh, what splendid sunsets they beheld during those weekly strolls! The sun accompanied them, as it were, amid the throbbing gaiety of the quays, the river life, the dancing ripples of the currents amid the attractions of the shops as warm as conservatories the flowers sold by the seed merchants and the noisy cages of bird fanciers amid all the din of sound and wealth of colour which ever make a city's waterside its youthful part as they proceeded the ardent blaze of the western sky turned to purple on their left above the dark line of houses and the orb of day seemed to wait for them falling gradually lower slowly rolling towards the distant roofs when once they had passed the pont notre dame in front of the widening stream in no ancient forest on no mountain road Beyond no grassy plain will there ever be such triumphal sunsets as behind the cupola of the Institute. It is there one sees Paris retiring to rest in all her glory. At each of their walks the aspect of the conflagration changed. Fresh furnaces added their glow to the crown of flames. One evening, when a shower had surprised them, the sun, showing behind the downpour, lit up the whole rain-cloud, and upon their heads there fell a spray of glowing water, irisated with pink and azure. On the days when the sky was clear, however, the sun, like a fiery ball, descended majestically in an unruffled sapphire lake. For a moment the black cupola of the Institute seemed to cut away part of it, and make it look like the waning moon. Then the globe assumed a violet tinge, and at last became submerged in the lake, which had turned blood-red. Already, in February, the planet described a wider curve, and fell straight into the Seine, which seemed to seethe on the horizon as at the contact of red-hot iron. However, the grander scenes, the vast fairy pictures of space, only blazed on cloudy evenings. Then, according to the whim of the wind, there were seas of sulphur splashing against coral reefs. There were palaces and towers, marvels of architecture, piled upon one another, burning and crumbling, and throwing torrents of lava from their many gaps. Or else the orb, which had disappeared hidden by a veil of clouds, suddenly transpierced that veil with such a press of light that shafts of sparks shot forth from one horizon to the other, showing as plainly as a volley of golden arrows. And then the twilight fell, and they said good-bye to each other, while their eyes were still full of the final dazzlement. They felt that triumphal Paris was the accomplice of the joy which they could not exhaust, the joy of ever resuming together that walk beside the old stone parapets. One day, however, there happened what Claude had always secretly feared. Christine no longer seemed to believe in the possibility of meeting anybody who knew her. In fact, was there such a person? She would always pass along like this, remaining altogether unknown. He, however, 
thought of his own friends, and at times felt a kind of tremor when he fancied he recognized in the distance the back of some acquaintance. He was troubled by a feeling of delicacy, the idea that somebody might stare at the girl, approach them, and perhaps begin to joke, gave him intolerable worry. And that very evening, as she was close beside him on his arm, and they were approaching the Pont des Arts, he fell upon Sandoz and Dubouche, who were coming down the steps of the bridge. It was impossible to avoid them. They were almost face to face. Besides, his friends must have seen him, for they smiled. Claude, very pale, kept advancing, and he thought it all up on seeing Dubouche take a step towards him. But Sandoz was already holding the architect back and leading him away. They passed on with an indifferent air and disappeared into the courtyard of the Louvre, without as much as turning round. They had both just recognized the original of the crayon sketch, which the painter hid away with all the jealousy of a lover. Christine, who was chattering, had noticed nothing. Claude, with his heart throbbing, answered her in monosyllables, moved to tears, brimming over with gratitude to his old chums for their discreet behaviour. A few days later, however, he had another shock. He did not expect Christine, and had therefore made an appointment with Sandoz. Then, as she had run up to spend an hour, it was one of those surprises that delighted them. They had just withdrawn the key as usual, when there came a familiar knock with the fist on the door. Claude at once recognised the rap, and felt so upset at the mishap that he overturned a chair. After that it was impossible to pretend to be out. But Christine turned so pale, and implored him with such a wild gesture, that he remained rooted to the spot, holding his breath. The knocks continued, and a voice called, Claude! Claude! He still remained quite still, debating with himself, however, with ashen lips and downcast eyes. Deep silence reigned, and then footsteps were heard, making the stairs creak as they went down. Claude's breast heaved with intense sadness. He felt it bursting with remorse at the sound of each retreating step, as if he had denied the friendship of his whole youth. However, one afternoon there came another knock and Claude had only just time to whisper despairingly, "'The key has been left in the door.' In fact, Christine had forgotten to take it out. She became quite scared, and darted behind the screen, with her handkerchief over her mouth, to stifle the sound of her breathing. The knocks became louder, there was a burst of laughter, and the painter had to reply, "'Come in!' He felt more uncomfortable still when he saw Jory, who gallantly ushered in Irma Bécot, whose acquaintance he had made through Fagerolles, and who was flinging her youth about the Paris studios. "'She insisted upon seeing your studio, so I brought her,' explained the journalist. The girl, however, without waiting, was already walking about and making remarks, with perfect freedom of manner. Oh, how funny it is here, and what funny painting! Come, there's a good fellow, show me everything. I want to see everything. Claude, apprehensively anxious, was afraid that she might push the screen aside. He pictured Christine behind it, and felt distracted already at what she might hear. You know what she has come to ask you, resumed Jory cheerfully. What, don't you remember? You promised that she might pose for something, and she'll do so if you like. Of course I will, said Irma. The fact is, replied Claude, in an embarrassed tone, my picture here will take up all my time till the salon. I have a figure in it that gives me a deal of trouble. It's impossible to perfect it with those confounded models. Irma had stationed herself in front of the picture, and looked at it with a knowing air. "'Oh, I see,' she said. "'That woman in the grass, eh? "'Do you think I could be of any use to you?' "'Jory flared up in a moment, "'warmly approving the idea. "'But Claude, with the greatest energy, replied, "'No, no, Madame wouldn't suit. "'She's not at all what I want for this picture, "'not at all.' "'Then he went on stammering excuses. "'He would be only too pleased later on. 
but just now he was afraid that another model would quite complete his confusion over that picture and irma responded by shrugging her shoulders and looking at him with an air of smiling contempt jory however now began to chat about their friends why had not claude come to sandoz's on the previous thursday one never saw him now dubouche asserted all sorts of things about him there had been a row between fagerolles and mahoudeau on the subject whether evening dress was a thing to be reproduced in sculpture then on the previous sunday gagnière had returned home from a wagner concert with a black eye he jory had nearly had a duel at the cafe baudequin on account of one of his last articles in the drummer the fact was he was giving it hot to the twopenny halfpenny painters the men with the usurped reputations the campaign against the hanging committee of the salon was making a deuce of a row not a shred would be left of those guardians of the ideal who wanted to prevent nature from entering their show claude listened to him with impatient irritation he had taken up his palette and was shuffling about in front of his picture the other one understood at last you want to work i see all right we'll leave you irma however still stared at the painter with her vague smile astonished at the stupidity of this simpleton who did not seem to appreciate her and seized despite herself with a whim to please him his studio was ugly and he himself wasn't handsome but why should he put on such bugbear airs she chaffed him for a moment and on going off again offered to sit for him emphasizing her offer by warmly pressing his hand whenever you like were her parting words they had gone at last and claude was obliged to pull the screen aside for christine looking very white remained seated behind it as if she lacked the strength to rise she did not say a word about the girl but simply declared that she had felt very frightened and trembling lest there should come another knock she wanted to go at once carrying away with her as her startled looks testified the disturbing thought of many things which she did not mention in fact for a long time that sphere of brutal art that studio full of glaring pictures had caused her a feeling of discomfort wounded in all her feelings full of repugnance she could not get used to it all she had grown up full of affectionate admiration for a very different style of art her mother's fine water-colours those fans of dreamy delicacy in which lilac-tinted couples floated about in bluish gardens and she quite failed to understand claude's work even now she often amused herself by painting tiny girlish landscapes two or three subjects repeated over and over again a lake with a ruin a water-mill beating a stream a chalet and some pine trees white with snow and she felt surprised that an intelligent young fellow should paint in such an unreasonable manner so ugly and so untruthful besides for she not only thought claude's realism monstrously ugly but considered it beyond every permissible truth in fact she thought at times that he must be mad one day claude absolutely insisted upon seeing a small sketch-book which she had brought away from clermont and which she had spoken about after objecting for a long while she brought it with her flattered at heart and feeling very curious to know what he would say he turned over the leaves smiling all the while and as he did not speak she was the first to ask you think it very bad don't you not at all he replied it's innocent the reply hurt her despite claude's indulgent tone which aimed at making it amiable well you see i had so few lessons from mamma i like painting to be well done and pleasing thereupon he burst into frank laughter confess now that my painting makes you feel ill i have noticed it you purse your lips and open your eyes wide with fright certainly it is not the style of painting for ladies least of all for young girls but you'll get used to it it's only a question of educating your eyes and you'll end by seeing that what i am doing is very honest and healthy indeed christine slowly became used to it but at first artistic conviction had nothing to do with the change especially as claude with his contempt for female opinion 
did not take the trouble to indoctrinate her. On the contrary, in her company he avoided conversing about art, as if he wished to retain for himself that passion of his life, apart from the new passion which was gradually taking possession of him. Still Christine glided into the habit of the thing, and became familiarized with it. She began to feel interested in those abominable pictures, on noticing the important place they held in the artist's existence. This was the first stage on the road to conversion. She felt greatly moved by his rageful eagerness to be up and doing, the whole-heartedness with which he devoted himself to his work. Was it not very touching? Was there not something very creditable in it? Then, on noticing his joy or suffering, according to the success or the failure of the day's work, she began to associate herself with his efforts. She felt saddened when she found him sad. She grew cheerful when he received her cheerfully. And from that moment her worry was, had he done a lot of work? Was he satisfied with what he had done since they had last seen each other? At the end of the second month she had been gained over. She stationed herself before his pictures to judge whether they were progressing or not. She no longer felt afraid of them. She still did not approve particularly of that style of painting, but she began to repeat the artistic expressions which she had heard him use, declaring this bit to be vigorous in tone, well built up, or just in the light it should be. He seemed to her so good-natured, and she was so fond of him, that after finding excuses for him for daubing those horrors, she ended by discovering qualities in them in order that she might like them a little also. Nevertheless, there was one picture, the large one, the one intended for the salon, to which for a long time she was quite unable to reconcile herself. She already looked without dislike at the studies made at the Boutin studio and the sketches of Plassans, but she was still irritated by the sight of the woman lying in the grass. It was like a personal grudge, the shame of having momentarily thought that she could detect in it a likeness of herself, and silent embarrassment, too, for that big figure continued to wound her feelings, although she now found less and less of a resemblance in it. At first she had protested by averting her eyes. Now she remained for several minutes looking at it fixedly, in mute contemplation. How was it that the likeness to herself had disappeared? The more vigorously that Claude struggled on, never satisfied, touching up the same bit a hundred times over, the more did that likeness to herself gradually fade away. And, without being able to account for it, without daring to admit as much to herself, she, whom the painting had so greatly offended when she had first seen it, now felt a growing sorrow at noticing that nothing of herself remained. Indeed, it seemed to her as if their friendship suffered from this obliteration. She felt herself further away from him as trait after trait vanished. Didn't he care for her, that he thus allowed her to be effaced from his work? And who was the new woman? Whose was the unknown, indistinct face that appeared from beneath hers? Claude, in despair at having spoilt the figure's head, did not know exactly how to ask her for a few hours sitting. She would merely have had to sit down, and he would only have taken some hints, but he had previously seen her so pained that he felt afraid of irritating her again. Moreover, after resolving in his own mind to ask her this favour in a gay, off-hand way, he had been at a loss for words, feeling all at once ashamed at the notion. One afternoon he quite upset her by one of those bursts of anger which he found it impossible to control, even in her presence. Everything had gone wrong that week. He talked of scraping his canvas again, and he paced up and down beside himself and kicking the furniture about. Then all of a sudden he caught her by the shoulders and made her sit down on the couch. "'I beg of you, do me this favour, or it'll kill me, I swear it will.' She did not understand him. What? What is it you want? Then, as soon as she saw him take up his brushes, she added, without heeding what she said, Oh, yes, 
Why did not you ask me before? And of her own accord she threw herself back on a cushion and slipped her arm under her neck. But surprise and confusion at having yielded so quickly made her grave, for she did not know that she was prepared for this kind of thing. Indeed, she could have sworn that she would never serve him as a model again. Her compliance already filled her with remorse, as if she were lending herself to something wrong by letting him impart her own countenance to that big creature lying refulgent under the sun. However, in two sittings, Claude worked in the head all right. He exulted with delight and exclaimed that it was the best bit of painting he had ever done. And he was right. Never had he thrown such a play of real light over such a lifelike face. Happy at seeing him so pleased, Christine also became gay, going as far as to express approval of her head, which, though not extremely like her, had a wonderful expression. They stood for a long while before the picture, blinking at it, and drawing back as far as the wall. "'And now,' he said at last, "'I'll finish her off with a model. Ah, so I've got her at last!' In a burst of childish glee, he took the girl round the waist, and they performed a triumphant war-dance, as he called it. She laughed very heartily, fond of romping as she was, and no longer feeling aught of her scruples and discomfort. But the very next week Claude became gloomy again. He had chosen Zoe Piedefer as a model, but she did not satisfy him. Christine's delicate head, as he expressed it, did not set well on the other's shoulders. He nevertheless persisted, scratched out, began anew, and worked so hard that he lived in a constant state of fever. Towards the middle of January, seized with despair, he abandoned his picture and turned it against the wall, swearing that he would not finish it. But a fortnight later, he began to work at it again with another model, and then found himself obliged to change the whole tone of it. Thus matters got still worse. So he sent for Zoe again, became altogether at sea, and quite ill with uncertainty and anguish, and the pity of it was that the central figure alone worried him, for he was well satisfied with the rest of the painting, the trees of the background, the two little women and the gentleman in the velvet coat, all finished and vigorous. February was drawing to a close. He had only a few days left to send his picture to the salon. It was quite a disaster. One evening, in Christine's presence, he began swearing, and all at once a cry of fury escaped him. After all, by the thunder of heaven, is it possible to stick one woman's head on another's shoulders? I ought to chop my hand off. From the depth of his heart a single idea now rose to his brain, to obtain her consent to pose for the whole figure. It had slowly sprouted, first as a simple wish, quickly discarded as absurd, then had come a silent, constantly renewed debate with himself, and at last, under the spur of necessity, keen and definite desire. The recollection of the morning after the storm, when she had accepted his hospitality, haunted and tortured him. It was she whom he needed. She alone could enable him to realize his dream, and he beheld her again in all her youthful freshness, beaming and indispensable. If he could not get her to pose, he might as well give up his picture, for no one else would ever satisfy him. At times, while he remained seated for hours, distracted in front of the unfinished canvas, so utterly powerless that he no longer knew where to give a stroke of the brush, he formed heroic resolutions. The moment she came in, he would throw himself at her feet. He would tell her of his distress in such touching words that she would perhaps consent. But as soon as he beheld her, he lost all courage. He averted his eyes, lest she might decipher his thoughts in his instinctive glances. Such a request would be madness. One could not expect such a service from a friend. He would never have the audacity to ask. 
Nevertheless, one evening, as he was getting ready to accompany her, and as she was putting on her bonnet, with her arms uplifted, they remained for a moment, looking into each other's eyes, he quivering, and she suddenly becoming so grave, so pale, that he felt himself detected. All along the quays they scarcely spoke. The matter remained unmentioned between them, while the sun set in the coppery sky. Twice afterwards he again read in her looks that she was aware of his all-absorbing thought. In fact, since he had dreamt about it, she had begun to do the same, in spite of herself, her attention roused by his involuntary illusions. They scarcely affected her at first, though she was obliged at last to notice them. Still the question seemed to her to be beyond the range of possibility, to be one of those unavowable ideas which people do not even speak of. The fear that he would dare to ask her did not even occur to her. She knew him well by now. She could have silenced him with a gesture before he had stammered the first words, and in spite of his sudden bursts of anger. It was simple madness. Never, never. Days went by, and between them that fixed idea grew in intensity. The moment they were together they could not help thinking of it. Not a word was spoken on the subject, but their very silence was eloquent. They no longer made a movement, no longer exchanged a smile without stumbling upon that thought, which they found impossible to put into words, though it filled their minds. Soon nothing but that remained in their fraternal intercourse, and the perturbation of heart and senses which they had so far avoided in the course of their familiar intimacy came at last under the influence of that all-besetting thought. And then the anguish, which they left unmentioned, but which they could not hide from one another, racked and stifled them, left them heaving distressfully with painful sighs. Towards the middle of March, Christine, at one of her visits, found Claude seated before his picture, overcome with sorrow. He had not even heard her enter. He remained motionless, with vacant, haggard eyes, staring at his unfinished work. In another three days the delay for sending in exhibits for the salon would expire. "'Well,' she inquired gently, after standing for a long time behind him, grief-stricken at seeing him in such despair. He started and turned round. "'Well, it's all up. I shan't exhibit anything this year. Ah, I, who relied so much upon this salon!' Both relapsed into despondency, a despondency and agitation full of confused thoughts. Then she resumed, thinking aloud, as it were. There would still be time. Time? Oh, no, indeed. A miracle would be needed. Where am I to find a model so late in the day? Do you know, since this morning I have been worrying, and for a moment I thought I had hit upon an idea. Yes, it would be to go and fetch that girl, that Irma who came while you were here. I know well enough that she is short and not at all such as I thought of and so I should perhaps have to change everything once more. But all the same, it might be possible to make her do. Decidedly, I'll try her. He stopped short. The glowing eyes with which he gazed at her clearly said, Ah, there's you. Ah, it would be the hoped-for miracle, and triumph would be certain. If you were to make this supreme sacrifice for me, I beseech you, I ask you devoutedly as a friend, the dearest, the most beauteous, the most pure. She, erect, looking very pale, seemed to hear each of those words, though all remained unspoken, and his ardently beseeching eyes overcame her. She herself did not speak. She simply did as she was desired, acting almost like one in a dream. Beneath it all there lurked the thought that he must not ask elsewhere, for she was now conscious of her earlier jealous disquietude and wished to share his affections with none. Yet it was in silence and all chastity that she stretched herself on the couch and took up the pose with one arm under her head, her eyes closed. And Claude, startled, 
full of gratitude, he had at last found again the sudden vision that he had so often evoked, but he himself did not speak. He began to paint in the deep solemn silence that had fallen upon them both. For two long hours he stood to his work with such manly energy that he finished right off a superb roughing out of the whole figure. Never before had he felt such enthusiasm in his art. It seemed to him as if he were in the presence of some saint, and at times he wondered at the transfiguration of Christine's face, whose somewhat massive jaws seemed to have receded beneath the gentle placidity which her brow and cheeks displayed. During those two hours she did not stir, she did not speak, but from time to time she opened her clear eyes, fixing them on some vague distant point, and remaining thus for a moment, then closing them again, and relapsing into the lifelessness of fine marble, with the mysterious fixed smile required by the pose. It was by a gesture that Claude apprised her he had finished. He turned away, and when they stood face to face again, she ready to depart, they gazed at one another, overcome by emotion which still prevented them from speaking. Was it sadness, then, unconscious, unnameable sadness? For their eyes filled with tears, as if they had just spoilt their lives and dived to the depths of human misery. Then, moved and grieved, unable to find a word even of thanks, he kissed her religiously upon the brow. End of chapter 4, part B Chapter 5, part A of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. On the 15th of May, a Friday, Claude, who had returned at three o'clock in the morning from Sandoz's, was still asleep at nine when Madame Joseph brought him up a large bouquet of white lilac which a commissionaire had just left downstairs. He understood at once. Christine had wished to be beforehand in celebrating the success of his painting, for this was a great day for him, the opening day of the Salon of the Rejected, which was first instituted that year. Footnote. This was in 1863. Editor. End footnote. And at which his picture, refused by the hanging committee of the official Salon, was to be exhibited. That delicate attention on Christine's part, that fresh and fragrant lilac, affected him greatly, as if presaging a happy day. Still in his nightshirt, with his feet bare, he placed the flowers in his water-jug on the table. Then, with his eyes still swollen with sleep, almost bewildered, he dressed, scolding himself the while for having slept so long. On the previous night, he had promised Dubouche and Sandoz to call for them at the latter's place at eight o'clock, in order that they might all three go together to the Palais de l'Industrie, where they would find the rest of the band, and he was already an hour behind time. Then, as luck would have it, he could not lay his hands upon anything in his studio, which had been turned topsy-turvy since the despatch of the big picture. For more than five minutes he hunted on his knees for his shoes among a quantity of old chases. Some particles of gold leaf flew about, for, not knowing where to get the money for a proper frame, he had employed a joiner of the neighbourhood to fit four strips of board together, and had gilded them himself, with the assistance of his friend Christine, who, by the way, had proved a very unskilful gilder. At last, dressed and shod, and having his soft felt hat bespangled with yellow sparks of the gold, he was about to go, when a superstitious thought brought him back to the nosegay, which had remained alone on the centre of the table. If he did not kiss the lilac, he was sure to suffer an affront. So he kissed it, and felt perfumed by its strong springtide aroma. Under the archway he gave his key as usual to the doorkeeper. "'Madame Joseph,' he said, "'I shall not be home all day.' In less than twenty minutes he was in the Rue d'Enfer at Sandoz's, but the latter, whom he feared would have already gone, 
was equally late in consequence of a sudden indisposition which had come upon his mother. It was nothing serious. She had merely passed a bad night, but it had for a while quite upset him with anxiety. Now easy in mind again, Sandoz told Claude that Dubouche had written saying that they were not to wait for him, and giving an appointment at the Palais. They therefore started off, and as it was nearly eleven, they decided to lunch in a deserted little crèmerie in the Rue Saint-Honoré, which they did very leisurely, seized with laziness amidst all their ardent desire to see and know, and enjoying, as it were, a kind of sweet, tender sadness from lingering a while and recalling memories of their youth. One o'clock was striking when they crossed the Champs-Élysées. It was a lovely day with a limpid sky, to which the breeze, still somewhat chilly, seemed to impart a brighter azure. Beneath the sun, of the hue of ripe corn, the rows of chestnut trees showed new foliage of a delicate and seemingly freshly varnished green, and the fountains with their leaping sheafs of water, the well-kept lawns, the deep vistas of the pathways, and the broad open spaces all lent an air of luxurious grandeur to the panorama. A few carriages, very few at that early hour, were ascending the avenue, while a stream of bewildered, bustling people, suggesting a swarm of ants, plunged into the huge archway of the Palais de l'Industrie. When they were inside, Claude shivered slightly while crossing the gigantic vestibule, which was as cold as a cellar, with a damp pavement which resounded beneath one's feet like the flagstones of a church. He glanced right and left at the two monumental stairways, and asked contemptuously, "'I say, are we going through their dirty salon?' "'Oh, no, dash it,' answered Sandoz. "'Let's cut through the garden.' The western staircase over there leads to the rejected. Then they passed disdainfully between the two little tables of the catalogue vendors. Between the huge red velvet curtains and beyond a shady porch appeared the garden roofed in with glass. At that time of day it was almost deserted. There were only some people at the buffet under the clock, a throng of people lunching. The crowd was in the galleries on the first floor and the white statues alone edged the yellow-sanded pathways, which, with stretches of crude colour, intersected the green lawns. There was a whole nation of motionless marble there steeped in the diffuse light, falling from the glazed roof on high. Looking southwards, some holland screens barred half of the nave, which showed ambery in the sunlight, and was speckled at both ends by the dazzling blue and crimson of stained-glass windows. Just a few visitors, tired already, occupied the brand-new chairs and seats, shiny with fresh paint, while the flights of sparrows who dwelt above, among the iron girders, swooped down, quite at home, raking up the sand and twittering as they pursued each other. Claude and Sandoz made a show of walking very quickly, without giving a glance around them. A stiff classical bronze statue, a Minerva by a member of the Institute, had exasperated them at the very door, but as they hastened past a seemingly endless line of busts, they recognized Bongrand, who, all alone, was going slowly round a colossal, overflowing, recumbent figure, which had been placed in the middle of the path. With his hands behind his back, quite absorbed, he bent his wrinkled face every now and then over the plaster. "'Hallo, it's you?' he said as they held out their hands to him. I was just looking at our friend Maudot's figure, which they have at least had the intelligence to admit, and to put in a good position. Then, breaking off, Have you been upstairs? he asked. No, we have just come in, said Claude. Thereupon, Bongrand began to talk warmly about the Salon of the Rejected. He, who belonged to the Institute, but who lived apart from his colleagues, made very merry over the affair, the everlasting discontent of the painters, the campaign conducted by petty newspapers like The Drummer, the protestations, the constant complaints that had at last disturbed the Emperor, and the artistic coup d'etat carried out by that silent dreamer, for this Salon of the Rejected was entirely his work. 
Then the great painter alluded to all the hubbub caused by the flinging of such a paving stone into the frog's pond, the official art world. No, he continued, you can have no idea of the rage and indignation among the members of the hanging committee, and remember I'm distrusted, they generally keep quiet when I'm there. But they are all furious with the realists. It was to them that they systematically closed the doors of the temple. It is on account of them that the emperor has allowed the public to revise their verdict. And finally, it is they, the realists, who triumph. Ah, I hear some nice things said. I wouldn't give a high price for your skins, youngsters. He laughed his big joyous laugh, stretching out his arms the while, as if to embrace all the youthfulness that he divined rising around him. "'Your disciples are growing,' said Claude, simply. But Bongrand, becoming embarrassed, silenced him with a wave of his hand. He himself had not sent anything for exhibition, and the prodigious mass of work amidst which he found himself, those pictures, those statues, all those proofs of creative effort, filled him with regret. It was not jealousy, for there lived not a more upright and better soul, but as a result of self-examination, a gnawing fear of impotence, an unavowed dread haunted him. "'And at the rejected?' asked Sandoz. "'How goes it there?' "'Superb. You'll see.' Then, turning towards Claude and keeping both the young man's hands in his own, "'You, my good fellow, you are a trump. Listen, they say I am clever. Well, I'd give ten years of my life to have painted that big hussy of yours. Praise like that, coming from such lips, moved the young painter to tears. Victory had come at last, then. He failed to find a word of thanks, and abruptly changed the conversation, wishing to hide his emotion. That good fellow, Maudot, he said, why, his figure's capital. He has a deuced fine temperament, hasn't he? Sandoz and Claude had begun to walk round the plaster figure. Bongrand replied with a smile. Yes, yes, there's too much fullness and massiveness in parts, but just look at the articulations. They are delicate and really pretty. Come, good-bye, I must leave you. I'm going to sit down a while. My legs are bending under me. Claude had raised his head to listen. A tremendous uproar, an incessant crashing that had not struck him at first, careered through the air. It was like the din of a tempest beating against a cliff, the rumbling of an untiring assault, dashing forward from endless space. "'Hullo, what's that?' he muttered. "'That,' said Bongrand as he walked away, "'that's the crowd upstairs in the galleries.' and the two young fellows, having crossed the garden, then went up to the salon of the rejected. It had been installed in first-rate style. The officially received pictures were not lodged more sumptuously. Lofty hangings of old tapestry at the doors. The lines set off with green bays, seats of crimson velvet, white linen screens under the large skylights of the roof, and all along the suite of galleries the first impression was the same. There were the same gilt frames, the same bright colours on the canvases. But there was a special kind of cheerfulness, a sparkleness of youth, which one did not altogether realise at first. The crowd, already compact, increased every minute, for the official salon was being deserted. People came stung by curiosity, impelled by a desire to judge the judges, and above all, full of the conviction that they were going to see some very diverting things. It was very hot, a fine dust arose from the flooring, and certainly towards four o'clock people would stifle there. "'Hang it!' said Sandoz, trying to elbow his way. "'It will be no easy job to move about and find your picture.' A burst of fraternal feverishness made him eager to get to it. That day he only lived for the work and glory of his old chum. "'Don't worry,' exclaimed Claude. "'We shall get to it all right. My picture won't fly off.' And he affected to be in no hurry, in spite of the almost irresistible desire that he felt to run. 
he raised his head and looked around him, and soon, amidst the loud voices of the crowd that had bewildered him, he distinguished some restrained laughter, which was almost drowned by the tramp of feet and the hubbub of conversation. Before certain pictures the public stood joking. This made him feel uneasy, for despite all his revolutionary brutality, he was as sensitive and as credulous as a woman, and always looked forward to martyrdom, though he was ever grieved and stupefied at being repulsed and railed at. "'They seem gay here,' he muttered. "'Well, there's good reason,' remarked Sandoz. "'Just look at those extravagant jades.' At the same moment, while still lingering in the first gallery, Fagerolles ran up against them without seeing them. He started, being no doubt annoyed by the meeting. However, he recovered his composure immediately, and behaved very amiably. "'Allo, I was just thinking of you. I've been here for the last hour.' "'Where have they put Claude's picture?' asked Sandoz. Fagerolles, who had just remained for twenty minutes in front of that picture, studying it and studying the impression which it produced on the public, answered without wincing, "'I don't know. I haven't been able to find it. We'll look for it together, if you like.' And he joined them. Terrible wag as he was, he no longer affected low-bred manners to the same degree as formerly. He already began to dress well, and although with his mocking nature he was still disposed to snap at everybody as of old, he pursed his lips into the serious expression of a fellow who wants to make his way in the world. With an air of conviction, he added, "'I must see that I now regret not having sent anything this year. I should be here with all the rest of you, and have my share of success. And there are really some astonishing things, my boys. Those horses, for instance.' He pointed to a huge canvas in front of them, before which the crowd was gathering and laughing. It was, so people said, the work of an erstwhile veterinary surgeon, and showed a number of life-size horses in a meadow, fantastic horses, blue, violet, and pink, whose astonishing anatomy transpierced their sides. "'I say, don't you humbug us!' exclaimed Claude, suspiciously. But Fagerolle pretended to be enthusiastic. "'What do you mean? The picture's full of talent!' The fellow who painted it understands horses devilish well. No doubt he paints like a brute, but what's the odds if he's original and contributes a document? As he spoke, Fagerolles' delicate girlish face remained perfectly grave, and it was impossible to tell whether he was joking. There was but the slightest yellow twinkle of spitefulness in the depths of his grey eyes, and he finished with a sarcastic allusion, the drift of which was as yet patent to him alone. "'Ah, well, if you let yourself be influenced by the fools who laugh, you'll have enough to do by and by.' The three friends had gone on again, only advancing, however, with infinite difficulty amid that sea of surging shoulders. On entering the second gallery they gave a glance round the walls, but the picture they sought was not there. In lieu thereof they perceived Irma Beco on the arm of Gagnier, both of them pressed against a handrail he busy examining a small canvas, while she, delighted at being hustled about, raised her pink little mug and laughed at the crowd. Allo, said Sandoz, surprised. Here she is with Gagnier now. Oh, just a fancy of hers, exclaimed Fagerolles quietly. She has a very swell place now. Yes, it was given her by that young idiot of a marquis, whom the papers are always talking about. She's a girl who'll make her way, I've always said so. But she seems to retain a weakness for painters, and every now and then drops into the Café Baudequin to look up old friends. Irma had now seen them, and was making gestures from afar. They could but go to her, when Gagnier, with his light hair and little beardless face, turned round, looking more grotesque than ever. He did not show the least surprise at finding them there. "'It's wonderful,' he muttered. "'What's wonderful?' asked Fagerolles. "'This little masterpiece, and withal honest and naïf, and full of conviction.' He pointed to a tiny canvas before which he had stood absorbed, an absolutely childish picture, such as an urchin of four might have painted, a little cottage at the edge of a little road, with a little tree beside it, the whole out of drawing, and girt round with black lines, 
not even a corkscrew imitation of smoke issuing from the roof was forgotten. Claude made a nervous gesture, while Fagerol repeated phlegmatically, "'Very delicate, very delicate. But your picture, Gagnière, where is it?' "'My picture, it is there.' In fact, the picture he had sent happened to be very near the little masterpiece. It was a landscape of a pearly grey, a bit of the Seine banks, painted carefully, pretty in tone, though somewhat heavy, and perfectly ponderated without a sign of any revolutionary splash. "'To think that they were idiotic enough to refuse that,' said Claude, who had approached with an air of interest. "'But why, I ask you, why?' "'Because it's realistic,' said Fagerolles, in so sharp a voice that one could not tell whether he was jibing at the jury or at the picture. Meanwhile, Irma, of whom no one took any notice, was looking fixedly at Claude, with the unconscious smile which the savage loutishness of that big fellow always brought to her lips. To think that he had not even cared to see her again. She found him so much altered since the last time she had seen him, so funny, and not at all prepossessing, with his hair standing on end, and his face wan and sallow, as if he had had a severe fever. Pained that he did not seem to notice her, she wanted to attract his attention, and touched his arm with a familiar gesture. "'I say, isn't that one of your friends over there looking for you?' It was Dubouche, whom she knew from having seen him on one occasion at the Café Baudequin. He was with difficulty elbowing his way through the crowd, and staring vaguely at the sea of heads around him. But all at once, when Claude was trying to attract his notice by dint of gesticulations, the other turned his back to bow very low to a party of three. The father short and fat, with a sanguine face, the mother very thin of the colour of wax, and devoured by anemia, and the daughter so physically backward at eighteen, that she retained all the lank scragginess of childhood. "'All right,' muttered the painter. "'There he's caught now. What ugly acquaintances the brute has! Where can he have fished up such horrors?' Gagnière quietly replied that he knew the strangers by sight. Monsieur Marguelin was a great masonry contractor, already a millionaire five or six times over, and was making his fortune out of the great public works of Paris, running up whole boulevards on his own account. No doubt Dubouche had become acquainted with him through one of the architects he worked for. However, Sandoz, compassionating the scragginess of the girl, whom he kept watching, judged her in one sentence. Ah, the poor little flayed kitten! One feels sorry for her. Let them alone, exclaimed Claude ferociously. They have all the crimes of the middle classes stamped on their faces. They reek of scrofula and idiocy. It serves them right. But hallo, our runaway friend is making off with them. What grovellers architects are. Good riddance. He'll have to look for us when he wants us. Dubouche, who had not seen his friends, had just offered his arm to the mother and was going off, explaining the pictures with gestures typical of exaggerated politeness. Well, let's proceed then, said Fagerolles and addressing Gagnière, he asked, "'Do you know where they have put Claude's picture?' "'I? No, I was looking for it. I am going with you.' He accompanied them, forgetting Irma Beco against the line. It was she who had wanted to visit the salon on his arm, and he was so little used to promenading a woman about that he had constantly lost her on the way, and was each time stupefied to find her again beside him, no longer knowing how or why they were thus together. She ran after them and took his arm once more in order to follow Claude, who was already passing into another gallery with Fagerol and Sandoz. Then the five roamed about in Indian file with their noses in the air, now separated by a sudden crush, now reunited by another, and ever carried along by the stream. An abomination of Shane's, a Christ pardoning the woman taken in adultery made them pause. It was a group of dry figures that looked as if cut out of wood, very bony of build and seemingly painted with mud. But close by they admired a very fine study of a woman, seen from behind, with her head turned sideways. The whole show was a mixture of the best and the worst. All styles were mingled together. 
the drivelers of the historical school elbowed the young lunatics of realism. The pure simpletons were lumped together with those who bragged about their originality. A dead Jezebel, that seemed to have rotted in the cellars of the School of Arts, was exhibited near a lady in white, the very curious conception of a future great artist. Footnote. Edouard Manet. Editor. End footnote. Then a huge shepherd looking at the sea, a weak production, faced a little painting of some Spaniards playing at rackets, a dash of light of splendid intensity. Nothing execrable was wanting, neither military scenes full of little leaden soldiers, nor wan antiquity, nor the Middle Ages, smeared as it were with bitumen. But from amidst the incoherent ensemble, and especially from the landscapes, all of which were painted in a sincere, correct key, and also from the portraits, most of which were very interesting in respect to workmanship, there came a good fresh scent of youth, bravery, and passion. If there were fewer bad pictures in the official salon, the average there was assuredly more commonplace and mediocre. Here one found the smell of battle, of cheerful battle, given jauntily at daybreak, when the bugle sounds, and when one marches to meet the enemy with the certainty of beating him before sunset. End of chapter 5, part A Chapter 5, part B of His Masterpiece by Emile Zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Claude, whose spirits had revived amid that martial odour, grew animated and pugnacious as he listened to the laughter of the public. He looked as defiant, indeed, as if he had heard bullets whizzing past him. Sufficiently discreet at the entrance of the galleries, the laughter became more boisterous, more unrestrained as they advanced. In the third room the women ceased concealing their smiles behind their handkerchiefs, while the men openly held their sides the better to ease themselves. It was the contagious hilarity of people who had come to amuse themselves, and who were growing gradually excited, bursting out at a mere trifle, diverted as much by the good things as by the bad. Folks laughed less before Shane's Christ than before the back view of the nude woman who seemed to them very comical indeed. The lady in white also stupefied people and drew them together. Folks nudged each other and went into hysterics almost. There was always a grinning group in front of it. Each canvas thus had its particular kind of success. People hailed each other from a distance to point out something funny, and witticisms flew from mouth to mouth to such a degree, indeed, that as Claude entered the fourth gallery, lashed into fury by the tempest of laughter that was raging there as well, he all but slapped the face of an old lady whose chuckles exasperated him. "'What idiots!' he said, turning towards his friends. "'One feels inclined to throw a lot of masterpieces at their heads.' Sandoz had become fiery also, and Fagerol continued praising the most dreadful daubs, which only tended to increase the laughter, while Garnier, at sea amid the hubbub, dragged on the delighted Irma, whose skirts somehow wound round the legs of all the men. But of a sudden Jory stood before them. His fair, handsome face absolutely beamed. He cut his way through the crowd, gesticulated and exulted, as if over a personal victory. And the moment he perceived Claude, he shouted, "'Are you here at last?' I've been looking for you this hour. A success, old fellow. Oh, a success. What success? Why, the success of your picture. Come, I must show it you. You'll see, it's stunning. Claude grew pale. A great joy choked him, while he pretended to receive the news with composure. Bongrand's words came back to him. He began to believe that he possessed genius. Hello, how are you? continued Jory, shaking hands with the others, and without more ado, he, Fagerol, and Gagnère surrounded Irma, who smiled on them in a good-natured way. "'Perhaps you'll tell us where the picture is,' said Sandoz impatiently. "'Take us to it.' 
Jory assumed the lead, followed by the band. They had to fight their way into the last gallery, but Claude, who brought up the rear, still heard the laughter that rose on the air, a swelling clamour, the roll of a tide near its full, and as he finally entered the room, he beheld a vast, swarming, closely packed crowd pressing eagerly in front of his picture. All the laughter arose, spread, and ended there, and it was his picture that was being laughed at. Eh? Hey, repeated Jory triumphantly, there is a success for you. Gagnière, intimidated, as ashamed as if he himself had been slapped, muttered, too much of a success. I should prefer something different. What a fool you are, replied Jory in a burst of exalted conviction. That's what I call success. Does it matter a curse if they laugh? We have made our mark. Tomorrow every paper will talk about us. The idiots was all that Sandoz could gasp, choking with grief. Fagerolles, disinterested and dignified like a family friend following a funeral procession, said nothing. Irma alone remained gay, thinking it all very funny, and with a caressing gesture she leant against the shoulder of the derided painter and whispered softly in his ear, "'Don't fret, my boy. It's all humbug. Be merry all the same.' But Claude did not stir. An icy chill had come over him. For a moment his heart had almost ceased to beat. So cruel had been the disappointment. And with his eyes enlarged, attracted and fixed by a resistless force, he looked at his picture. He was surprised and scarcely recognized it. It certainly was not such as it had seemed to be in his studio. It had grown yellow beneath the livid light of the linen screens. It seemed, moreover, to have become smaller, coarser, and more laboured also, and whether it was the effect of the light in which it now hung, or the contrast of the works beside it, at all events he now at the first glance saw all its defects, after having remained blind to them, as it were, for months. With a few strokes of the brush he, in thought, altered the whole of it, deepened the distance, set a badly drawn limb right, and modified a tone, Decidedly, the gentleman in the velveteen jacket was worth nothing at all. He was altogether pasty and badly seated. The only really good bit of work about him was his hand. In the background, the two little wrestlers, the fair and the dark one, had remained too sketchy and lacked substance. They were amusing only to an artist's eye. But he was pleased with the trees, with the sunny glade, and the nude woman, the woman lying on the grass appeared to him superior to his own powers, as if someone else had painted her, and as if he had never yet beheld her in such resplendency of life. He turned to Sandoz and said simply, They do right to laugh. It's incomplete. Never mind, the woman is all right. Bongrand was not hoaxing me. His friend wished to take him away, but he became obstinate and drew nearer instead. Now that he had judged his work, he listened and looked at the crowd. The explosion continued, culminated in an ascending scale of mad laughter. No sooner had visitors crossed the threshold than he saw their jaws part, their eyes grow small, their entire faces expand, and he heard the tempestuous puffing of the fat men the rusty grating jeers of the lean ones, amidst all the shrill flute-like laughter of the women. Opposite him, against the handrails, some young fellows went into contortions, as if somebody had been tickling them. One lady had flung herself on a seat, stifling and trying to regain breath with her handkerchief over her mouth. Rumours of this picture, which was so very, very funny, must have been spreading, for there was a rush from the four corners of the salon. Bands of people arrived, jostling each other, and all eagerness to share the fun. Where is it? Over there! Oh, what a joke! And the witticisms fell thicker than elsewhere. It was especially the subject that caused merriment. People failed to understand it, thought it insane, comical enough to make one ill with laughter. You see, the lady feels too hot, 
while the gentleman has put on his velveteen jacket for fear of catching cold. Not at all. She is already blue. The gentleman has pulled her out of a pond, and he is resting at a distance, holding his nose. I tell you it's a young lady's school out for a ramble. Look at the two playing at leapfrog. Hello, washing day. The flesh is blue, the trees are blue. He's dipped his picture in the bluing tub. Those who did not laugh flew into a rage. That bluish tinge, that novel rendering of light, seemed an insult to them. Some old gentlemen shook their sticks. Was art to be outraged like this? One grave individual went away very wroth, saying to his wife that he did not like practical jokes. But another, a punctilious little man, having looked in the catalogue for the title of the work, in order to tell his daughter, read out the words, In the open air, whereupon there came a formidable renewal of the clamour, hisses and shouts, and what not else besides. The title sped about. It was repeated, commented on, In the open air! Ah, oh, yes, the open air! The nude woman in the air! Everything in the air! tra la la lair The affair was becoming a scandal. The crowd still increased. People's faces grew red with congestion in the growing heat. Each had the stupidly gaping mouth of the ignoramus who judges painting, and between them they indulged in all the asinine ideas, all the preposterous reflections, all the stupid spiteful jeers that the sight of an original work can possibly elicit from bourgeois imbecility. At that moment, as a last blow, Claude beheld Dubouche reappear, dragging the Marguelin along. As soon as he came in front of the picture, the architect, ill at ease, overtaken by cowardly shame, wished to quicken his pace, and lead his party further on, pretending that he saw neither the canvas nor his friends. But the contractor had already drawn himself up on his short squat legs, and was staring at the picture, and asking aloud in his thick, hoarse voice, "'I say, who's the blockhead that painted this?' That good-natured bluster, that cry of a millionaire parvenu, resuming the average opinion of the assembly, increased the general merriment, and he, flattered by his success, and tickled by the strange style of the painting, started laughing in his turn, so sonorously that he could be heard above all the others. This was the hallelujah, a final outburst of the great organ of opinion." "'Take my daughter away,' whispered pale-faced Madame Marguelin in Dubouche's ear. He sprang forward and freed Régine, who had lowered her eyelids from the crowd, displaying in doing so as much muscular energy as if it had been a question of saving the poor creature from imminent death. Then, having taken leave of the Marguelin at the door, with a deal of handshaking and bows, he came towards his friends and said straightway to Sandoz, Fagerolles, and Gagnier, "'What would you have? It isn't my fault. I warned him that the public would not understand him. It's improper. Yes, you may say what you like. It's improper.' "'They hissed Delacroix,' broke in Sandoz, white with rage and clenching his fists. "'They hissed Courbet. Oh, the race of enemies! Oh, the born idiots!' Gagnière, who now shared this artistic vindictiveness, grew angry at the recollection of his Sunday battles at the Padelou concerts in favour of real music. And they hiss Wagner, too. They are the same crew. I recognise them. You see that fat fellow over there? Jory had to hold him back. The journalist, for his part, would rather have urged on the crowd, he kept on repeating that it was famous, that there was a hundred thousand francs worth of advertisements in it. And Irma, left to her own devices once more, went up to two of her friends, young bourse men, who were among the most persistent scoffers, but whom she began to indoctrinate, forcing them, as it were, into admiration by rapping them on the knuckles. Fagerolles, however, had not opened his lips, he kept on examining the picture and glancing at the crowd. With his Parisian instinct and the elastic conscience of a skilful fellow, 
he at once fathomed the misunderstanding. He was already vaguely conscious of what was wanted for that style of painting to make the conquest of everybody. A little trickery, perhaps, some attenuations, a different choice of subject, a milder method of execution. In the main, the influence that Claude had always had over him persisted in making itself felt. He remained imbued with it. It had set its stamp upon him forever. Only he considered Claude to be an arch-idiot to have exhibited such a thing as that. Wasn't it stupid to believe in the intelligence of the public? What was the meaning of that nude woman beside that gentleman who was fully dressed? And what did those two little wrestlers in the background mean? Yet the picture showed many of the qualities of a master. There wasn't another bit of painting like it in the salon. And he felt a great contempt for that artist, so admirably endowed, who, through lack of tact, made all Paris roar as if he had been the worst of daubers. This contempt became so strong that he was unable to hide it, in a moment of irresistible frankness, he exclaimed, "'Look here, my dear fellow. It's your own fault. You are too stupid.' Claude, turning his eyes from the crowd, looked at him in silence. He had not winced. He had only turned pale amidst the laughter, and if his lips quivered it was merely with a slight nervous twitching. Nobody knew him. It was his work alone that was being buffeted.' Then for a moment he glanced again at his picture and slowly inspected the other canvases in the gallery. And amidst the collapse of his illusions, the bitter agony of his pride, a breath of courage, a whiff of health and youth came to him from all that gaily brave painting which rushed with such headlong passion to beat down classical conventionality. He was consoled and inspirited by it all, he felt no remorse nor contrition, but, on the contrary, was impelled to fight the popular taste still more. No doubt there was some clumsiness and some puerility of effort in his work, but on the other hand, what a pretty general tone! What a play of light he had thrown into it, a silvery-gray light, fine and diffuse, brightened by all the dancing sunbeams of the open air! It was as if a window had been suddenly opened amidst all the old bituminous cookery of art, amidst all the stewing sauces of tradition, and the sun came in and the walls smiled under the invasion of springtide. The light note of his picture, the bluish tinge that people had been railing at, flashed out among the other paintings also. Was this not the expected dawn? a new aura rising on art? He perceived a critic who stopped without laughing, some celebrated painters who looked surprised and grave, while Papa Malgras, very dirty, went from picture to picture with the pout of a wary connoisseur, and finally stopped short in front of his canvas, motionless, absorbed. Then Claude turned round to Fagerolles and surprised him by this tardy reply. A fellow can only be an idiot according to his own lights, my dear chap, and it looks as if I were going to remain one. So much the better for you if you are clever. Fagerolle at once patted him on the shoulder like a chum who has only been in fun, and Claude allowed Sandoz to take his arm. They let him off at last. The whole band left the salon of the rejected, deciding that they would pass on their way through the gallery of architecture. For a design for a museum by Dubouche had been accepted, and for some few minutes he had been fidgeting and begging them for so humble a look that it seemed difficult indeed to deny him that satisfaction. Ah, said Jory jocularly on entering the gallery, what an ice well! One can breathe here. They all took off their hats and wiped their foreheads with a feeling of relief, as if they had reached some big shady trees after a long march in full sunlight. The gallery was empty. From the roof, shaded by a white linen screen, there fell a soft, even, rather sad light, which was reflected like quiescent water by the well-waxed mirror-like floor. On the four walls of a faded red, 
hung the plans and designs in large and small chases edged with pale blue borders alone absolutely alone amidst this desert stood a very hirsute gentleman who was lost in the contemplation of the plan of a charity home three ladies who appeared became frightened and fled across the gallery with hasty steps dubuche was already showing and explaining his work to his comrades it was only a drawing of a modest little museum gallery which he had sent in with ambitious haste contrary to custom and against the wishes of his master who nevertheless had used his influences to have it accepted thinking himself pledged to do so is your museum intended for the accommodation of the paintings of the open-air school asked fagerolles very gravely gagnière pretended to admire the plan nodding his head but thinking of something else while claude and sandoz examined it with sincere interest not bad old boy said the former the ornamentation is still bastardly traditional but never mind it will do jory becoming impatient at last cut him short come along let's go eh i'm catching my death of cold here the band resumed its march the worst was that to make a short cut they had to go right through the official salon and they resigned themselves to doing so notwithstanding the oath they had taken not to set foot in it as a matter of protest cutting their way through the crowd keeping rigidly erect they followed the suite of galleries casting indignant glances to right and left there was none of the gay scandal of their salon full of fresh tones and an exaggeration of sunlight here one after the other came gilt frames full of shadows black pretentious things nude figures showing yellowish in a cellar-like light the frippery of so-called classical art historical genre and landscape painting all showing the same conventional black grease the works reeked of uniform mediocrity they were characterized by a muddy dinginess of tone despite their primness the primness of impoverished degenerate blood and the friends quickened their steps they ran to escape from that rain of bitumen condemning everything in one lump with their superb sectarian injustice repeating that there was nothing in the place worth looking at nothing nothing at all at last they emerged from the galleries and were going down into the garden when they met maudot and chaine the former threw himself into claude's arms oh my dear fellow your picture what artistic temperament it shows the painter at once began to praise the vintaging girl and you i say you have thrown a nice big lump at their heads but the sight of shane to whom no one spoke about the woman taken in adultery and who went silently wandering around awakened claude's compassion he thought there was something very sad about that execrable painting and the wasted life of that peasant who was a victim of middle-class admiration he always gave him the delight of a little praise so now he shook his hand cordially exclaiming your machine's very good too ah my fine fellow draughtsmanship has no terrors for you no indeed declared shane who had grown purple with vanity under his black bushy beard he and maudot joined the band and the latter asked the others whether they had seen chambouvard sower it was marvellous the only piece of statuary worth looking at in the salon thereupon they all followed him into the garden which the crowd was now invading there said maudot stopping in the middle of the central path jean bouvard is standing just in front of his sower in fact a portly man stood there solidly planted on his fat legs and admiring his handiwork with his head sunk between his shoulders he had the heavy handsome features of a hindu idol he was said to be the son of a veterinary surgeon of the neighbourhood of amiens at forty-five he had already produced twenty masterpieces statues all simplicity and life flesh modern and palpitating needed by a workman of genius without any pretension to refinement 
and all this was chance production, for he furnished work as a field bear's harvest, good one day, bad the next, in absolute ignorance of what he created. He carried the lack of critical acumen to such a degree that he made no distinction between the most glorious offspring of his hands and the detestably grotesque figures which now and then he chanced to put together. Never troubled by nervous feverishness, never doubting, always solid and convinced he had the pride of a god. "'Wonderful, the sower,' whispered Claude. "'What a figure! And what an attitude!' Fagerol, who had not looked at the statue, was highly amused by the great man and the string of young, open-mouthed disciples, whom, as usual, he dragged at his tail. "'Just look at them! One would think they were taking the sacrament, upon my word. And he himself, eh? What a fine, brutish face he has!' Isolated and quite at his ease amidst the general curiosity, Chambouvard stood there wondering with the stupefied air of a man who is surprised at having produced such a masterpiece. He seemed to behold it for the first time, and was unable to get over his astonishment. Then an expression of delight gradually stole over his broad face. He nodded his head and burst into soft, irresistible laughter, repeating a dozen times, it's comical! It's really comical! His train of followers went into raptures, while he himself could find nothing more forcible to express how much he worshipped himself. All at once there was a slight stir. Bongrand, who had been walking about with his hands behind his back, glancing vaguely around him, had just stumbled on Chambouvard, and the public, drawing back, whispered and watched the two celebrated artists shaking hands the one short and of a sanguine temperament, the other tall and restless. Some expressions of good fellowship were overheard. Always fresh marvels. Oh, yes, and you, nothing this year? No, nothing. I am resting, seeking. Come, you joker, there's no need to seek. The thing comes by itself. Good-bye, good-bye. And Chambouvard, followed by his court, was already moving slowly away among the crowd, with the glances of a king who enjoys life, while Bongrand, who had recognized Claude and his friends, approached them with outstretched feverish hands, and called attention to the sculptor with a nervous jerk of his chin, saying, "'There's a fellow I envy. Ah, to be confident of always producing masterpieces!' He complimented Maudot on his vintaging girl, showed himself paternal to all of them with that broad-minded good nature of his the free and easy manner of an old bohemian of the romantic school who had settled down and was decorated then turning to claude well what did i tell you did you see upstairs you have become the chief of a school ah yes replied claude they are giving it me nicely you are the master of us all but Bongrand made his usual gesture of vague suffering, and went off, saying, "'Hold your tongue. I am not even my own master.' For a few moments longer the band wandered through the garden. They had gone back to look at the vintaging girl, when Jory noticed that Gagnière no longer had Irma Beco on his arm. Gagnière was stupefied. Where the deuce could he have lost her?' But when Fagerolles had told him that she had gone off in the crowd with two gentlemen, he recovered his composure, and followed the others, lighter of heart, now that he was relieved of that girl who had bewildered him. People now only moved about with difficulty. All the seats were taken by storm. Groups blocked up the paths, where the promenaders paused every now and then, flowing back around the successful bits of bronze and marble. From the crowded buffet there arose a loud buzzing, a clatter of saucers and spoons which mingled with the throb of life pervading the vast nave. The sparrows had flown up to the forest of iron girders again, and one could hear their sharp little chirps, the twittering with which they serenaded the setting sun under the warm panes of the glass roof. The atmosphere, moreover, had become heavy. There was a damp greenhouse-like warmth, the air, stationary as it was, had an odour as of humus, freshly turned over. And rising above the garden throng, the din of the first-floor galleries, 
the tramping of feet on their iron-girded flooring still rolled on with the clamour of a tempest beating against a cliff claude who had a keen perception of that rumbling storm ended by hearing nothing else it had been let loose and was howling in his ears it was the merriment of the crowd whose jeers and laughter swept hurricane-like past his picture with a weary gesture he exclaimed come what are we messing about here for i shan't take anything at the refreshment bar it reeks of the institute let's go and have a glass of beer outside eh they all went out with sinking legs and tired faces expressive of contempt once outside on finding themselves again face to face with healthy mother nature in her springtide season they breathed noisily with an air of delight it had barely struck four o'clock the slanting sun swept along the champs elysees and everything flared the serried rows of carriages like the fresh foliage of trees and the sheaf-like fountains which sprouted up and whirled away in golden dust with a sauntering step they went hesitatingly down the central avenue and finally stranded in a little cafe the pavillon de la concorde on the left just before reaching the place the place was so small that they sat down outside it at the edge of the footway despite the chill which fell from a vault of leaves already fully grown and blooming but beyond the four rows of chestnut trees beyond the belt of verdant shade they could see the sunlit roadway of the main avenue where paris passed before them as in a nimbus the carriages with their wheels radiating like stars the big yellow omnibuses looking even more profusely gilded than triumphal chariots the horsemen whose steeds seemed to raise clouds of sparks and the foot passengers whom the light enveloped in splendour and during nearly three hours with his beer untasted before him claude went on talking and arguing amid a growing fever broken down as he was in body and with his mind full of all the painting he had just seen it was the usual winding up of their visit to the salon though this year they were more impassioned on account of the liberal measure of the emperor well and what of it if the public does laugh cried claude we must educate the public that's all in reality it's a victory take away two hundred grotesque canvases and our salon beats theirs we have courage and audacity we are the future yes yes you'll see it later on we shall kill their salon we shall enter it as conquerors by dint of producing masterpieces laugh laugh you big stupid paris laugh until you fall on your knees before us and stopping short he pointed prophetically to the triumphal avenue where the luxury and happiness of the city went rolling by in the sunlight his arms stretched out till they embraced even the place de la concorde which could be seen slantwise from where they sat under the trees the place de la concorde with the plashing water of one of its fountains a strip of balustrade and two of its statues rouen with the gigantic bosom and lille thrusting forward her huge bare foot in the open air it amuses them eh he resumed all right since they are bent on it the open air then the school of the open air eh it is a thing strictly between us it didn't exist yesterday beyond the circle of a few painters but now they throw the word upon the winds and they found the school oh i'm agreeable let it be the school of the open air jory slapped his thighs didn't i tell you i felt sure of making them bite with those articles of mine the idiots that they are ah how we'll plague them now maudot also was singing victory constantly dragging in his vintaging girl the daring points of which he explained to the silent shane the only one who listened to him while gagnier with the sternness of a timid man waxing wroth over questions of pure theory spoke of guillotining the institute and sandoz with the glowing sympathy of a hard worker and dubouche giving way to the contagion of revolutionary friendship 
became exasperated and struck the table, swallowing up Paris with each draught of beer. Fagerol, very calm, retained his usual smile. He had accompanied them for the sake of amusement, for the singular pleasure which he found in urging his comrades into farcical affairs that were bound to turn out badly. At the very moment when he was lashing their spirit of revolt, he himself formed the firm resolution to work in future for the Prix de Rome. That day had decided him. He thought it idiotic to compromise his prospects any further. The sun was declining on the horizon. There was now only a returning stream of carriages coming back from the Bois in the pale golden shimmer of the sunset. And the exodus from the salon must have been nearly over. A long string of pedestrians passed by, gentlemen who looked like critics, each with a catalogue under his arm. But all at once Gagnière became enthusiastic. Ah, Courageot! There was one who had his share in inventing landscape painting. Have you seen his Pond of Gagny at the Luxembourg? A marvel, exclaimed Claude. It was painted thirty years ago, and nothing more substantial has been turned out since. Why is it left at the Luxembourg? It ought to be in the Louvre. But Courageot isn't dead, said Fagerol. What? Courageot isn't dead? No one ever sees him or speaks of him now. There was general stupefaction when Fagerolles assured them that the great landscape painter, now seventy years of age, lived somewhere in the neighbourhood of Montmartre, in a little house among his fowls, ducks, and dogs. So one might outlive one's own glory. To think that there were such melancholy instances of old artists disappearing before their death. Silence fell upon them. They began to shiver when they perceived Bongrand pass by on a friend's arm, with a congestive face and a nervous air as he waved his hand to them, while almost immediately behind him, surrounded by his disciples, came Chambouvard, laughing very loudly and tapping his heels on the pavement with the air of absolute mastery that comes from confidence in immortality. "'What, are you going?' said Mahoudeau to Shane, who was rising from his chair. The other mumbled some indistinct words in his beard and went off after distributing handshakes among the party. "'I know,' said Jory to Mahoudeau, "'I believe he has a weakness for your neighbour, the herbalist woman. "'I saw his eyes flash all at once. "'It comes upon him like toothache. "'Look how he's running over there.' "'The sculptor shrugged his shoulders amidst the general laughter. "'But Claude did not hear. "'He was now discussing architecture with Dubouche. "'No doubt that plan of a museum gallery which he exhibited wasn't bad, "'only there was nothing new in it. It was all so much patient marquetry of the school formulas. Ought not all the arts to advance in one line of battle? Ought not the evolution that was transforming literature, painting, even music itself, to renovate architecture as well? If ever the architecture of a period was to have a style of its own, it was assuredly the architecture of the period they would soon be entering, a new period, when they would find the ground freshly swept, ready for the rebuilding of everything. Down with the Greek temples, there was no reason why they should continue to exist under our sky, amid our society. Down with the Gothic cathedrals, since faith in legend was dead. Down with the delicate colonnades, the lace-like work of the Renaissance, that revival of the antique grafted on medievalism. Precious art jewellery, no doubt, but in which democracy could not dwell. And he demanded, he called with violent gestures for an architectural formula suited to democracy, such work in stone as would express its tenets, edifices where it would really be at home, something vast and strong, great and simple at the same time the something that was already being indicated in the new railway stations and markets, whose ironwork displayed such solid elegance, but purified and raised to a standard of beauty, proclaiming the grandeur of the intellectual conquests of the age. 
Ah, yes, ah, yes, repeated Dubouche, catching Claude's enthusiasm. That's what I want to accomplish. You'll see some day. Give me time to succeed, and when I'm my own master, ah, when I'm my own master. Night was coming on apace, and Claude was growing more and more animated and passionate, displaying a fluency, an eloquence which his comrades had not known him to possess. They all grew excited in listening to him, and ended by becoming noisily gay over the extraordinary witticisms he launched forth. He himself, having returned to the subject of his picture, again discussed it with a deal of gaiety, caricaturing the crowd he had seen looking at it, and imitating the imbecile laughter. Along the avenue, now of an ashy hue, one only saw the shadows of infrequent vehicles dart by. The sidewalk was quite black. An icy chill fell from the trees. Nothing broke the stillness but the sound of song coming from a clump of verdure behind the café. There was some rehearsal at the Concert de l'Horloge, for one heard the sentimental voice of a girl trying a love song. "'Oh, how they amuse me, the idiots!' exclaimed Claude in a last burst. "'Do you know, I wouldn't take a hundred thousand francs for my day's pleasure.' Then he relapsed into silence, thoroughly exhausted. Nobody had any saliva left. Silence reigned. They all shivered in the icy gust that swept by and they separated in a sort of bewilderment, shaking hands in a tired fashion. Dubouche was going to dine out. Fagerolles had an appointment. In vain did Jory, Maudot, and Gagnière try to drag Claude to Foucard's, a twenty-five sous restaurant. Sandoz was already taking him away on his arm, feeling anxious at seeing him so excited. "'Come along. I promised my mother to be back for dinner. You'll take a bit with us.' It'll be nice. We'll finish the day together. They both went down the quay, past the Tuileries, walking side by side in fraternal fashion. But at the Pont des Saint-Pères, the painter stopped short. What, are you going to leave me? exclaimed Sandoz. Why, I thought you were going to dine with me. No, thanks. I've too bad a headache. I'm going home to bed. And he obstinately clung to his excuse. "'All right, old man,' said Sandoz, at last, with a smile. "'One doesn't see much of you nowadays. You live in mystery. Go on, old boy, I don't want to be in your way.' Claude restrained a gesture of impatience, and letting his friend cross the bridge, he went his way along the quays by himself. He walked on, with his arms hanging beside him, with his face turned towards the ground, seeing nothing but taking long strides like a somnambulist who is guided by instinct. On the Quai du Bourbon, in front of his door, he looked up, full of surprise, on seeing a cab waiting at the edge of the foot pavement, and barring his way. And it was with the same automatical step that he entered the doorkeeper's room to take his key. "'I have given it to that lady,' called Madame Joseph from the back of the room. "'She is upstairs.' "'What lady?' he asked in bewilderment. "'That young person. Come, you know very well, the one who always comes.' He had not the remotest idea whom she meant. Still, in his utter confusion of mind, he decided to go upstairs. The key was in the door, which he slowly opened and closed again. For a moment Claude stood stock still. Darkness had invaded the studio. A violet dimness— a melancholy gloom fell from the large window enveloping everything. He could no longer plainly distinguish either the floor or the furniture or the sketches. Everything that was lying about seemed to be melting in the stagnant waters of a pool. But on the edge of the couch there loomed a dark figure, stiff with waiting, anxious and despairing amid the last gasp of daylight. It was Christine. He recognized her. She held out her hands, and murmured in a low, halting voice, "'I have been here for three hours. Yes, for three hours, all alone and listening. I took a cab on leaving there, and I only wanted to stay a minute and get back as soon as possible. But I should have stayed all night. I could not go away without shaking hands with you.' 
she continued and told him of her mad desire to see the picture, her prank of going to the salon, and how she had tumbled into it amidst the storm of laughter, amidst the jeers of all those people. It was she whom they had hissed like that. It was on herself that they had spat. And seized with wild terror, distracted with grief and shame, she had fled, as if she could feel that laughter lashing her like a whip until the blood flowed. But she now forgot about herself in her concern for him, upset by the thought of the grief he must feel, for her womanly sensibility magnified the bitterness of the repulse, and she was eager to console. "'Oh, friend, don't grieve. I wish to see and tell you that they are jealous of it all, that I found the picture very nice, and that I feel very proud and happy at having helped you, at being, if ever so little, a part of it.' Still motionless, he listened to her as she stammered those tender words in an ardent voice, and suddenly he sank down at her feet, letting his head fall upon her knees, and bursting into tears. All his excitement of the afternoon, all the bravery he had shown amidst the jeering, all his gaiety and violence, now collapsed in a fit of sobs which well-nigh choked him. From the gallery, where the laughter had buffeted him, he heard it pursuing him through the Champs-Élysées, then along the banks of the Seine, and now in his very studio. His strength was utterly spent. He felt weaker than a child, and rolling his head from one side to another, he repeated in a stifled voice, "'My God, how I do suffer!' Then she, with both hands, raised his face to her lips in a transport of passion. She kissed him, and with her warm breath she blew to his very heart the words, Be quiet, be quiet, I love you. They adored each other. It was inevitable. Near them, on the centre of the table, the lilac she had sent him that morning embalmed the night air, and, alone shiny with lingering light, the scattered particles of gold leaf wafted from the frame of the big picture twinkled like a swarming of stars end of chapter 5 part b chapter 6 part a of his masterpiece by emile zola Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. The very next morning, at seven o'clock, Christine was at the studio, her face still flushed by the falsehood which she had told Madame Vanzade about a young friend from Clermont, whom she was to meet at the station and with whom she should spend the day. Claude, overjoyed by the idea of spending a whole day with her, wanted to take her into the country, far away under the glorious sunlight, so as to have her entirely to himself. She was delighted. They scampered off like lunatics, and reached the Saint-Lazare station just in time to catch the Havre train. He knew, beyond Mantes, a little village called Bencourt, where there was an artist's inn, which he had at times invaded with some comrades and careless as to the two hours' rail, he took her to lunch there, just as he would have taken her to Agnières. She made very merry over this journey, to which there seemed no end. So much the better if it were to take them to the end of the world. It seemed to them as if evening would never come. At ten o'clock they alighted at Bonnières, and there they took the ferry, an old ferry-boat that creaked and grated against its chain, for Benicourt is situated on the opposite bank of the Seine. It was a splendid May morning, the rippling waters were spangled with gold in the sunlight, the young foliage showed delicately green against the cloudless azure, and beyond the islets situated at this point of the river, how delightful it was to find the country inn, with its little grocery business attached, its large common room smelling of soap suds, and its spacious yard full of manure, on which the ducks disported themselves. Hallo, for sure. We have come to lunch. An omelette, some sausages, and some cheese, eh? And are you going to stay the night, Monsieur Claude? No, no, another time. 
and some white wine, eh? You know, that pinky wine that grates a bit in the throat. Christine had already followed Mother Foucher to the barnyard, and when the latter came back with her eggs, she asked Claude with her artful peasant's laugh, And so now you're married? Well, replied the painter without hesitation, it looks like it since I'm with my wife. The lunch was exquisite. The omelette overdone, the sausages too greasy, and the bread so hard that he had to cut it into fingers for Christine, lest she should hurt her wrist. They emptied two bottles of wine, and began a third, becoming so gay and noisy that they ended up by feeling bewildered in the long room, where they partook of the meal all alone. She, with her cheeks aflame, declared that she was tipsy. It had never happened to her before, and she thought it very funny. Oh, so funny, she burst into uncontrollable laughter. Let us get a breath of air, she said at last. Yes, let's take a stroll. We must start back at four o'clock, so we have three hours before us. They went up the village of Binacour whose yellow houses straggle along the river bank for about a couple of thousand yards. All the villagers were in the fields. They only met three cows led by a little girl. He, with an outstretched arm, told her all about the locality, seemed to know whither he was going and when they had reached the last house, an old building standing on the bank of the Seine just opposite the slopes of Jufos. So he turned round it and entered a wood of oak trees. It was like the end of the world, roofed in with foliage, through which the sun alone penetrated in narrow tongues of flame, and there they could stroll and talk and kiss in freedom. When at last it became necessary for them to retrace their steps, they found a peasant standing at the doorway of the house by the woodside. Claude recognized the man and called to him, "'Allo, Porette, does that shanty belong to you?' At this the old fellow, with tears in his eyes, related that it did, and that his tenants had gone away without paying him, leaving their furniture behind, and he invited them inside. "'There's no harm in looking. You may know somebody who would like to take the place. There are many Parisians who'd be glad of it. Three hundred francs a year, with the furniture. It's for nothing, eh?' They inquisitively followed him inside. It was a rambling old place that seemed to have been cut out of a barn. Downstairs they found an immense kitchen and a dining room in which one might have given a dance. Upstairs were two rooms also, so vast that one seemed lost in them. As for the furniture, it consisted of a walnut bedstead in one of the rooms, and of a table and some household utensils in the kitchen. But in front of the house the neglected garden was planted with magnificent apricot trees and overgrown with large rose bushes in full bloom, while at the back there was a potato field reaching as far as the oak wood, and surrounded by a quick-set hedge. I'd leave the potatoes as they are, said old Porette. Claude and Christine looked at each other with one of those sudden cravings for solitude and forgetfulness common to lovers. Oh, how sweet it would be to love one another there in the depths of that nook, so far away from everybody else but they smiled. Was such a thing to be thought of? They had barely time to catch the train that was to take them back to Paris, and the old peasant, who was Madame Faucheur's father, accompanied them along the river bank, and as they were stepping into the ferry boat, shouted to them, after quite an inward struggle, "'You know, I'll make it two hundred and fifty francs. Send me some people.' On reaching Paris, Claude accompanied Christine to Madame Van Zad's door. They had grown very sad. They exchanged a long handshake, silent and despairing, not daring to kiss each other there. A life of torment then began. In the course of a fortnight, she was only able to call on three occasions, and she arrived panting, having but a few minutes at her disposal, for it so happened that the old lady had just then become very exacting, Claude questioned her, feeling uneasy at seeing her look so pale and out of sorts, with her eyes bright with fever. Never had that pious house, that vault without air or light, where she died of boredom, caused her so much suffering. Her fits of giddiness had come upon her again. The want of exercise made the blood throb in her temples. 
She owned to him that she had fainted one evening in her room, as if she had been suddenly strangled by a leaden hand. Still she did not say a word against her employer. On the contrary, she softened on speaking of her. The poor creature, so old and so infirm, and so kind-hearted, who called her daughter. She felt as if she were committing a wicked act each time that she forsook her to hurry to her lovers. Two more weeks went by, and the falsehoods with which Christine had to buy, as it were, each hour of liberty, became intolerable to her. She loved, she would have liked to proclaim it aloud, and her feelings revolted at having to hide her love like a crime, at having to lie basely, like a servant afraid of being sent away. At last, one evening in the studio, at the moment when she was leaving, she threw herself with a distracted gesture into Claude's arms, sobbing with suffering and passion. Oh, I cannot, I cannot. Keep me with you. Prevent me from going back. He had caught hold of her and was almost smothering her with kisses. You really love me then, oh, my darling, but I am so very poor and you would lose everything. Can I allow you to forgo everything like this? She sobbed more violently still. Her halting words were choked by her tears. The money, eh? Which she might leave me? Do you think I calculate? I have never thought of it. I swear it to you. Oh, let her keep everything and let me be free. I have no ties, no relatives. Can't I be allowed to do as I like? Then, in a last sob of agony, Oh, you are right. It's wrong to desert the poor woman. Oh, I despise myself. I wish I had the strength. But I love you too much. I suffer too much. Surely you won't let me die. Oh, he cried in a passionate transport, let others die. There are but we two on earth. It was all so much madness. Christine left Madame Van Zad in the most brutal fashion. She took her trunk away the very next morning. She and Claude had at once remembered the deserted old house at Bencourt, the giant rose bushes, the immense rooms. Ah, to go away, to go away without the loss of an hour, to live at the world's end in all the bliss of their passion. She clapped her hands for very joy. He, still smarting from his defeat at the salon, and anxious to recover from it, longed for complete rest in the country. Yonder he would find the real open air. He would work away with grass up to his neck and bring back masterpieces. In a couple of days everything was ready. The studio relinquished, the few household chattels conveyed to the railway station. Besides, they met with a slice of luck, for Papa Malgras gave some five hundred francs for a score of sketches, selected from among the waifs and strays of the removal. Thus they would be able to live like princes. Claude still had his income of a thousand francs a year. Christine, too, had saved some money, besides having her outfit and dresses. And away they went. It was perfect flight. Friends avoided and not even warned by letter. Paris despised and forsaken amid laughter expressive of relief. June was drawing to a close, and the rain fell in torrents during the week they spent in arranging their new home. They discovered that old Porette had taken away half the kitchen utensils before signing the agreement. But that matter did not affect them. They took a delight in dabbling about amidst the showers. They made journeys three leagues long as far as Vernon to buy plates and saucepans, which they brought back with them in triumph. At last they got shipshape, occupying one of the upstairs rooms, abandoning the other to the mice, and transforming the dining room into a studio, and above all as happy as children at taking their meals in the kitchen off a deal table, near the hearth where the soup sang in the pot. To wait upon them they engaged a girl from the village, who came every morning and went home at night. She was called Mélie. She was a niece of the Fauchures, and her stupidity delighted them. In fact, one could not have found a greater idiot in the whole region. The sun having shown itself again, some delightful days followed, the months slipping away amid monotonous felicity. 
They never knew the date. They were forever mixing up the days of the week. Every day, after the second breakfast, came endless strolls, long walks across the tableland, planted with apple trees, over the grassy country roads, along the banks of the Seine, through the meadows as far as La Roche-Guillon. And there were still more distant explorations, perfect journeys on the opposite side of the river, amid the cornfields of Bonnière and Jouffas. A person who was obliged to leave the neighbourhood sold them an old boat for thirty francs, so that they also had the river at their disposal, and, like savages, became seized with a passion for it, living on its waters for days together, rowing about, discovering new countries, and lingering for hours under the willows on the banks, or in little creeks, dark with shade. Betwixt the Iots, scattered along the stream, there was a shifting and mysterious city, a network of passages along which, with the lower branches of the trees caressingly brushing against them, they softly glided, alone, as it were, in the world, with the ring-doves and the kingfishers. He at times had to spring out upon the sand with bare legs to push off the skiff. She bravely plied the oars, bent on forcing her way against the strongest currents, and exulting in her strength and in the evening they ate cabbage soup in the kitchen, laughing at Mélie's stupidity, as they had laughed at it the day before, to begin the morrow just in the same fashion. Every evening, however, Christine said to Claude, "'Now, my dear, you must promise me one thing, that you'll set to work to-morrow.' "'Yes, to-morrow, I give you my word. "'And you know, if you don't, I shall really get angry this time.' Is it I who prevent you? You! What an idea! Since I came here to work, dash it all, you'll see tomorrow. On the morrow they started off again in the skiff. She looked at him with an embarrassed smile when she saw that he took neither canvas nor colours. Then she kissed him, laughing, proud of her power, moved by the constant sacrifice he made to her. And then came fresh affectionate remonstrances, Tomorrow, ah, tomorrow, she would tie him to his easel. However, Claude did make some attempts at work. He began a study of the slopes of Jouvos, with the Seine in the foreground. But Christine followed him to the islet where he had installed himself, and sat down on the grass close to him with parted lips, her eyes watching the blue sky. And she looked so pretty there amidst the verdure, in that solitude where nothing broke the silence but the rippling of the water, that every minute he relinquished his palate to nestle by her side. On another occasion he was altogether charmed by an old farmhouse, shaded by some antiquated apple-trees which had grown to the size of oaks. He came thither two days in succession, but on the third Christine took him to the market at Bonnier to buy some hens. The next day was also lost, the canvas had dried. Then he grew impatient in trying to work at it again, and finally abandoned it altogether. Throughout the warm weather he thus made but a pretense to work, barely roughing out little bits of painting, which he laid aside on the first pretext, without an effort at perseverance. His passion for toil, that fever of former days that had made him rise at daybreak to battle with his rebellious art, seemed to have gone, a reaction of indifference and laziness had set in, and he vegetated delightfully, like one who's recovering from some severe illness. But Christine lived indeed. All the latent passion of her nature burst into being. She was indeed an amorosa, a child of nature and of love. Thus their days passed by, and solitude did not prove irksome to them. No desire for diversion, or paying or receiving visits, as yet made them look beyond themselves. Such hours as she did not spend near him, she employed in household cares, turning the house upside down with great cleanings, which Mélie executed under her supervision, and falling into fits of reckless activity, which led her to engage in personal combats with the few saucepans in the kitchen. 
The garden especially occupied her. Provided with pruning shears, careless of the thorns which lacerated her hands, she reaped harvests of roses from the giant rose bushes, and she gave herself a thorough backache in gathering the apricots, which she sold for two hundred francs to some of the Englishmen who scoured the district every year. She was very proud of her bargain, and seriously talked of living upon the garden produce. Claude cared less for gardening. He had placed his couch in the large dining-room, transformed into a studio, and he stretched himself upon it, and through the open window watched her sow and plant. There was profound peace, the certainty that nobody would come, that no ring at the bell would disturb them at any moment of the day. Claude carried this fear of coming into contact with people so far as to avoid passing Faucheur's inn, for he dreaded lest he might run against some party of chums from Paris. Not a soul came, however, throughout the live-long summer, and every night as they went upstairs he repeated that, after all, it was deuced lucky. There was, however, a secret sore in the depths of his happiness. After their flight from Paris, Sandoz had learnt their address, and had written to ask whether he might go to see Claude, but the latter had not answered the letter, and so coolness had followed, and the old friendship seemed dead. Christine was grieved at this, for she realized well enough that he had broken off all intercourse with his comrades for her sake. She constantly reverted to the subject. She did not want to estrange him from his friends, and indeed she insisted that he should invite them. But though he promised to set matters right, he did nothing of the kind. It was all over. What was the use of raking up the past? However, money having become scarce towards the latter days of July, he was obliged to go to Paris to sell Papa Malgras half a dozen of his old studies, and Christine, on accompanying him to the station, made him solemnly promise that he would go to see Sandoz. In the evening she was there again, at the Bonnier station, waiting for him. Well, did you see him? Did you embrace each other? He began walking by her side in silent embarrassment. Then he answered in a husky voice, No, I hadn't time. Thereupon, sorely distressed, with two big tears welling to her eyes, she replied, You grieve me very much indeed. Then, as they were walking under the trees, he kissed her, crying also, and begging her not to make him sadder still. Could people alter life? Did it not suffice that they were happy together? During the earlier months they only once met some strangers. This occurred a little above Bencourt, in the direction of La Rochon Guillon. They were strolling along a deserted wooded lane, one of those delightful dingle paths of the region, when at a turning they came upon three middle-class people out for a walk, father, mother, and daughter. It precisely happened that, believing themselves to be quite alone, Claude and Christine had passed their arms round each other's waists. She, bending towards him, was offering her lips, while he laughingly protruded his, and their surprise was so sudden that they did not change their attitude, but, still clasped together, advanced at the same slow pace. The amazed family remained transfixed against one of the side banks, the father stout and apoplectic, the mother as thin as a knife-blade, and the daughter a mere shadow looking like a sick bird molting. All three of them ugly, moreover, and but scantily provided with the vitiated blood of their race. They looked disgraceful amidst the throbbing life of nature beneath the glorious sun, and all at once the sorry girl, who, with stupefied eyes, thus watched love passing by, was pushed off by her father, dragged along by her mother, both beside themselves, exasperated by the sight of that embrace, and asking whether there was no longer any country police, while, still without hurrying, the lovers went off triumphantly in their glory. Claude, however, was wondering and searching his memory, where had he previously seen those heads, so typical of bourgeois degeneracy, those flattened, crabbed faces reeking of millions earned at the expense of the poor? It was assuredly in some important circumstance of his life, 
and all at once he remembered. They were the Marguelans. The man was that building contractor whom Dubouche had promenaded through the salon of the rejected, and who had laughed in front of his picture with the roaring laugh of a fool. A couple of hundred steps further on, as he and Christine emerged from the lane and found themselves in front of a large estate, where a big white building stood girt with fine trees, they learnt from an old peasant woman that La Richaudière, as it was called, had belonged to the Marguelin for three years past. They had paid fifteen hundred thousand francs for it, and had just spent more than a million in improvements. "'That part of the country won't see much of us in the future,' said Claude, as they returned to Bencourt. "'Those monsters spoil the landscape.' Towards the end of summer, an important event changed the current of their lives. Christine was enceinte. At first, both she and Claude felt amazed and worried. Now, for the first time, they seemed to dread some terrible complications in their life. Later on, however, they gradually grew accustomed to the thought of what lay before them, and made all necessary preparations. But the winter proved a terribly inclement one, and Christine was compelled to remain indoors, whilst Claude went walking all alone over the frost-bound, clanking roads. And he, finding himself in solitude during these walks, after months of constant companionship, wondered at the way his life had turned against his own will, as it were. He had never wished for home life, even with her. Had he been consulted, he would have expressed his horror of it. It had come about, however, and could not be undone, for, without mentioning the child, he was one of those who lacked the courage to break off. This fate had evidently been in store for him, he felt. He had been destined to succumb to the first woman who did not feel ashamed of him. The hard ground resounded beneath his wooden-soled shoes, and the blast froze the current of his reverie, which lingered on vague thoughts on his luck of having at any rate met with a good and honest girl, on how cruelly he would have suffered had it been otherwise. And then his love came back to him. He hurried home to take Christine in his trembling arms, as if he had been in danger of losing her. End of chapter 6, part A Chapter 6, part B of His Masterpiece by Emil Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. The child, a boy, was born about the middle of February, and at once began to revolutionize the home, for Christine, who had shown herself such an active housewife, proved to be a very awkward nurse. She failed to become motherly, despite her kind heart and her distress at the sight of the slightest pimple. She soon grew weary, gave in, and called for Mélie, who only made matters worse by her gaping stupidity. The father had to come to the rescue, and proved still more awkward than the two women. The discomfort which needlework had caused Christine of old, her want of aptitude as regards the usual occupations of her sex, revived amid the cares that the baby required. The child was ill-kept, and grew up anyhow in the garden, or in the large rooms left untidy in sheer despair, amidst broken toys, uncleanliness, and destruction. And when matters became too bad altogether, Christine could only throw herself upon the neck of the man she loved. She was preeminently an amorosa, and would have sacrificed her son for his father twenty times over. It was at this period, however, that Claude resumed work a little. The winter was drawing to a close. He did not know how to spend the bright sunny mornings, since Christine could no longer go out before midday on account of Jacques, whom they had named thus after his maternal grandfather, though they neglected to have him christened. Claude worked in the garden, at first in a random way, made a rough sketch of the lines of apricot trees, roughed out the giant rose bushes, composed some bits of still life out of four apples, a bottle, and a stoneware jar, disposed on a table napkin. This was only to pass his time. 
but afterwards he warmed to his work. The idea of painting a figure in the full sunlight ended by haunting him, and from that moment his wife became his victim, she herself agreeable enough, offering herself, feeling happy at affording him pleasure, without as yet understanding what a terrible rival she was giving herself in art. He painted her a score of times, dressed in white, in red amidst the verdure, standing, walking, or reclining on the grass, wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat, or bareheaded, under a parasol, the cherry-tinted silk of which steeped her features in a pinky glow. He never felt wholly satisfied. He scratched out the canvases after two or three sittings, and at once began them afresh, obstinately sticking to the same subject. Only a few studies, incomplete, but charmingly indicated in a vigorous style, were saved from the palette-knife, and hung against the walls of the dining-room. And after Christine it became Jacques' turn to pose. They stripped him to the skin, like a little St. John the Baptist, on warm days, and stretched him on a blanket where he was told not to stir. But devil a bit could they make him keep still. Getting frisky in the sunlight, he crowed and kicked with his tiny pink feet in the air, rolling about and turning somersaults. The father, after laughing, became angry and swore at the tiresome mite, who would not keep quiet for a minute. Who ever heard of trifling with painting? Then the mother made big eyes at the little one and held him while the painter quickly sketched an arm or a leg. Claude obstinately kept at it for weeks, tempted as he felt by the pretty tones of that childish skin. It was not as a father, but as an artist, that he gloated over the boy as the subject for a masterpiece, blinking his eyes the while, and dreaming of some wonderful picture he would paint. And he renewed the experiment again and again, watching the lad for days, and feeling furious when the little scamp would not go to sleep at times, when he, Claude, might so well have painted him. One day, when Jacques was sobbing, refusing to keep still, Christine gently remarked, "'My dear, you tire the poor pet.' At this, Claude burst forth, full of remorse. "'After all, you are right. I'm a fool with this painting of mine. Children are not intended for that sort of thing.' The spring and summer sped by amidst great quietude. They went out less often. They had almost given up the boat, which finished rotting against the bank, for it was quite a job to take the little one with them among the islets. But they often strolled along the banks of the Seine, without, however, going further afield than a thousand yards or so. Claude, tired of the everlasting views in the garden, now attempted some sketches by the riverside, and on such days Christine went to fetch him with the child, sitting down to watch him paint, until they all three returned home with flagging steps, beneath the ashen dusk of waning daylight. One afternoon, Claude was surprised to see Christine bring with her the old album which she had used as a young girl. She joked about it, and explained that to sit behind him like that had roused in her a wish to work herself. Her voice was a little unsteady as she spoke. The truth was that she felt a longing to share his labour, since this labour took him away from her more and more each day. She drew and ventured to wash in two or three watercolours in the careful style of a schoolgirl. Then, discouraged by his smiles, feeling that no community of ideas would be arrived at on that ground, she once more put her album aside, making him promise to give her some lessons in painting, whenever he should have time. Besides, she thought his more recent pictures very pretty. After that year of rest in the open country, in the full sunlight, he painted with fresh and clearer vision, as it were with a more harmonious and brighter colouring. He had never before been able to treat reflections so skilfully or possessed a more correct perception of men and things steeped in diffuse light. And henceforth, won over by that feast of colours, she would have declared it all capital, if he would only have condescended to finish his work a little more, and if she had not remained nonplussed now and then before a mauve background or a blue tree, 
which upset all her preconceived notions of colour. One day, when she ventured upon a bit of criticism, precisely about an azure-tinted poplar, he made her go to nature, and note for herself the delicate bluishness of the foliage. It was true enough, the tree was blue, but in her inmost heart she did not surrender, and condemned reality. There ought not to be any blue trees in nature. She no longer spoke but gravely of the studies hanging in the dining-room. Art was returning into their lives, and it made her muse. When she saw him go off with his bag, his portable easel, and his sunshade, it often happened that she flung herself upon his neck, asking, "'You love me, say?' "'How silly you are! Why shouldn't I love you?' "'Then kiss me. Since you love me, kiss me a great deal, a great deal!' Then accompanying him as far as the road, she added, "'And mind you, you know that I have never prevented you from working. Go, go! I am very pleased when you work.' Anxiety seemed to seize hold of Claude when the autumn of the second year tinged the leaves yellow and ushered in the cold weather. The season happened to be abominable. A fortnight of pouring rain kept him idle at home, and then fog came at every moment, hindering his work. He sat in front of the fire out of sorts. He never spoke of Paris, but the city rose up over yonder, on the horizon, the winter city, with its gas lamps flaring already at five o'clock, its gatherings of friends spurring each other on to emulation and its life of ardent production, which even the frosts of December could not slacken. He went there thrice in one month, on the pretext of seeing Malgras, to whom he had again sold a few small pictures. He no longer avoided passing in front of Faucheur's inn. He even allowed himself to be waylaid at times by old Porette, and to accept a glass of white wine at the inn, and his glance scoured the room as if, despite the season, he had been looking for some comrades of yore, who had arrived there perchance that morning. He lingered as if awaiting them. Then, in despair at his solitude, he returned home, stifling with all that was fermenting within him, ill at having nobody to whom he might shout the thoughts which made his brain almost burst. However, the winter went by, and Claude had the consolation of being able to paint some lovely snow scenes. A third year was beginning when, towards the close of May, an unexpected meeting filled him with emotion. He had that morning climbed up to the plateau to find a subject, having at last grown tired of the banks of the Seine. And at the bend of a road he stopped short in amazement on seeing Dubouche, in a silk hat and carefully buttoned frock coat coming towards him between the double row of elder hedges. "'What, is it you?' The architect stammered from sheer vexation. "'Yes, I'm going to pay a visit. It's confoundedly idiotic in the country, eh? But it can't be helped. There are certain things one's obliged to do. And you live near here, eh? I knew, that is to say, I didn't. I'd been told something about it, but I thought it was on the opposite side, farther down.' Claude, very much moved at seeing him, helped him out of his difficulty. "'All right, all right, old man, there's no need to apologize. I am the most guilty party. Oh, it's a long while since we saw one another. If you knew what a thump my heart gave when I saw your nose appear from behind the leaves!' Then he took his arm and accompanied him, giggling with pleasure, while the other, in his constant worry about his future, which always made him talk about himself, at once began speaking of his prospects. He had just become a first-class pupil at the school, after securing the regulation honourable mentions with infinite trouble. But his success left him as perplexed as ever. His parents no longer sent him a penny. They wailed about their poverty so much that he might have to support them in his turn. He had given up the idea of competing for the Prix de Rome, feeling certain of being beaten in the effort, and anxious to earn his living. And he was weary already, sick at scouring the town, at earning twenty-five sous an hour from ignorant architects who treated him like a hodman. What course should he adopt? How was he to guess at the shortest route? He might leave the school. 
he would get a lift from his master, the influential de Coursonniere, who liked him for his docility and diligence. Only what a deal of trouble and uncertainty there would still be before him! And he bitterly complained of the government schools, where one slaved away for years, and which did not even provide a position for all those whom they cast upon the pavement. Suddenly he stopped in the middle of the path, the elder hedges were leading to an open plain, and the La Ruchaudière appeared amid its lofty trees. "'Hold hard, of course!' exclaimed Claude. "'I hadn't thought about it. You're going to that shanty. Oh, the baboons! There's a lot of ugly mugs, if you like.' Dubouche, looking vexed at this outburst of artistic feeling, protested stiffly. "'All the same. Papa Marguelon, idiot as he seems to you, is a first-rate man of business. You should see him in his building yards, among the houses he runs up, as active as the very fiend, showing marvellous good management, and a wonderful scent as to the right streets to build, and what materials to buy. Besides, one does not earn millions without becoming a gentleman, and then, too, it would be very silly of me not to be polite to a man who can be useful to me. While talking, he barred the narrow path, preventing his friend from advancing further, no doubt from a fear of being compromised by being seen in his company, and in order to make him understand that they ought to separate there. Claude was on the point of inquiring about their comrades in Paris, but he kept silent. Not even a word was said respecting Christine, and he was reluctantly deciding to quit Dubouche, holding out his hand to take leave when, in spite of himself, this question fell from his quivering lips. "'And is Sandoz all right?' "'Yes, he's pretty well. I seldom see him. He spoke to me about you last month. He is still grieved at your having shown us the door.' "'But I didn't show you the door,' exclaimed Claude, beside himself. "'Come and see me, I beg of you. I shall be so glad.' "'All right, then we'll come.' I'll tell him to come. I give you my word. Good-bye, old man. Good-bye. I'm in a hurry. And Dubouche went off towards La Richaudot, whilst Claude watched his figure dwindle as he crossed the cultivated plain, until nothing remained but the shiny silk of his hat and the black spot of his coat. The young man returned home slowly, his heart bursting with nameless sadness. However, he said nothing about this meeting to Christine. A week later she had gone to Faucheur's to buy a pound of vermicelli, and was lingering on her way back, gossiping with a neighbour, with her child on her arm, when a gentleman who alighted from the ferry-boat approached her and asked her, "'Does not Monsieur Claude Lantier live near here?' She was taken aback, and simply answered, "'Yes, monsieur, if you'll kindly follow me.' They walked on side by side for about a hundred yards. The stranger, who seemed to know her, had glanced at her with a good-natured smile. But as she hurried on, trying to hide her embarrassment by looking very grave, he remained silent. She opened the door and showed the visitor into the studio, exclaiming, "'Claude, here is somebody for you.' Then a loud cry rang out. The two men were already in each other's arms." "'Oh, my good old Pierre! How kind of you to come! And Dubouche? "'He was prevented at the last moment by some business, "'and he sent me a telegram to go without him. "'All right, I half expected it, but you are here. "'By the thunder of heaven, I am glad!' "'And turning towards Christine, who was smiling, sharing their delight, "'It's true, I didn't tell you, but the other day I met Dubouche, "'who was going up yonder, to the place where those monsters live.' but he stopped short again, and then with a wild gesture shouted, "'I'm losing my wits upon my word. You've never spoken to each other, and I leave you there like that. My dear, you see this gentleman? He's my old chum, Pierre Sandoz, whom I love like a brother. And you, my boy, let me introduce my wife. And you have got to give each other a kiss.' Christine began to laugh outright, and tendered her cheek heartily. Sandoz had pleased her at once with his good-natured air, his sound friendship, the fatherly sympathy with which he looked at her. Tears of emotion came to her eyes as he kept both her hands in his, saying, "'It is very good of you to love Claude, and you must love each other always, 
for love is, after all, the best thing in life. Then, bending to kiss the little one, whom she had on her arm, he added, So there's one already. While Christine, preparing lunch, turned the house upside down, Claude retained Sandoz in the studio. In a few words he told him the whole of the story, who she was, how they had met each other, and what had led them to start housekeeping together, and he seemed to be surprised when his friend asked him why they did not get married. In faith, why? Because they had never even spoken about it, because they would certainly be neither more nor less happy. In short, it was a matter of no consequence whatever. Well, said the other, it makes no difference to me. But if she was a good and honest girl when she came to you, you ought to marry her. Why, I'll marry her whenever she likes, old man. Surely I don't mean to leave her in the lurch. Sandoz then began to marvel at the studies hanging on the walls. Ha! Huh, the scamp had turned his time to good account. What accuracy of colouring! What a dash of real sunlight! And Claude, who listened to him, delighted and laughing proudly, was just going to question him about the comrades in Paris, about what they were all doing, when Christine reappeared, exclaiming, Make haste! The eggs are on the table! They lunched in the kitchen, and an extraordinary lunch it was, a dish of fried gudgeons after the boiled eggs, then the beef from the soup of the night before, arranged in salad fashion with potatoes and a red herring. It was delicious. There was the pungent and appetizing smell of the herring which Melie had upset on the live embers, and the song of the coffee as it passed drop by drop into the pot standing on the range, and when the dessert appeared, some strawberries just gathered and a cream cheese from a neighbor's dairy, they gossiped and gossiped with their elbows squarely set on the table. In Paris? Well, to tell the truth, the comrades were doing nothing very original in Paris, and yet they were fighting their way, jostling each other in order to get first to the front. Of course the absent ones missed their chance. It was as well to be there if one did not want to be altogether forgotten. But was not talent always talent? Wasn't a man always certain to get on with strength and will? Ah, yes, it was a splendid dream to live in the country, to accumulate masterpieces, and then one day to crush Paris by simply opening one's trunks. In the evening, when Claude accompanied Sandoz to the station, the latter said to him, That reminds me. I wanted to tell you something. I think I'm going to get married. The painter burst out laughing. Ah, oh, you wag! Now I understand why you gave me a lecture this morning. While waiting for the train to arrive, they went on chatting. Sandoz explained his ideas on marriage, which, in middle-class fashion, he considered an indispensable condition for good work, substantial orderly labour, among great modern producers. The theory of woman being a destructive creature, one who killed an artist, pounded his heart, and fed upon his brain, was a romantic idea against which facts protested. Besides, as for himself, he needed an affection that would prove the guardian of his tranquillity, a loving home where he might shut himself up so as to devote his whole life to the huge work which he ever dreamt of and he added that everything depended upon a man's choice, that he believed he had found what he had been looking for, an orphan, the daughter of petty tradespeople, without a penny, but handsome and intelligent. For the last six months, after resigning his clerkship, he had embraced journalism, by which he gained a larger income. He had just moved his mother to a small house at Batignolles, where the three would live together, two women to love him and he strong enough to provide for the household. "'Get married, old man,' said Claude. "'One should act according to one's feelings. "'And good-bye, for here's your train. "'Don't forget your promise to come and see us again.' Sandoz returned very often. He dropped in at odd times whenever his newspaper work allowed him, for he was still free, as he was not to be married till the autumn. Those were happy days— whole afternoons of mutual confidences when all their old determination to secure fame revived. 
One day, while Sandoz was alone with Claude on an island of the Seine, both of them lying there with their eyes fixed on the sky, he told the painter of his vast ambition, confessed himself aloud. "'Journalism, let me tell you, is only a battleground. A man must live, and he has to fight to do so. Then again, that wanton, the press, despite the unpleasant phases of the profession, is, after all, a tremendous power.' a resistless weapon in the hands of a fellow with convictions. And if I am obliged to avail myself of journalism, I don't mean to grow grey in it. Oh, dear, no. And besides, I've found what I wanted, a machine that'll crush one with work, something I'm going to plunge into, perhaps never to come out of it. Silence reigned amid the foliage, motionless in the dense heat. He resumed speaking more slowly and in jerky phrases. To study man as he is, not man the metaphysical puppet, but physiological man, whose nature is determined by his surroundings, and to show all his organism in full play, that's my idea. Is it not farcical that some should constantly and exclusively study the functions of the brain on the pretext that the brain alone is the noble part of our organism? Thought thought confound it all thought is the product of the whole body let them try to make a brain think by itself alone see what becomes of the nobleness of the brain when the stomach is ailing no no it's idiotic there's no philosophy nor science in it we are positivists evolutionists and yet we are to stick to the literary lay figures of classic times and continue disentangling the tangled locks of pure reason he who says psychologist says traitor to truth. Besides, psychology, physiology, it all signifies nothing. The one has become blended with the other, and both are but one nowadays, the mechanism of man leading to the sum total of his functions. Ah, the formula is there. Our modern revolution has no other basis. It means the certain death of old society, the birth of a new one and necessarily the uprising of a new art in a new soil. Yes, people will see what literature will sprout forth for the coming century of science and democracy. His cry uprose and was lost in the immense vault of heaven. Not a breath stirred. There was naught but the silent ripple of the river past the willows, and Sandoz turned abruptly towards his companion and said to him, face to face, so I have found what I wanted for myself. Oh, it isn't much, a little corner of study only, but one that should be sufficient for a man's life, even when his ambition is over vast. I am going to take a family, and I shall study its members, one by one, whence they come, whither they go, how they react one upon another. In short, I shall have mankind in a small compass, the way in which mankind grows and behaves. On the other hand, I shall set my men and women to some given period of history, which will provide me with the necessary surroundings and circumstances. You understand, eh? A series of books, fifteen, twenty books, episodes that will cling together, although each will have a separate framework, a series of novels with which I shall be able to build myself a house for my old days, if they don't crush me. He fell on his back again, spread out his arms on the grass as if he wanted to sink into the earth, laughing and joking all the while. O oh, beneficent earth, take me unto thee, thou who art our common mother, our only source of life, thou the eternal, the immortal one, in whom circulates the soul of the world, the sap that spreads even into the stones and makes the trees themselves our big, motionless brothers. Yes, I wish to lose myself in thee. It is thou that I feel beneath my limbs, clasping and inflaming me. Thou alone shalt appear in my work as the primary force, the means and the end, the immense arc in which everything becomes animated with the breath of every being. Though begun as mere pleasantry, with all the bombast of lyrical emphasis, the invocation terminated in a cry of ardent conviction, quivering with profound poetical emotion, 
and Sandoz's eyes grew moist. And to hide how much he felt moved, he added, roughly, with a sweeping gesture that took in the whole scene around, How idiotic it is! A soul for every one of us! When there is that big soul there! Claude, who had disappeared amid the grass, had not stirred. After a fresh spell of silence, he summed up everything. That's it, old boy. Run them through, all of them. Only you'll get trounced. Oh, said Sandoz, rising up and stretching himself. My bones are too hard. They'll smash their own wrists. Let's go back. I don't want to miss the train. Christine had taken a great liking to him, seeing him so robust and upright in his doings, and she plucked up courage at last to ask a favour of him, that of standing godfather to Jacques. True, she never set foot in church now, but why shouldn't the lad be treated according to custom? What influenced her above all was the idea of giving the boy a protector in his godfather, whom she found so serious and sensible even amidst the exuberance of his strength. Claude expressed surprise, but gave his consent with a shrug of the shoulders. And the christening took place. They found a godmother, the daughter of a neighbour, and they made a feast of it, eating a lobster which was brought from Paris. That very day, as they were saying good-bye, Christine took Sandoz aside and said in an imploring voice, "'Do come again soon, won't you? He is bored.' In fact, Claude had fits of profound melancholy. He abandoned his work, went out alone, and prowled in spite of himself about Faucheur's Inn, at the spot where the ferry-boat landed its passengers, as if ever expecting to see all Paris come ashore there. He had Paris on the brain. He went there every month and returned desolate, unable to work. Autumn came, then winter, a very wet and muddy winter, and he spent it in a state of morose torpidity, bitter even against Sandoz, who, having married in October, could no longer come to Bencour so often. Claude only seemed to wake up at each of the other's visits, deriving a week's excitement from them, and never ceasing to comment feverishly about the news brought from yonder. He, who formerly had hidden his regret of Paris, nowadays bewildered Christine with the way in which he chatted to her, from morn till night, about things she was quite ignorant of, and people she had never seen. When Jacques fell asleep there were endless comments between the parents as they sat by the fireside. Claude grew passionate, and Christine had to give her opinion and to pronounce judgment on all sorts of matters. Was not Gagnière an idiot for stultifying his brain with music, he who might have developed so conscientious a talent as a landscape painter? It was said that he was now taking lessons on the piano from a young lady. The idea, at his age! What did she, Christine, think of it? And Jory had been trying to get into the good graces of Irma Bacot again, ever since she had secured that little house in the Rue de Moscou. Christine knew those two. Two jades who well went together, weren't they? But the most cunning of the whole lot was Fagerolles, to whom he, Claude, would tell a few plain truths and no mistake when he met him. What? The turncoat had competed for the Prix de Rome, which of course he had managed to miss. To think of it, that fellow did nothing but jeer at the school, and talked about knocking everything down, yet took part in official competitions. Ah, there was no doubt but that the itching to succeed, the wish to pass over one's comrades and be hailed by idiots, impelled some people to very dirty tricks. Surely Christine did not mean to stick up for him, eh? She was not sufficiently a Philistine to defend him. And when she had agreed with everything Claude said, he always came back with nervous laughter to the same story, which he thought exceedingly comical, the story of Maudot and Shane, who, between them, had killed little Babouy, the husband of Mathilde, that dreadful herbalist woman. Yes, killed the poor consumptive fellow with kindness one evening, when he had had a fainting fit, and when, on being called in by the woman, they had taken to rubbing him with so much vigour that he had remained dead in their hands. And if Christine failed to look amused at all this, Claude rose up and said in a churlish voice, "'Oh, you! Nothing will make you laugh. Let's go to bed.' 
He still adored her, but she no longer sufficed. Another torment had invincibly seized hold of him, the passion for art, the thirst for fame. In the spring, Claude, who, with an affectation of disdain, had sworn he would never again exhibit, began to worry a great deal about the salon. Whenever he saw Sandoz, he questioned him about what the comrades were going to send. On the opening day he went to Paris, and came back the same evening, stern and trembling. "'There was only a bust by Maudot,' said he. "'Good enough, but of no importance. A small landscape by Gagnier, admitted among the rock, was also of a pretty sunny tone. Then there was nothing else, nothing but Fagerolles' picture.' an actress in front of her looking-glass painting her face. He had not mentioned it at first, but he now spoke of it with indignant laughter. What a trickster that Fagerolle was! Now that he had missed his prize, he was no longer afraid to exhibit. He threw the school overboard. But you should have seen how skilfully he managed it. What compromises he effected, painting in a style which aped the audacity of truth without possessing one original merit and it would be sure to meet with success. The bourgeois were only too fond of being titillated, while the artist pretended to hustle them. Ah, it was time indeed for a true artist to appear, in that mournful desert of a salon, amid all the knaves and the fools. And by heavens, what a place might be taken there! Christine, who listened while he grew angry, ended by faltering, "'If you liked, we might go back to Paris.' "'Who was talking of that?' he shouted. "'One can never say a word to you, but you at once jump to false conclusions.' Six weeks afterwards, he heard some news that occupied his mind for a week. His friend Dubouche was going to marry Mademoiselle Régine Marguerite, the daughter of the owner of La Richaudière. It was an intricate story, the details of which surprised and amused him exceedingly. First of all, that cur de Bouche had managed to hook a medal for a design of a villa in a park, which he had exhibited. That of itself was already sufficiently amusing, as it was said that the drawing had been set on its legs by his master, de Cersonier, who had quietly obtained this medal for him from the jury over which he presided. Then the best of it was that this long-awaited reward had decided the marriage. Ah, it would be nice trafficking if medals were now awarded, to settle needy pupils in rich families. Old Marguelin, like all parvenus, had set his heart upon having a son-in-law who could help him by bringing authentic diplomas and fashionable clothes into the business, and for some time past he had had his eyes on that young man, that pupil of the School of Arts, whose notes were excellent, who was so persevering, and so highly recommended by his masters. The medal aroused his enthusiasm. He at once gave the young fellow his daughter and took him as a partner, who would soon increase his millions now lying idle, since he knew all that was needful in order to build properly. Besides, by this arrangement, poor Régine, always low-spirited and ailing, would at least have a husband in perfect health. "'Well, a man must be fond of money to marry that wretched flayed kitten,' repeated Claude. And as Christine compassionately took the girl's part, he added, "'But I am not down upon her. So much the better if the marriage does not finish her off. She is certainly not to be blamed if her father, the ex-stonemason, had the stupid ambition to marry a girl of the middle classes. Her father, you know, has the vitiated blood of generations of drunkards in his veins, and her mother comes of a stock in the last stages of degeneracy.' Ah, they may coin money, but that doesn't prevent them from being excrescences on the face of the earth. He was growing ferocious, and Christine had to clasp him in her arms and kiss him, and laugh to make him once more the good-natured fellow of earlier days. Then, having calmed down, he professed to understand things, saying that he approved of the marriages of his old chums. It was true enough, all three had taken wives unto themselves— how funny life was! Once more the summer drew to an end. It was the fourth spent at Bencourt. In reality, they could never be happier than now. Life was peaceful and cheap in the depths of that village. Since they had been there, they had never lacked money. 
Claude's thousand francs a year and the proceeds of the few pictures he had sold had sufficed for their wants. They had even put something by and had bought some house linen. On the other hand, little Jacques, by now two years and a half old, got on admirably in the country. From morning till night he rolled about the garden, ragged and dirt begrimed, but growing as he listed in robust ruddy health. His mother often did not know where to take hold of him when she wished to wash him a bit. However, when she saw him eat and sleep well, she did not trouble much. She reserved her anxious affection for her big child of an artist, whose despondency filled her with anguish. The situation grew worse each day, and although they lived on peacefully without any cause for grief, they nevertheless drifted to melancholy, to a discomfort that showed itself in constant irritation. It was all over for their first delights of country life. Their rotten boat, staved in, had gone to the bottom of the Seine. Besides, they did not even think of availing themselves of the skiff that the Faucheurs had placed at their disposal. The river bored them. They had grown too lazy to row. They repeated their exclamations of former times respecting certain delightful nooks in the islets but without ever being tempted to return and gaze upon them. Even the walks by the riverside had lost their charm. One was broiled there in summer, and one caught cold there in winter. And as for the plateau, the vast stretch of land planted with apple trees that overlooked the village, it became like a distant country, something too far off for one to be silly enough to risk one's legs there. Their house also annoyed them, that barracks where they had to take their meals amid the greasy refuse of the kitchen, where their rooms seemed a meeting-place for the winds from every point of the compass. As a finishing stroke of bad luck, the apricots had failed that year, and the finest of the giant rose-bushes, which were very old, had been smitten with some canker or other and died. How sorely time and habit wore everything away! How eternal nature herself seemed to age amidst that satiated weariness. But the worst was that the painter himself was getting disgusted with the country, no longer finding a single subject to arouse his enthusiasm, but scouring the fields with a mournful tramp, as if the whole place were a void, whose life he had exhausted without leaving as much as an overlooked tree, an unforeseen effect of light, to interest him. No, it was over, frozen, he should never again be able to paint anything worth looking at in that confounded country. October came with its rain-laden sky. On one of the first wet evenings, Claude flew into a passion because dinner was not ready. He turned that goose of a melee out of the house and clouted Jacques, who got between his legs. Whereupon Christine, crying, kissed him and said, "'Let's go, oh, let's go back to Paris.' He disengaged himself and cried in an angry voice, "'What again? Never! Do you hear me?' "'Do it for my sake,' she said warmly. "'It's I who ask it of you. It's I that you'll please.' "'Why, are you tired of being here, then?' "'Yes, I shall die if we stay here much longer. And besides, I want you to work. I feel quite certain that your place is there. It would be a crime for you to bury yourself here any longer.' "'No, leave me.' He was quivering. On the horizon, Paris was calling him, the Paris of wintertide which was being lighted up once more. He thought he could hear from where he stood the great efforts that his comrades were making, and in fancy he returned thither in order that they might not triumph without him, in order that he might become their chief again, since not one of them had strength or pride enough to be such. And amid this hallucination, amid the desire he felt to hasten to Paris, he yet persisted in refusing to do so from a spirit of involuntary contradiction which arose, though he could not account for it, from his very entrails. Was it the fear with which the bravest quivers, the mute struggle of happiness seeking to resist the fatality of destiny? "'Listen,' said Christine excitedly, "'I shall get our boxes ready and take you away.' Five days later, after packing and sending their chattels to the railway, they started for Paris. Claude was already on the road with little Jacques when Christine fancied that she had forgotten something. 
she returned alone to the house, and finding it quite bare and empty, she burst out crying. It seemed as if something were being torn from her, as if she were leaving something of herself behind, what she could not say. How willingly would she have remained! How ardent was her wish to live there always! She, who had just insisted on that departure, that return to the city of passion, where she scented the presence of a rival. However, she continued searching for what she lacked, and in front of the kitchen she ended by plucking a rose, a last rose which the cold had turned brown, and then she slowly closed the gate upon the deserted garden. End of chapter 6, part b